Good morning to one and all. I, Dr. Faiza Sheikh, junior resident of Department of Radiology at MGM Medical College, am pleased to welcome you all to the much awaited MGM GIC musculoskeletal webinar series. And we are very privileged to have with us such eminent speakers. The webinar will be followed by a quiz. And before we begin this webinar, I would like to give some instructions to all the attendees. The attendees can put their queries in the Q&A section, which will be addressed at the end of each session by the respective speakers. We'll now start this webinar. I would first like to invite Dr. Ashwin Lavande, SIRS Consultant Radiologist at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center at Mumbai, and Sir will be giving a talk on USG shoulder. We welcome you, sir, to this webinar and over to you. Thank you very much for the kind words. Okay, so shoulder is the commonest area for application of musculoskeletal ultrasound because there is high prevalence of rotator cuff disorders. And effectively, what we do is we do diagnosis of various diseases of tendons, subacromial bursa, acromioclavicular joint and long head of biceps. Last but not the least, we, we image cuff muscles, which help us in diagnosis and prognosis. So when you think about transducers, these are the wide footprint transducers, say somewhere between 12 to 15 megahertz. If it's a slightly thicker patient, you can use your Doppler probe, which is around four to nine megahertz. And you can use the trapezoid beam. Sometimes to, uh, during injections, we need a convex probe to if the shoulder is quite big and that is only for intervention. So convex probe is only used for intervention guidance. Otherwise, for diagnosis, the linear probes are used. And sometimes we use such high frequency probes like 20 megahertz where some superficial structures are to be seen and traced. So what do we see? We have to first understand the gross anatomy of the rotator cuff tendons, how they insert and their corresponding muscles. So we have on gross anatomy, we have four rotator cuff tendons and they are the subscapularis from the anterior aspect, which is like a triangular muscle, big muscle, which comes and inserts through a tendon on the lesser tuberosity. Then you have the another set of tendons, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor, which insert on the greater tuberosity from anterior to posterior or medial to lateral. And then you have a gap between these two cuffs, cuff tendons, set of cuff tendons, which is your rotator interval, where you have your long head of biceps tendon <coughs> going into the intraarticular portion and inserting on the supraglenar tubercle. Then you have few ligaments, glenohumeral joint space, and your subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and the accessible parts of joints and joint capsule on the labrum. So what we have, we have four rotator cuff muscles and their respect, respective tendons. Ultrasound is as good as MRI for evaluating rotator cuff, hence a well-performed ultrasound examination for rotator cuff pathologies is good enough. So we have two tuberosities on the humerus. The greater tuberosity where the supraspinatus, infraspinatus and the teres minor insert and the lesser tuberosity where the subscapularis insert. And then you have the biceps groove through which the long head of biceps tendon goes. The short head of biceps tendon obviously is arising from the coropoid process here with the conjoint tendon of coracobrachialis. So if you see the tuberosities, you have, this is the whole greater tuberosity where, where there are three facets, the superior facet, the middle facet, and the inferior facet. Then you have a rotator interval through which the biceps tendon moves in the uh, intraarticular portion. And then you have the lesser tuberosity, which is your subscapularis facet. So if you consider the gross anatomy, the tendons are like flat tendons and they are kind of uh, in the form of a band. So if you see this, this is the supraspinatus facet where your supraspinatus tendon is inserting and it, the posterior fibers of supraspinatus blend with the uh, anterior fibers of infraspinatus 
and that's how you cannot separate the supra and infra spinatus tendons either on sonography or on mri or on scopy at their insertion sites then along the anterior free edge of the uh, medial to the anterior free edge of the supra spinatus you have the long head of biceps and then medial to that you have the lesser tuberosity where your subscapularis footprint is there this is your coracoid process with the coracoacromial ligament there which is the coracoacromial arch and this is your short head of biceps in uh, in the teres minor forms the uh, is inserted at the posterior most and the lower most facet of the greater tuberosity so if you consider the in, in uh, the anatomy at the footprint and if you take a coronal section there this is how you visualize this is your rotator interval where you have your long head of biceps and the long head of biceps is always protected by the fibers coming from the subscapularis and the supraspinatus which merge with the coracohumeral ligament coming from the coracoid process and then you have the superior glenohumeral ligament here which kind of forms a reflection pulley with the coracohumeral ligament there so supraspinatus inserts onto the superior and the superior half of the middle facet so this is your supraspinatus but practically speaking when you see the uh, actually the supraspinatus footprint is around 23 mm in width so from here to here you have 23 mm but because there is a 10 mm overlap overlap of the infraspinatus fibers over the supraspinatus you actually measure the width of the supraspinatus on, only as 13 or 14 mm at the footprint when you are actually doing the ultrasound examination the thickness is around 6 mm then your infraspinatus footprint is around 22 mm wide and again there is an overlap of 10 mm of the anterior infraspinatus fibers over the supraspinatus so here there is like a criss cross pattern and that's why when you see a rotator cuff you see a continuous homogeneity of fibers and you don't know where the supraspinatus ends and the infraspinatus starts and only when you trace these tendons proximally in the short axis that is the time when you can actually see that you can actually see the hypoechoic plane where you see these two fibers separate but not at the footprint then teres minor is at the inferior facet so we have a particular pattern of doing a scan and these images have to be taken when you are doing a scan and these are your essr guidelines so we start the scanning the a patient by keeping him keeping him sitting in front of you on a rotating chair or a simple chair or you can do it in standing position whichever is comfortable so we start with evaluating the long head of biceps tendon or also we call it in short form as lhbt so we start from the biceps groove anteriorly by keeping the probe along the short axis and joining these two tuberosities the lesser tuberosity medially and the greater tuberosity laterally that's your deltoid muscle on top of it and this is your subscapularis coming and inserting on the lesser tuberosity this ecogenic structure is your biceps groove and the superficial fibers of subscapularis and supraspinatus which will be cranially located here higher up they will form the transverse humeral ligament at the bicipital groove and then slightly above the groove they will merge into the fibers of coracohumeral ligament so as you go slightly higher up from the previous section you will see the coracohumeral ligament kind of merging with the fibers of the supraspinatus and the subscapularis and that's how the rotator interval forms here so this is the rotator interval which is basically a gap between the anterior cuff which is the subscapularis and the posterior cuff tendons which is the supraspinatus infraspinatus and subscapularis and in the teres minor then if we go lower down we see that the long head of biceps kind of gets muscle fibers and that's the muscle tendon junction and this is exactly at the level where the pectoralis major tendon comes and inserts on the lateral lip of bicipital groove of humerus groove of humerus so at this level you see the long head of biceps forming the uh, getting the muscle fibers at the muscle tendon junction then medially if you see you see two muscles that is the short head of biceps and this is the coracobrachialis and this is the conjoint tendon which is coming from the coracoid process so if you go a little higher up that's your biceps tendon and the biceps groove 
and this is your tendon of coracobrachialis and short head biceps if you go further higher up you will and if you join these two bony prominences that's the coracoid process medially and acromion slightly superiorly and laterally you see the coracoacromial ligament which is the coracoacromial arch then how then let's talk about rotator interval rotator interval contain uh, is the space between the anterior and the posterior cuff and you have the uh, subscapularis medially and the supraspinatus laterally the superficial fibers they form the roof and that is the place where your coracoacromial ligament inserts so if you see this dynamic examination in the right shoulder what you see here is lesser tuberosity greater tuberosity that's the biceps in the short axis and this is the coracohumeral ligament with the reflection pulley of the superior glenohumeral so this is like a kind of a support a strong support for the biceps that it doesn't come out of the groove and that's why in the cranial tears of subscapularis where this pulley is also torn the biceps tendon kind of subluxates and perches on the lesser tuberosity or medial medially on the substance of the subscapularis so that's your rotator interval with the biceps there so coracohumeral ligament superior glenohumeral ligament forming the reflection pulley as you can see there long head of biceps so this particular tendon appears like an ecogenic structure in the rotator interval and when you are scanning or starting scanning initially you should not mistake this for a rotator cuff calcification now we see how these ligaments come from the coracoid and insert on and insert at their respective places so that's the coracoid process from where one ligament goes higher up to the acromion and forms the coracoacromial ligament and the other ligament comes towards the humerus and merges with the rotated uh, superficial fibers of the supraspinatus and subscapularis over the rotator interval and that is your coracohumeral ligament so these uh, so this chr is like a strong support of the biceps at the rotator interval then we come to after evaluating the biceps and rotator interval we come to the subscapularis so here <coughs> what you do is you keep the probe on the uh, rotator in, uh, on the biceps groove keep the elbow close to the body and then do an external rotation kind of a maneuver so what happens is this portion of the tendon which is hidden underneath the coracoid process completely opens out and then you can see the entire footprint of the subscapularis inserting on the lesser tuberosity and this is your muscle tendon junction which you have to see as you take it out so because subscapularis is a multi penate muscle there are multiple tendons along with muscle fibers which come and directly insert on the lesser tuberosity which you will be seeing in the short axis so this is the long axis where you are actually seeing the footprint which is only this portion in the long axis of the tendon this is the area actually where the capsule is there and then you have your proximally you have your hyaline articular cartilage inserting on the of, of uh, on the humeral head this is the coracoid that's the deltoid and this is the muscle tendon junction of subscapularis so when you turn the probe at 90 degrees you are actually seeing these multiple ecogenic areas interspersed with hypoechoic area so this is your this is because of your multiple tendons coming and inserting at the footprint of the subscapularis so now you can understand that the subscapularis footprint is actually the longest it's around 2.5 to 3 cm this being the cranial edge of the subscapularis and this is the caudal footprint so tears are commonest in the superior third and these are commonly missed on both ultrasound and mr and most of, and sometimes even on scopy the surgeon tends to miss it so when you do a dynamic evaluation from the anterior aspect again revising it you see the lesser tuberosity greater tuberosity on the right shoulder long head of biceps which is ecogenic then as you go higher up see the coracohumeral ligament there and the reflection pulley of the superior glenohumeral ligament ligament the subscapular uh, supraspinatus will come from the greater tuberosity uh, will insert on the greater tuberosity or higher up there so this is a biceps in the rotator interval with the coracohumeral ligament that's your coracoid process and as you go down 
you can see this is the tendon which appears hypoechoic at times which so you have to basically toggle your transducer and reduce that artifact of anisotropy and then as you go lower down you will see it coming where the pectoralis major tendon comes and inserts on the lateral lip of bicipital groove so that is the place where you can turn your probe at 90 degrees and see the long head of biceps in the long axis going through the biceps groove into the intraarticular portion then we do the subscapularis dynamic examination of internal external rotation and when you do an internal rotation you can actually see in neutral position you see the biceps groove and the subscapularis is not seen but when you do an external rotation the entire tendon is opened out and you see the up to the muscle tendon junction so this is a very important dynamic test for evaluating subscapularis and also in cases of adhesive capsulitis this external rotation is restricted and when it doesn't go beyond 50% it really points out to the diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis next we come to supraspinatus where we have two positions one is modified cras or middleton position another is cras position so in modified cras i'll tell you first because this is the commonly used position in our day to day practice in this what we do is we keep the patient's palm on the same ipsilateral hip and the elbow is pointing more posteriorly and what happens in this is because you are doing more of internal rotation and the elbow pointing posterior your biceps tendon which is underneath the coracoid comes out if you don't do this if you don't do this much of internal rotation and if the elbow is point, pointing more outwards then the biceps tendon will go under the coracoid process and you won't see it so you won't see the uh, rotator interval and you won't see the anterior free edge of supraspinatus so that's why this is very important and in this you can actually see the footprints this is the supraspinatus which is the anterior uh, 30 mm and this is the area where the supra and infraspinatus tendons merge and this is the place where you cannot actually differentiate even on scopy or on mr and this is the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus conjoint tendon which is around 6 mm in thickness this is your deltoid uh, muscle and in between you have the hypoechoic layer of the subdeltoid bursa now if you see the anatomy of the supra and infraspinatus conjoint tendon you have the that's the long head of biceps tendon and then in the supraspinatus you have a cylindrical bundle which is the straight fibers which come here anteriorly and that's why in the anterior half of supraspinatus sometimes you can see this ecogenic bundle very clearly then you have the conjoint tendon of the supra and the infraspinatus which you cannot differentiate and this is your hyaline cartilage on the humeral head this is another position where actually what you are doing is you are doing more of inter, uh, you are actually pointing the elbow outward and keeping the hand on the back and this is the place where your long head of biceps is hidden underneath the coracoid you don't see the anterior free edge of supraspinatus too well and that's why this the tears out here or any rotator cuff pathologies can be missed that's why we use the modified cras position very regularly now if uh, there is a patient with uh, a significant restriction of movement like in frozen shoulders what you can do is instead of he may not be able to do that position so just hanging the palm behind his hip like that and trying to do as much uh, taking as much elbow posteriorly even if it's placed laterally that's fine and you can give a little pressure for a moment and see for the anterior free edge this is the supraspinatus tendon in the short axis where you see that the foot at the footprint there is a stepping artifact so this is a normal signature of the great uh, greater tuberosity facet so supraspinatus facet at the facet at the insertion you have the fibers which are at a different angle and that's why this artifactual hypoechogenicity is there so for removing this particular artifact you have to toggle the transducer and see to it that this particular artifact disappears when you toggle the transducer more cranially this is the articular cartilage which stops short to, uh, of the footprint the subdeltoid bursa between the supraspinatus and the deltoid and this is the view which you, view of the tendon in the long axis then there is something called as a rotator cuff cable and crescent the cable is actually thickening of the deeper fibers or the fascia 
and that basically holds the majority of the fibers in place the fibers which are lateral to the cable inserting on the greater tuberosity at the footprint are the crescent fibers which you can see here and that's why whenever you have rotator cuff tears in this portion that is at the uh, at the level of the crescent if the cable is intact even if the full thickness tear is there you won't be actually seeing the major retraction of the fibers and that is a very important thing that's why rotator cuff cable is an important structure which, which gives strength to the cuff in spite of there being a full thickness tear so that's how we see the anterior complex which consists of the coracohumeral ligament the capsule which merge into the deeper fibers of the supraspinatus so that's your anterior complex consisting of coracohumeral ligament the deep supraspinatus fibers merging with this uh, coracohumeral ligament and the capsule then you have your supraspinatus and the infraspinatus conjoined tendon so this is the corresponding image on the mr so 95% of the rotator cables are located within 13.4 mm from the greater tuberosity and they are quite well seen important thing about the cable is it has a biomechanical role in intact and torn cuff it's the primary stabilizer of rotator cuff tendons and it is seen in around 75 74.3% of mri studies in both sagittal and coronal planes as long as the cable is intact the rotator cuff fibers would be able to maintain sufficient shoulder strength and the range of motion even in the presence of full thickness tears that's why when we are doing a scan we make it a point to also see the cable most often then you have this subdeltoid bursa between the deltoid muscle and the supraspinatus tendon between the two layers echogenic layers of fat while doing the subacromial impingement test what you do is you keep the patient sitting and telling to do a lateral raise or fold the arm at the elbow uh, uh, forearm at the elbow and do a lateral raise so that this is the acromion that's the greater tuberosity supraspinatus subdeltoid bursa and the deltoid so this has to move the head of the humerus along with the greater tuberosity and the rotator cuff tendon has to move underneath the acromion in a smooth way which is shown here so when you see something like this you can definitely tell that even though there is clinically there is impingement above 90 degrees on sonography you are not seeing any impingement before 90 degrees then important job is to see for the rotator cuff muscles whenever you have rotator cuff tendon pathologies over a period of time even muscles get involved now this is your spine of scapula where this dotted line is there the uh, the 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 place where number 1 is marked that's your supraspinatus fossa where your supraspinatus muscle would be there this is in the short axis of the muscle in the supraspinatus fossa and this is your trapezius so whenever you have any supraspinatus pathologies you have to see that the echogenicity of trapezius and supraspinatus is the same and see for the atrophy or fatty infiltration of the supraspinatus muscle depending upon various measurements which we will be discussing later then if you come inferiorly you have the infraspinatus muscle with the central tendon there and then you have the teres minor muscle which is a smaller one and typically as you come towards the tuberosities uh, you have the middle facet where your supraspinatus infraspinatus footprint is there which is a significantly bigger footprint and then your inferior facet where your teres minor inserts so teres minor is a short tendon it has an oblique course and the infraspinatus has is a thicker tendon it's more horizontally placed so on dynamic examination you keep the probe on the spine of scapula there you see the supraspinatus first then you see the infraspinatus and the teres minor and the tendons respectively coming to their insertions so that's the infraspinatus tendon in the muscle within the muscle and you see it inserting on the lesser tuberosity that's the posterior glenohumeral recess and the posterior glenoid with the posterior labrum there and that's your 
teresmina tendon so again supraspinatus spine infraspinatus teresmina then you have your infraspinatus tendon there which i'll be tracing it to the lesser tuberosity uh, sorry the greater tuberosity and then i angle the probe down obliquely and you see the teres minor tendon there so when you practice this dynamic examination you can actually know where is the where are these respective tendons and don't get confused between infraspinatus and teres minor then there is an also a method of accessing, uh, accessing the or evaluating the joint capsule the most important is at the rotator interval where the coracohumeral ligament is there you have to measure the thickness and it should not be more than 2 uh, 2 mm if you have abnormal soft tissue there or thickness of or the thickness increases that means we are dealing with adhesive capsulitis other other maneuver is to keep the patient supine and keep the arm in abduction and then measure the measure the capsule here over the uh, head of the humerus and this hypoechoic layer is the uh, isoechoic layer is the capsule which you compare with the opposite side and see if there is increased thickness uh, the, the increased thickness will be seen in cases of adhesive capsulitis then another a place where you can evaluate the capsule is the place where the just proximal to the subscapularis footprint and before the in uh, and after the insertion of the hypoechoic uh, hypoechoic hyaline cartilage last but not the least we also evaluate the acromioclavicular joint where we see the acromion the lateral end of the clavicle and the fibrocartilaginous disc there the superior capsule of the acromioclavicular joint so basically we have to look for joint widening narrowing margin irregularity capsular bulging and synovitis so we come to rotator cuff tears ultrasound is very reliable and has good accuracy in detecting rotator cuff tears supraspinatus is the most commonly involved tendon with anterior half being the most common location what we are supposed to be see for size and location of the tear c for retraction grade the retraction and c for the status of the muscles so in partial thickness tears you have a hypoechoic defect in the cuff now this involves as we are saying it involves only partial thickness of the cuff it could be along the bone so that we call it as the articular surface then it can be along the bursal surface or it can be extending forward from the footprint into the substance and then forming a ganglion inside but if you want to grade it a low grade is with, is the cuff where only it involves less than half the thickness of the height of the cuff a medium grade is which involves more than half of the or around half of the cuff and high grade is where you see it in, involves more than half so you have to say about the quality of the tendon and the amount of tear or the amount of thickness of the tendon involved now ultrasound and mri are almost comparable comparable in detection of the partial cuff tears with a good diagnostic accuracy of around 87% and mri which hardly people do now is more accurate for partial tears but because of the uh, good quality mri we, uh, with uh, three tesla machines or 1.5 tesla we really don't need to do an mri intrasubstance tears are subtle tears which can be seen on imaging but they cannot be seen by a surgeon on scopy and these can easily proceed to a delamination tear which communicate further with the bursa or the articular surface see these are all terminologies our main main purpose is to see whether there is a tear or no tear and say whether there is a partial or a full thickness tear and it's when it, whether it's involving the full or the half width of the tendon then you have the rim rent tears which are basically extending from the articular surface to the footprint of the respective tendons and these are commonly seen in young patients and overhead throwing athletes so typically you have the tear here which is extending to the articular surface as you can see here then we come to full thickness tears where a full thickness of the tendon is involved from superior inferiorly it goes from the bursal to the articular surface but it may or may not involve the full thickness so if it's a small full thickness tear it is still conserved because the rest of the fibers are intact and the cuff is still functional even though there is pain 
sometimes the tears can be a slightly increase uh, more in size and here you can actually see the subdeltoid bursal effusion and a full thickness tear of the anterior supraspinatus fibers this is in the short axis this is in the long axis you can actually see that it's involving from the bursal to the articular surface and there is not much retraction you can see a retraction of around 6 mm so this is just a grade 1 retraction grade 2 retraction is around uh, 2 cm and grade 3 is severe uh, severe which is directly goes underneath the acromion and you are not able to see the retracted cuff so these are another full thickness tears which are small tears which go from the bursal to the articular surface or they are bigger tears with kind of a grade 2 retraction there so we have uh, classification based on basis of dimension of the tears so when it's a small tear involving a small width of the tendon it's we consider it as a small full thickness tear if it's more it is if it's 1 to 3 cm a medium and a large where more than two tendons are involved like the supra and the infraspinatus both and that's where you don't see anything over the tuberosity the entire tuberosity the supraspinatus facet and the middle facet of the infraspinatus we don't see anything so in such large tears we see atrophy and fatty infiltration of the cuff muscles so how do we uh, did, uh, practically talk in reporting we if it if there is an incomplete tendon tear it's a partial or a full thickness tear and we give the size of the tear the location of the tear along the long and the short axis of the tendon and we uh, also say how much distance it is from the lateral edge of the greater tuberosity or from the or in the short axis from the biceps in the rotator interval complete tear involves a full width of the tendon which is a full thickness tear and large or to massive tears they are typically involve more than two tendons and it's the uh, uh, there is a lot of retraction under the acromion at that level so typically when there are full thickness tears like this the humeral head hits against the inferior acromioclavicular joint capsule and that's the time when the capsule gets eroded and the joint fluid comes out and pops out like a ganglion over the acromioclavicular joint so this is called as the giza sign so accuracy of ultrasound is as good as mri for full and partial thickness tears as you can see here good sensitivity specificity of both ultrasound and mr and the positive and the negative predictive values so next we come to rotator cuff musculature so every tendon tear the rotator cuff tend muscles also have to be assessed and the most important thing is to see for the volume of the muscle within the uh, uh, at at the correct place and the fat fatty atrophy for example for supraspinatus we uh, compare it with the trapezius and for the infraspinatus we compare it with the teres minor so both ultrasound and mri have similar diagnostic accuracies for fatty atrophy ultrasound uh, mri is uh, good for teres minor and uh, subscapularis subscapularis obviously ultrasound has a limited role because it is hidden so these are various classifications like uh, for fatty infiltration we compare with the overlying deltoid or the trapezius and when you have the same echogenicity as the deltoid or trapezius of the supra or the infraspinatus it is grade 0 uh, then if the muscle is mildly hyperechoic it is grade 1 uh, fatty infiltration and if the muscle is significantly hyperechoic it is grade 2 fatty infiltration other thing is which gutelier classification is you also see for the penate pattern a normal penate pattern is grade 0 and effaced penate pattern is grade 1 and a complete um, and a completely lost penate pattern is grade 2 then you have to measure the occupancy ratios at the level of the supra uh, suprascapular notch in the uh, supraspinatus fossa and this is how you measure the first the cross sectional area of the supraspinatus fossa and then you measure the cross sectional area of the supraspinatus muscle within the fossa so if this particular occupancy ratio is more than 0.60 then it is normal if it is 
less than 0.60 it is grade 1 atrophy it is if it is between 0.40 to 0.60 it is grade 2 atrophy and anything less than 0.35 is definitely grade three atrophy and that is a time when a surgeon should definitely think of not doing anything uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery for repair of the cuff because if the quality of the muscle and the tendon are poor then the cuff even if they do suture uh, if, even if they do repair it won't be too functional sometimes you get fractures of greater tuberosities which are occult and here what you can uh, here what you these fractures are typically based on x-ray but picked up on ultrasound and patient has to be a lot of pain in this region. You can see the stepping artifact at the supraspinalis footprint. The, the majority of the tendon fibers are intact, but some at the footprint here where they are inserting are contused and partially torn. So that's why the pain and this typically heals with a conservative management. If the fracture is not displaced. Then we come to subscapularis tears, which are not that well picked up on ultrasound as well as MR. So if you see the sub subscapularis normally has a vertical long footprint of around 2.5 to 3 centimeters. The tears are common in the cranial most portion which are commonly missed. So these are the various grades and the 3, 4 and the 5 are the ones which are large tears involving the superior two thirds with tendon retractions and these can be picked up on ult ultrasound and MR both. But these small tears, at the, which are the grade one tears at the superior third are, are missed more on ultrasound than MRI and hence have to be seen with great caution. That's why you have to trace the subscapularis in its uh, short axis as well up to the rotator interval. So that's how when a subscap uh, uh, subscapularis tear happens, it appears like an Achilles heel and the long head of bicep subluxates medially there. Other, case, other uh, examples of subscapularis tears where you see there is a tear in the distal portion proximal to the insertion and in this cases you see the long head of biceps which is perched on the lesser tuberosity because the support of the superior subscapularis fibers and your uh, reflection pulley is gone. Then post-operative shoulders are very well evaluated with ultrasound and here basically what you have to see is that the cuff which is inhomogeneous, normally inhomogeneous which is a post-operative change is intact. You have to see for the anatomical continuity of the cuff and you don't really comment upon uh, the inhomogeneity as that is a normal thing after a repair and you have to see that the anchors are partly inside the tendon and which is hooked into the humeral tuberosity. So typically when the post-operative shoulder imaging is there, there is always a, there is always a little gap between the supraspinatus insertion and the infraspinatus which the surgeon creates when he anchors the supra and infraspinatus back with various anchors. Typically supraspinatus has two anchors, infra has one and subscapularis if there it has also another one. So you have to see for these anchors and this normal gap between the supra and the infraspinatus should not be reported as a tear. It's a normal gap which the surgeon creates and you have to see for the intactness of the cuff. This is a re-tear of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus after the repair and you can see the cuff, uh, you can see the anchor which is there in the greater tuberosity there. Next, we come to tendinosis where the tendon enlarges and shows an abnormal hypoechogenicity, which is a degeneration within the tendon and that gives rise to a lot of pain and movement restriction. So this is the normal tendon and that's the area of tendinosis where there is slight tendon enlargement. Better seen with a high frequency probe. This is a 20 megahertz probe where you can actually see the same pathology a little better way. On impingement, Positive impingement test, you can actually see pooling of fluid within the subdel thickened subdeltoid bursa and the patient is not able to do even a 90 degree abduction. In normal cases, it goes smoothly underneath the acromion. Last but not the least, calcific tendinitis. Whenever a patient comes to you with sudden severe pain in the shoulder, one fine day, morning, evening, night, without any trauma, you ought to always have to keep in mind calcific tendinitis. Calcifications can be soft toothpaste-like material or they can be hard and mature like this with shadowing. 
so all of them at any point of time can give sudden amount of pain and the pain, and you'll be surprised to see them large chunk so uh, see this large chunky calcifications in such patients so this is a calcification in the subscapularis tendon at the anti in the anterior cuff which is causing impingement anteriorly against the coracoid and giving a lot of pain to the patient this is the toothpaste like material calcification within the infraspinatus and you can actually see the mobile echoes when you compress and release and do the dynamic examination so these calcifications calcifications are easier to barbotage and aspirate under ultrasound guidance as compared to the mature calcifications which definitely it's possible but they take slightly longer time and you have to be patient this was an unfortunate incident where there was a calcific tendonitis and uh, there was a rent inside uh, through the tendon into the uh, bursa and you can see the calcium calcium extrusion extrusion into the bursa there so that's the calcium moving into the bursa causing crystalline bursitis which is very painful and the obviously the surgeon had to go in and debride this and repair the cuff so i won't go into interventions because that's a completely different topic i will go straight ahead and come to adhesive capsulitis last few slides so in adhesive capsulitis ultrasound has some role where you can actually sometimes see abnormal soft tissue in the rotator interval which may show increased vascularity on doppler or you may see thickening of the coraco humeral ligament where the capsule and the anterior complex are there then on dynamic examination you can see the movement restriction of external rotation is there you see this is a normal movement which is happening and here you see the sub sub, sub subscapularis is hardly coming out to 1 o'clock position so restriction of external rotation thickening of the capsule and abnormal soft tissue these are the indicators of uh, uh, these are the ultrasound signs of adhesive capsulitis then interventions will skip subdeltoid bursitis is another uh, condition where there is significant pain and movement restriction and there will be impingement because of the thickened and inflamed bursa this was one such bursa where there was lot of effusion and you can see the synovial proliferation in the case of rheumatoid arthritis bicipital tendinosis is the is is a condition where the tendon gets thickened hypoechoic fibrillar echo pattern is lost as compared to the opposite side there and these are painful conditions which need local steroid injections in the bicep sheath and last but not the least after evaluating the cuff and the muscles always have a look at the posterior joint where you may miss out on labral cysts coming out from the joint labrum and this was a fairly big cyst in the posterior labrum which was injected and aspirated one such case where the loose bodies were there osseous loose bodies anteriorly and this was causing significant movement restriction restriction and pain to the patient and this can be only seen when you are doing a dynamic examination on ultrasound so summarizing ultrasound is excellent for evaluation of rotator cuff pathologies and as good as it is as good as mri in terms of sensitivity and specificity obviously ultrasound is not the imaging for imaging of labrum and capsular pathologies its dynamic imaging and uh, better spatial resolution scores over mri when you are evaluating pathologies of the cuff like calcifications or partial tears and indispensable in guidance for interventions the most important thing is step by step learning curve with good knowledge of anatomy thank you very much thank you sir that was a very interesting session for the next session i would like to invite dr malini lavande ma'am ma'am is consultant musculoskeletal radiologist at innovation imaging and anavati super specialty hospital and ma'am will be giving a talk on imaging in spine infections we welcome you ma'am to our webinar thank you so much good morning everyone it's always a pleasure to be part of this conference which priti has been organizing for the last few years and i have been a part of all of that though this year i'm missing meeting her in person and interacting with all the residents but i guess uh, this is the new normal 
so let's begin with looking at spine infections. I think there's slight uh, error in the printing of that uh, program. So, but uh, till around 11.15, in the next about 25 minutes or so, I'll talk about spine infections. Now, when we talk about spine infections, uh, is my slide visible? Yes, ma'am, your slide is visible to us. So spine infections are very old pathologies. Uh, they have been described as long back as in Egyptian mummies, where tuberculous infection of the spine has been found. It was been called as pot spine because it was described by Sir Percival Pot and or cock spine based on the person who discovered the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. Now, today, what we are going to do over the next about 25 minutes is most important, how do we diagnose spine infections? Also equally important, how do we avoid misdiagnosing them? Because not every time the pathologists read our textbooks and you don't have the classic picture, there are a number of atypical appearances, there are a number of mimics, so we look at that. And we'll also just quickly have a look at post-treatment, how do we follow up these patients? This is something which is very easy to make out, should not be a problem for majority of the people. You can see two vertebral bodies, end plate erosions, intervening disc space is narrowed, and you can see paraspinal soft tissue. So that kind of makes it given that this is spine infection. And if the history is long enough, chronic, a uh, little more longer, you're thinking of tuberculosis, more likely than pyogenic. Though imaging wise, distinguishing between the two may not always be possible, but going by the history of fairly certain, this is infectious spondylodiscitis, most likely tuberculosis in our country. So this is the classic one, but two things. One, all imaging of tuberculosis is not always classic like this. Also on radiograph, you need about 50% of the bone to be destroyed before you start seeing it on the radiograph. And also you can imagine areas like the upper thoracic spine are difficult to exactly evaluate on the radiograph very well. So rest, I'm going to, so this is the classic appearance what you see on a radiograph, but rest of what I'll be talking about would be on the MR image. We look at the very typical findings. We look at the not so typical findings and the mimics, which I think are an equally important part because I cannot count the number of times these have been wrongly labeled as tuberculosis. And very unfortunately, many a times without any tissue sampling or any further investigations, based on the radiology report, these patients are put on AKT. And invariably, you know the harm of AKT giving it to somebody who doesn't have tuberculosis. Obviously, the drugs are going to act on something. There are going to be lots of significant side effects, which can be very troublesome. And also, the original pathology is not treated. So when we look at spine tuberculosis, you may have the vertebral involvement, which is more common, or you may have only non-vertebral involvement. So we need to keep in mind these ones also, which are not uncommon in our country. The typical types are paradiscal, anterior, and central, but solitary vertebral body involvement, multifocal involvement, and posterior element involvement, even though they are atypical, are very common in our country. So that's what we need to keep in mind. The Western literature, the articles, the books may not be talking too much about this because they do not see it that often, but we know that it's a very common occurrence. So early tuberculosis usually begins in the superior anterior corners of the vertebral body. This is because this area has got loops of capillaries, just the way you have in your metaphysis in the long bones where osteomyelitis begins. So this is where the blood gets stagnant. There is hematogenous spread of these bacteria. And this leads to focus of infection in the anterior portion of the vertebral body. You can clearly see a small pre-vertebral and paravertebral soft tissue component. And rest of this is all marrow edema. T2 bright, T1 dark. And you can see this T1 little bright rim. So that's very characteristic of infection. And kind of you are fairly certain that this is not a neoplasm. Intervertebral disc initially is not involved, but later it's an avascular structure. It derives its nutrition from the adjoining end plates. And once this is involved, it immediately is able to spread to the adjoining intervertebral disc. Instead of anterior, you may have the focus more paradiscal, as you can see here. 
T1 weighted image, you can see erosion along the end plate. And then there is very early involvement of the adjoining intervertebral disc. Sometimes you may have this kind of central lesions and they can be obviously looking tricky in the early stage. So this was the early scan where there's no soft tissue at all, nothing. But after treatment, you can see this is the follow-up. On T1 weighted image, the lesion has become bright. It is showing all fatty marrow. That suggests complete healing of the disease process. So these are not very common, but at the same time, not so uncommon. Once the anterior portion of the vertebral body is involved, what next? The infection can involve the adjoining intervertebral disc and the adjoining vertebrae. So you get the typical spondylodiscitis, two vertebrae, one intervening disc and associated prevertebral small abscess. Or sometimes it may skip the disc and instead this whole abscess may extend superiorly for a very long distance deep to the anterior longitudinal ligament. So the patient may have long areas of abscess just below the anterior longitudinal ligament which is causing scalloping of the vertebral bodies, but the intervening discs are spare. So this is again a common occurrence. Or the infection may spread posteriorly. So here you can see three vertebral bodies are involved. This disc, very early posterior disc is involved, but then the infection is extending posteriorly, forming an epidural soft tissue component, causing cord compression, now, these are the ones which would need, which may need early surgical intervention if there is neurological deficit because the cord here, not only because of the mechanical compression, but also because of vasculitis and ischemia can have irreversible cord damage and that would lead to irreversible neurological deficit. So, this is the classic appearance I already showed you which you see on MR also similarly. Two vertebral bodies involved, intervening disc involved, erosions along the end plates, some compression deformity here. And then there is this large abscess, pre and paravertebral, which especially in lumbar spine would track all the way along the psoas muscles. Sometimes they are barely picked up on radiograph. Radiograph looks normal, but on MR, again, you can very clearly see two vertebral bodies intervening this involvement. As I told you, these soft tissue here can be extending into the psoas and they can be forming large abscesses. If you give contrast, they will show you peripheral enhancement predominantly. There may be some granulation tissue, but predominantly it is caseous material and show peripheral enhancement. You can also see a large anterior epidural soft tissue component causing marked cord compression. Whenever you see a sinus or an abscess, remember to try to trace it to the osseous focus. Sometimes you may have a posterior paraspinal cold abscess, which does not have any osseous connection. But majority of the times, you need to trace it up to an osseous focus, which would usually be there. So a patient may present with an abscess near the knee, in the thigh, near the hip or a sinus. And then when you trace it, for example, here you can see this is L3, uh, L4, I think. You can see this vertebral body involvement, pre-vertebral soft tissue component. You can see the sinus tract extending anteriorly here, going anterior to the iliopsoas all the way here, up to the skin surface anterior to the hip joint. So not enough to only scan the hip joint. Make sure if you don't find the ossific focus, make sure you cover the superior sections up to the bony joint. You can see here where the sinus is extending out. We looked at the vertebral. Now let's look at the non-vertebral tuberculous involvement. TB may be only epidural. It can be only leptomeningeal or intramedullary. Here you can see this patient has got a large posterior epidural soft tissue bright on T2, T1 it is hypointense and on contrast you are seeing peripheral enhancement. Very important that you give contrast to distinguish from a solid tumor. So here you have a peripherally enhancing posterior epidural soft tissue, some bit of paraspinal extension also and this turned out to be epidural tuberculosis. There is no bony involvement any level. Similarly here in this patient if you see you may get confused this as the normal CSF. You may not, it may not catch your eye. But what does catch my eye is on T2 weighted image, the CSF is looking very dirty, very dark, which is not normal. So even if you don't see that, remember, if there is a patient who has significant neurologic deficit, 
you're not finding anything compressive. Make sure you give contrast. Why? Because when you give contrast, you can see all of this coda equina nerve roots all around it, you have a lot of enhancement. You can see this epidural abscess, which very clearly it's so easy to miss on these plain images. And you can see what we are seeing here is a large posterior epidural abscess with this enhancement along the meninges, anterior and posterior surface of the cord. So make sure any neurological deficit, you don't see anything compressive, give contrast. Otherwise, you may be missing pathologies. This patient also had bony lesion here, but that does not, would not explain his paraparesis. Here you can see this posterior epidural abscess and this cord showing abnormal signal, which could be due to just compression or ischemia and myelitis. Here again, you can see this patient has got a large area of cord edema and within it, you have this dark area. And when you give contrast, it is showing enhancement. This is an intramedullary tuberculoma. Patient also has a brainstem tuberculoma and patient also has extensive leptomeningitis. You can see all this enhancement all along the surface. So giving contrast always helps. Metastasis can also look similar and can sometimes be really difficult to distinguish from an intramedullary tuberculoma. Here, this leptomeningeal enhancement, this osseous involvement here, and these brain lesions also tuberculomas were the clue that this is tuberculous. Now that we looked at the typical appearance, we looked at the atypical appearance, and we look at, uh, now we look at the atypical appearance. We saw the typical vertebral and the typical non-vertebral. A typical appearance can be single vertebral body. And these at times can be very difficult to make out what they are. Bright signal on stir in L4 vertebral body. T1 hypo. Now the clue here is this hyper intense rim. That kind of tells me this is not neoplasm. But every time you may not exactly see it. You may want to do a biopsy at times. And then to distinguish from a neoplasm, you have this little epidural soft tissue component also. Here again, this one, this lesion here, frankly, was on the first image, was difficult to say. The scan had been done elsewhere, and they were not sure. And a tissue sampling was done, which was tuberculous. And we did the follow-up, and you can see it's completely. So look at the T1 weighted image, how dark it is here. Axial image, you have this little bit of soft tissue component. And now you can see on T1 weighted image, it has become fat intensity, and all the soft tissue component has resolved after about eight months of AKT. Single vertebral body, as I said, yes, if I see an abscess like this, I'm very sure. But otherwise, if it's just a solitary vertebral body, not much of soft tissue component, then you are worried about metastasis, you are worried about myeloma, and you may want to do a biopsy. Posterior element tuberculosis. So if you read the textbooks, the Western literature, they say posterior element involvement is usually metastasis. But remember, in India, that's not true because atypical tuberculosis is also common. So here's somebody who has only spinous process involvement, but you can see an abscess going out into the posterior paraspinal region subcutaneously. And again, you can see this T1 hyperintense rib, and all of this tells us this is infection. This one is a little more tricky because it's not as abscess looking as the other one. Again, you have only posterior element involvement and relatively solid looking soft. So one, you should give contrast. And if not clear, you should be doing biopsy in these cases to distinguish from a metastasis. Here again, you have a pure posterior element, epidural soft tissue leak component, and also posterior paraspinal. And this patient, you can see how the vertebrae on T2 are very dark because this patient was immunocompromised. So in HIV positive patients, you can see this kind of dark vertebrae due to iron deposition. Multifocal TB can again be tricky. They can really confuse you with metastasis. This was a young guy who came with these lesions in the spine. And he also had a lesion in the tibia, which had been biopsied elsewhere. And somebody had thought of an osteosarcoma. And then he came to uh, Tata Hospital for further evaluation. And what we saw is, again, clearly there is little hyperintense T1 rim telling us this is not fitting into malignancy. And you can see these multiple lesions. T2 bright, T1 slightly dark, stir bright. So if this lesion was not there, only this, I would be really worried about metastasis. I'm not very sure. There's not much of soft tissue component to say whether it is abscess or not. 
but then everything did turn out to be tuberculosis and this is follow up so look at the t1 weighted images they are dark lesions and on completion of treatment you can see they have been replaced by fat so on follow up the stir bright signal becomes dark on t1 fatty marrow is replaced the vertebrae can collapse even after healing because there is no support that's fine but the marrow signal recovers pediatric population cv junction tuberculosis is very common as compared to adults you don't see it that often so here's a child who has involvement of the right atlantoaxial joint predominantly you can see this very large soft tissue component again looks quite solid and you are worried you want to give contrast and in contrast you can see these large areas so again even with tuberculosis the current guidelines of the orthopedic societies is very clearly you need tissue sampling in every patient before starting tuberculosis treatment this is because one to confirm the diagnosis two to also determine the drug sensitivity you, because the sensit the incidence of multi drug resistant tuberculosis is high you want to treat these patients with the right combination of drugs in the beginning itself so mr here tells you there is solid component but at the same time all this abscess like area and then tissue sampling was also done in this patient and just with two months of akt you can see the same child with so much of soft tissue component and marrow signal yes the marrow signal is still persistent but you can see the soft tissue component underwent a dramatic decrease in the size pediatric population multifocal tuberculosis is also very common so here you have multiple involvement lumbar spine thoracic spine so you have large multiple lesions but again luckily there are large abscesses making the diagnosis easier you also have epidural component causing canal stenosis so now we looked at the typical appearances of tuberculosis vertebral and non vertebral we looked at a typical appearances which included posterior element solitary vertebral body involvement and multifocal involvement and now we have tb mimics which again as i said is a very important conditions to be looked at because as a part of bombay orthopedic society we did a study where uh we evaluated about uh, 200 plus patients who had been they had images from everywhere we uh, two of a radiologist from our department blindly went through them and these people had been diagnosed as tb many had been treated with akt and you won't what we found is there was such a large number of conditions wrongly diagnosed as tuberculosis and the highest one amongst them the most common was ankylosing spondylitis zero negative spondyloarthropathy maybe because the understanding is not very good amongst radiologist among orthopedicians amongst the referring physicians so very often this was what was mistake so let's look at various mimics degenerative so if i see here you can see this dark signal in the vertebral body bright on t2 and i'm worried is this modix type one changes or is it tuberculosis i'm worried about that so in tuberculosis remember the intervening disc is involved and looks bright while in modic changes if you look the intervening disc looks dark on t2 because it is degenerate you can see at least some soft tissue component in tuberculosis while in modic type 1 degenerative and plate changes there is no soft tissue component don't get confused with the osteophytes okay so most of the times it's possible also the edema involves much more than half the vertebral body in tuberculosis while degenerative end plate changes it's usually just adjoining the end plates so most of the times i think the one clue which helps is is the intervening disc bright or is the intervening disc dark bright it is infection dark it is degenerative neoplasm met myeloma are very common mimic so remember look at the soft tissue either on t2 it already looks little bright and fluid like or you can see here in metastasis or myeloma you have this large solid area which is not so bright as the fluid so this not this is abscess this is not abscess but you have any doubt make sure you give contrast to see whether it is peripherally enhancing or solid enhancing also remember 
posterior element involvement does not exclude tuberculosis in our country at least in general if the disc is good it is bad news because it's more likely to be malignancy if the disc is bad it's better because it's tuberculosis but remember sometimes lymphoma and multiple myeloma can involve the disc but it's very rare not common at all here is a child who has got this large epidural soft tissue component and as i showed you the case earlier it could be tuberculous abscess but since it's looking solid it's looking 32 hypo intense it's not looking like an abscess clearly i want to make sure i give contrast if there's any doubt in your mind give contrast and you can see that it's completely showing solid enhancement no area of abscess formation and this turned out to be a round cell tumor as against that look here so compare this epidural soft tissue component with this epidural soft tissue component look quite similar give contrast and now i can see it is showing peripheral enhancement the paravertebral as well as the epidural soft tissue component and this was tuberculosis so you don't want to get confused between round cell and tb and if any doubt advise biopsy metastasis versus multifocal tb can be real difficult and sometimes the only way out would be one either you know the patient has some primary or you need to do biopsy if you do not see any abscess like areas multiple myeloma can look like tb i told you it can involve the disc so this was a patient where some amount of disc was involved and it really looked quite a lot like tuberculosis there was the soft tissue component also but then there were all these very scattered lesions in the scapula rib everywhere and other vertebral bodies so that made us think of myeloma and this turned out to be myeloma so remember if you do not have clear abscess like appearance be wary of directly labeling it as tb here this one frankly first look we thought it was osteoporotic osteoporotic fractures the disc was not involved you can see this disc is paired completely but then you have this large left paravertebral abscess like area and this turned out to be tuberculosis so just to tell you most of the times the routine find findings the explanations will help but there are times when things can get tricky and biopsy would be the only way out here this patient came with this edema around the right atlantoaxial joint there was a prior scan done elsewhere where this had been labeled as tb put on akt not improving the striking thing is there's not much of soft tissue component at all and now this patient also had back pain so we were wiser because we did the thoracic spine also and you can clearly see this costovertebral edema so you have costovertebral arthropathy you have atlantoaxial joint involvement this is ankylosing spondylitis and this patient also had facet edema in the lumbar spine so when you have marrow edema around the facet joints costovertebral joint atlantoaxial joint without much soft tissue component make sure you look at that patient's si joints and what do we see in si joints predominantly iliac sided marrow edema bilateral sacral side findings are very less and no soft tissue component so this is ankylosing spondylitis zero negative spondylarthritis if it was tb it would usually be unilateral not iliac predominant it can involve both sides equally and you clearly have a soft tissue component associated if there is no soft tissue component remember think of zero negative spondyloarthropathy my colleagues from pune and nasik tell me about brucellosis that they see in their farmer population where there is not much of soft tissue component in mumbai i have not seen any except for few patients who traveled back from africa so i do not have experience but if you do not see soft tissue do not label it as tb think of zero negative or if you are in that particular area maybe brucellosis if it fits in compare the ankylosing spondylitis i showed you same location tuberculosis now you can very clearly see a soft tissue component next coming to the other type of infection which is less common is pyogenic spondylodysplasia imaging wise we may not be able to distinguish between the two the duration of history somebody having high fever short history would tell you more of pyogenic longish history evening rise of temperature maybe not much of fever loss of weight would guide you more towards tuberculosis this patient came with neck pain and fever this was the initial radiograph and you can see there's not much that is seen we thought it was just degenerative disc but within about few days about 5 to 6 days patient was worsening 
the, here this soft tissue was little more which we had kind of were worried about patient had fever and the patient's neck pain also was worsening his infective markers were raised and this is the repeat radiograph where you can clearly see c4 and c5 there is now erosion developing in a very short span and the soft tissue also has increased and here on mr what do you see typical involvement of two vertebral bodies intervening disc and a very small soft tissue component so tb has a more larger soft tissue component pyogenic smaller soft tissue component but that obviously depends on when you pick up the disease process so it's a relative finding also tb will show you more smooth enhancement if you give contrast while pyogenic will show you more irregular ill defined enhancement this was a patient who underwent an angiography procedure angioplasty procedure so there was femoral uh, puncture done and after that a week or so later patient presented with severe back pain fever and infective markers were raised and what we can see l4 vertebral body shows marrow abnormality and you can see these large psoas abscess with foci of air within and this abscess was also in the perirenal all around the right kidney and this turned out to be klebsiella infection so there was through that femoral artery puncture the probably infection psoas abscesses perirenal abscess and involvement of the l4 vertebral body specifics in india so to conclude widespread disease is common at presentation so you can get confused between multifocal disease and metastasis posterior element involvement is very common so going by the western literature western articles which say that posterior element involvement makes it neoplasm metastasis does not hold good for us if you do not have any soft tissue component do not be in a rush to call it tb could it be early tuberculous infection yes it could be but at least you are guiding the person correctly that is not fitting into tb because there are such times when somebody is just started on akt based on your report so if there is no soft tissue component keep zero negative spondyl arthropathy in your mind try looking at his si joints try looking more carefully at the corners of the vertebral bodies or the costo vertebral joints if there is soft tissue component can you make it out clearly like an abscess as you can see here or is it something like this which does not fit match into abscess still look solid give contrast you don't want to miss a tumor and even then if it's not clear remember advise biopsy rather than label it as tuberculosis when it is a tuberculosis mimic thank you very much any questions i would be happy to answer you can even uh, put it in the chat box and uh, i can answer it later thank you very much thank you very much ma'am it's always a pleasure to listen to your sessions very interesting and there is a question for you in the q and a section yeah or uh, somebody has asked how do you differentiate between infective spondylodiscitis versus spondylodiscitis of ankylosing spondylitis especially when the patient is on treatment for ang spon with anti tnf Uh, so the thing is, when we are looking at uh, by uh, spon aseptic spondylar discitis, we mean the Anderson's lesions. So Anderson's lesions, if you realize, are like small snout, but very typically in the center of the vertebral body. Your regular small snouts are slightly paracentric. Ankylosing spondylitis, it's very much in the center. So that is one, and also infection. You would not have almost symmetric involvement of both the sides. just small small snout like appearance infection you would have more of an erosion like appearance so most of the and the disc being bright in ankylosing spondylitis the disc can be bright on both t2 and t1 because it gets calcified but otherwise only t2 bright with more of marrow edema erosion like would be tuberculosis the andersons lesion would be central like small snout appearance and no soft tissue component and the disc is maybe bright on t2 and t1 or maybe normal appearing so it's usually not a problem uh okay there is another question why t1 hyperintensity around the tb lesion it's because of the content of the wall the walls which are there of the tuberculosis so that would have anything which has got any kind of some uh, iron uh, ferromagnetic substance it may not be iron as such so that is uh, seen as bright appearance so any infective basically i won't say only tb but when you see a t1 hyper intense rim neoplasm kind of uh, becomes less likely it kind of is almost ruled out so that's a helpful clue yeah 
So I think those are the questions. Any additional also, please put it in the regular chat box and I'll answer it during the day. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Ankita Ahuja, ma'am. Ma'am is consultant musculoskeletal radiologist at Innovision Imaging and she will be giving a talk on MRI knee, menisci and cruciate ligaments. We welcome you ma'am to our webinar. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I would like to thank Preeti ma'am for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, so today what we will be discussing in next half an hour would be the MRI of the knee basically concentrating on the menisci and cruciate ligaments. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, your screen is visible to us, yes. Yeah, thank you. So let's start something with the basic anatomy first. So uh, we know that we have two meniscus. So one is the medial meniscus and the other one is the lateral meniscus. As you can see in this image, each meniscus has five parts to it. So there would be anterior root, then there would be anterior horn, followed by body, posterior horn, and posterior horn root. So we need to see all these five parts while we are looking at the MRI scans, right? And both the menisci have the same five parts. Then the cruciates are the two cruciates, the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments. So now let's just focus and see everything on the MRI images. So these are PD fat suppressed images. As we can see, the outside fat as well as the marrow fat is completely suppressed. So we are starting from the medial most section. First of all, how to say that I am on the medial side? Uh, it is simple that if you see the triangular shape of the tibia, then you know that you're on the medial side. Then uh, on the peripheral most section, you will see a bow tie appearance, hypo intense structure. That is your body of the medial meniscus. So whenever you see bow tie, that is the body section of the menisci. Then as you move further towards the inner side, you start seeing two triangular structures, which would be your anterior horn and posterior horn. And as you can see, your posterior horn is usually a little larger as compared to your anterior horn. You keep on tracing the anterior horn and the posterior horn towards the intercondylar region. And as you keep tracing, you land up an area where they attach on the tibia. So that is your anterior horn root and the posterior horn root. So you can even see till here that they are attaching. So these would be your anterior and posterior horn roots. Once you reach the intercondylar region, you also start seeing the cruciate ligaments like we see in that image. So this is your posterior cruciate ligament and just moving a slide back. So if you keep an eye, this is your posterior horn root, which is usually anterior, which is always anterior to your posterior cruciate ligament. And if you cannot see the root here, that is an important clue of an injury. Then as you move on further, you start seeing your anterior cruciate ligament, which is again in the intercondylar region. The important thing to notice over here is that you can see some hyper intense signal at its tibial attachment. So that is nothing to be worried about. So that is a normal uh, signal which is seen in the anterior cruciate ligament and it should not be confused with a tear. Then as we keep on moving further towards our lateral side, we start seeing the lateral horn roots that is again same, the anterior horn root and the posterior horn root. And then if you start tracing them, they turn into those triangles, which we call as the anterior horn and the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Keep on tracing them. And once they start forming the bow tie, that is your body of the lateral meniscus. And you can also appreciate here that this is almost a quadrangular shape of the lateral tibial plateau. And obviously you can see fibula here, so there's no confusion. Then seeing the same structures on the coronal images. So this is the anterior section. So here we can see this anterior horn root, which is just dipping down thin. And this would be your anterior horn, better seen on the next image as this triangle. You keep on following this triangle, you land up into the body of the medial meniscus. And simultaneously, you also start seeing your lateral meniscus, again, the anterior horn root and the anterior horn. Also notice that in the center, you start seeing some fibrillar structure, which is nothing but your anterior cruciate ligament. So as the name suggests, it's anterior. So the tibial attachment is anterior, as we also observed on the sagittal images. Now we keep on tracing back. So we land up into the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and now the body of the lateral meniscus. 
simultaneously we can also see the posterior cruciate ligament femoral attachment so we should see the cruciate ligaments on all the imaging planes not only on sagittal plane this is very important to remember and then you keep on tracing your anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments as well as the menisci so we can see bodies of both the menisci this is your anterior cruciate ligament and this is your posterior cruciate ligament as you go on further you can see the anterior cruciate ligament is attaching and the on the femoral side and posterior cruciate ligament is still coming down but simultaneously what we see that posterior horn of the medial meniscus is seen now and if you see then it dips down to form the posterior horn root simultaneously your lateral uh, meniscus posterior horn again dips down to form the posterior horn root it is important to see the posterior horn root because these tears are commonly missed tears and this is sorry mislabel so this is your posterior cruciate ligament which goes down and attaches just behind the roots like we see saw on the sagittal image then your actual image you might not be able to see the menisci in entirety but you should always try to look for them on the uh, axial planes also because sometimes they may give you a major clue as we'll discuss later on so this smaller one is your lateral meniscus this high point tense you can see and this is your medial meniscus this is your anterior cruciate ligament tibial attachment and this is your posterior cruciate ligament tibial attachment now it is very important to trace the cruciates on the axials as well so you're tracing your cruciates so you can see your anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligament and then this is the femoral attachment of your posterior cruciate ligament and as you go on further you can even see the femoral attachment of your anterior cruciate ligament very well as compared to your sagittal image right so now let's focus on some of the common meniscal pathologies after seeing them on a normal scan so this is very very important if we understand the microstructure of the meniscus then we understand almost all the tears which happen to the meniscus so this is a meniscus which i am seeing from up to down so it looks like a circle like we saw on the image and now we are cutting that meniscus and we are seeing what lies within the meniscus what is meniscus composed of so you can see some circular fibers and some straight line fibers so your blue ones are the circular fibers which travel along the length of the meniscus and they are called as circumferential fibers and then these white lines which you can see which are traveling from inside of the meniscus to the outside they are called as your radial fibers so these are the two important fibers the circumferential fibers and the radial fibers which make up the meniscus these radial fibers only concentrate in the center and is called as medial perforating bundle uh, then there are few interlocking fibers as well but the two most important things to remember are the circumferential fibers and the radial fibers circumferential fibers travel along the length of the meniscus and the radial fibers travel from outside to inside and as also seen in this image the circumferential fibers are more prominently present in the periphery and the radial fibers are more prominently present in the inner side of the meniscus so now moving on to the role of meniscus in our body so whenever we are walking running we have some axial load which is going down our meniscus this load is first taken up by the radial fibers and then the radial fibers convert in, into a circumferential load or transmit this load to the circumferential fibers and circumferential fibers take down this load from the anterior and posterior horn roots to the tibia so this is the mechanism that's how our body weight is transmitted across the femur to the tibia so this is very important and that's how the role of roots is also very important so now we uh, come on to pathology so we obviously write most of the times meniscal signal so meniscal signal is per se classified into three grade one grade two and grade three so grade one signal is nothing but a globular signal if you see within the meniscus grade two is a linear signal within the meniscus and grade three signal is just equivalent to tear so whenever you are reporting instead of using a grade three signal you can report it as tear 
but once you're writing grade one and grade two signal, they do not signify a tear. So you should be very clear in your reporting whenever you mention those terms. So what is a tear? A tear is whenever your meniscal signal, abnormal meniscal signal, reaches up to the articular surface, either the superior or the inferior articular surface or even the apex of the lesion. So we are not talking about the outer margin of the meniscus. The signal has to reach up to the articular surface or the apex. So this is one of the most important messages from this. So in this case, we can see that this is completely hypointense and is a normal meniscus. In this meniscus, we can see some globular uh, bright signal within the meniscus, which is your grade one signal. And in this case, you can see a linear bright signal within the meniscus, not reaching up to the articular surface. And this is nothing but your grade two signal. So till this level, it's just an intrasubstance signal which has been called as grade one or grade two. Beyond this, everything if reaches up to the articular surface or apex, it becomes a tear. So how do you understand a tear? A tear can be either vertical or horizontal. What do you mean by that? So if your meniscus is cut into two parts such that it uh, divides the meniscus vertically, that is your vertical tear. And if something divides the meniscus horizontally into an upper and a lower half, excuse me, <clears throat> into an upper and a lower half, that is your horizontal tear. So horizontal is simple. If the meniscus is divided horizontally into an upper and lower half, it becomes your horizontal tear. But vertical tear again can be of two types. The first one is longitudinal. What I mean by longitudinal tear is when the tear, as you could see in this image, when the tear, just focus on the moment of the arrow, if the tear moves along the circumferential fibers. So if you understand that circumferential fibers are traveling along the length of the meniscus. So any tear which extends along the circumferential fibers, it is your longitudinal tear. And a radial tear is a vertical tear when the uh, tear extends along the radial fibers that is from inside to outside it will be a radial tear and if it is traveling along the circumferential fibers it will be a longitudinal tear so now let's see examples of each case so what we understand by horizontal tear that the meniscus is divided by a signal this green line into an upper and an outer half uh, sorry a superior in and an inferior half so this is your meniscal abnormality reaching up to the articular surface, dividing the meniscus into a superior and an inferior half. Similarly, on coronal images also, you can see a upper and a lower half. So this is nothing but your horizontal tear. Now coming on to longitudinal tear. So just follow the green line now. So anything which is traveling along your circumferential fibers. So it will divide the meniscus into an outer half and an inner half, right? So now we need to see that. So you can see the signal reaching up to the superior articular surface, here also reaching up to the inferior as well as superior articular surface. And on coronal also, you can see the signal through and through. And on uh, actual images, it is seen beautifully in this case that you can see that this is your abnormal signal and you can see a part of the meniscus out and a part of the meniscus inside. So the meniscus is divided into an inner and an outer half an inner and an outer half. So this is nothing but your longitudinal tear. Coming on to the third one, that is the radial tear. Again, follow just the green line. So any tear which divides travels along the radial line, but the meniscus into an anterior and a posterior half. So on this actual images, again, you can see this tear beautifully. So here, this is the uh, radial tear and you can see the uh, front half and the back half of the uh, meniscus because of the radial tear. Similarly, you can appreciate on coronal and sagittal images as well. So here you can see this is the body section and you can see a defect in the body. I'm so sorry. And you can see a defect in the body. So sorry, in the body, that means in the bow tie. So sometimes this is the only clue that you will see a defect in your bow tie appearance. Right, And that is a clue that you're dealing with the radial tear. Then these tears can get complicated and you can see various complications which could be the bucket handle or a flap tear or a parrot beak tear. So let's see examples of each case. What do you mean by a flap tear? 
so it is commonly seen with horizontal tears but it can be with other tears as well so what happens that this is a tear and this part of the meniscus is attached partly but partly free so it just flaps similarly it can flap down as well the lower half can flap down so this constitutes your thumbs up and thumbs down sign these are very important to be picked up on your images because they affect the management the surgeons have to go and look for these flaps and remove so in this case you can see the body is attenuated and you can see a large meniscal area which is lying up in the superior medial sorry superior lateral gutter in this case and here the meniscus body is again attenuated and you can see a meniscal flap lying in the inferior medial gutter so gutters are a common location for the flaps to uh, go and we should be very carefully looking for them if we see any part of the meniscus missing then we are more cautious and we should be looking for the flaps then the next tear is a bucket handle complication is a bucket handle tear it is commonly seen with a longitudinal tear so here you can see this is a longitudinal tear and this part of the inner part of the meniscus just flips and comes to lie in the intercondylar region and you call it as a bucket handle tear so if you see in this case you can see part of the meniscus here and the half part of the meniscus is lying here in the inner region or the intercondylar region similarly you can see that on sag if you see it on sag what we call as double pcl because you can see the uh, bucket handle tear and the pcl lying parallel to each other which gives it a double pcl sign and similarly the anterior part of the displaced meniscus is uh, similar to a triangle of the anterior horn that's why it is called as a double delta sign so if you remember this image you can remember the name of the signs as well in on axial images also you may quite well see the bucket handle tear uh, in some cases like in this case you can see the entire uh, bucketed part of the meniscus seen well in the intercondylar region this hypointense structure then coming on to the few complexities sometimes what happens the tear starts as a radial tear but it changes its roots it plans now i need to go along the circumferential fibers so if your tear changes its path from radial to circumferential that means it is following two paths then we then it becomes an oblique tear like in this you can say see it was a horizontal tear and suddenly it dips down and becomes a vertical component as well or a longitudinal component as well so this is something which is called as an oblique tear and something when do you call something as a complex tear when it has so many ramifications that you cannot put it into one category so it it is going like this 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 so it is something which is your complex tear lastly like i have been mentioning from the beginning that you need to very specifically look at the roots so on coronal in this image you cannot see anything dipping down on this side so this is your root tear and along with roots you should always look for meniscal extrusion like in this case the menisci has been extruded uh coming on to the last bit of the meniscus which is your discoid meniscus so it is common on the lateral meniscus in this what happens that your meniscus is so big and large that it occupies almost your entire femorotibial joint space so these meniscus are prone to get degenerated like in this case you can see intraosseous ganglion forming or they may even get torn so uh, these were the all classifications of meniscus why we are studying them and classifying them so much is the next question if the meniscal tears are in the periphery that is the vascular zone and the treatment would be very good so if they go and operate and uh, repair that meniscus the results would be good and we call that as red zone however the central part is a vascular so if you go ahead and treat them or repair them then the results might not be that good because they don't have the vascularity and even that is called as the white zone so it is important to mention in which zone uh, which part of the vascular zone are the tears lying and always lastly just to say these it is important to mention these bit of tears which we discussed why because these may if the meniscus has flapped it may cause patient lot of symptoms and then they need to be uh, looked into now moving on to the cruciate ligaments for next 10 minutes so starting with the anterior cruciate ligament <coughs> sorry 
you need to just remember this image not the image just everybody of you just fold your fingers like this and put it in your pocket so this is nothing but your anterior cruciate ligament so whenever you forget you can do this and remember so it is attaching anteriorly on the tibia and laterally on your femoral condyle so if you put your hands in the pocket like this this is going out lateral so lateral femoral condyle and anterior tibia so that's very easy to remember and this also reflects the two fingers also reflects the two bundles of the anterior cruciate ligament which are the antero medial and the postero lateral bundle depending on their attachment on the tibial plateau so as we have discussed this already that there might be some hyper intense signal near the tibial attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament and it should not be misreported as a tear it is a normal finding it is just the striated pattern in which the uh, anterior cruciate ligament attaches on the tibia and uh, again i'm repeating myself but it should not be reported as an injury this is just to show that uh, the common mechanism of anterior cruciate ligament injury is pivot shift injury so if you now observe this leg so there is a pivot shift mechanism which is happening like this tibia is fixed and femur gets rotated on it and as a result the anterior cruciate ligament is so stretched that it gets torn so this is the mechanism of anterior cruciate ligament injury so while we are looking at a scan of an anterior cruciate ligament injury what all we need to look at first of all we need to look at the ligament itself whether it's injured uh, so if it is injured whether it's a full thickness injury or a partial thickness injury and at what location we need to specify <coughs> then we need to also look at the associated injuries which we'll just touch upon in a bit uh, which actually depend upon the mechanism of force with which the pivot shift injury is happening why is it important it gives us a clue that how badly the acl injured that is the degree of injury but the associated injuries are important to report because they also need to be managed simultaneously with the anterior cruciate ligament if you ignore these injuries then you are making not making the knee completely stable so the surgery is incomplete maybe the treatment is incomplete in certain cases so you need to clearly look for the associated injuries as well so as i said first of all we need to look at the anterior cruciate ligament here you can see the fibers up till here but you can't see any fibers near the femoral attachment but this is not the answer you need to look at on the other planes as well then this is a proximal third injury you can see the fibers are broken here you can see some uh, bright signal over there uh, so it can be a proximal third or a mid substance and it at the tibial attachment it is more commonly a tibial avulsion more commonly in young patients so usually a piece of tibia at the attachment in the intercondyle lesion gets avulsed along with the uh, anterior cruciate ligament especially in this case uh, the axial images add on a lot so if you see you cannot see any fibers like we saw on the normal scan we see a hypo intense dark bundle in the femoral notch but in this case we do not see any fibers so it suggests a femoral attachment high grade injury this you may many a times miss if you look only on your sagittal images so axial images are very very important and you pick up femoral attachment and proximal third injuries quite easily on your axial images this is another case you see some hyper intense signal in the anterior cruciate ligament uh, half of the fibers but you see quite a little bit of continuity so you are not sure so you go on to your coronal images you see some dark fibers here but you do not really see fibers well here but then your axial comes into role and here you can see that these fibers this bundle is intact and your antero medial bundle is completely gone so this is a single bundle injury of acl at the femoral attachment and you need to use all your planes to look for the ligament this is just to show you this was a normal acl this is in which you barely see any fibers of acl over here so this is a full thickness injury this is a normal acl and this is a partial thickness where you can see few of the fibers are there and few of the fibers are missing so axial images help a lot so use all the images so 
a normal ACL, you will see a normal orientation, which is quite steep as compared to your intercondylar plane. And then you see a normal signal with some hyperintensity at the tibial attachment, which we discussed. In torn ACL, what all you look for? Loss of the normal ACL. So sometimes you may see the ligament has just completely fallen. So you don't see any much ligament. So you look for loss of normal orientation, you look for discontinuity, and like we saw, empty femoral notch sign. So it's even called a sign, which is empty femoral notch sign. Then this is another example, and a mimic, which sometimes may confuse. So in this, if you look carefully, you can see the fibers where my pointer is pointing so you can see the fibers within the ligament but you see a lot of hyper intense content within the ligament and a small cyst as well so this has to this image needs to be kept in your mind this is called a celery stock appearance and it is seen with mucoid acl mucoid degeneration of the acl again this is how your normal ligament looks like this ligament is torn completely. You barely see fibers going across. And in this, you can see the fibers, but with a lot of mucoid content within. So you uh, sometimes it may be a uh, challenge in case of an acute injury cases, but a history and look, uh, if you are more in terms of thinking of an ACL injury, look for associated signs, which we are going to discuss. They help you to point that this you are looking at an ACL injury. And you also look for a ciliary, celery stock appearance, which we just now saw. Now quickly touching upon the associated injuries in next uh, few minutes. So you need to look for classic marrow edema pattern. So this is a great clue. Like we saw in that video, the pivot shift injury, as a result, the anterior lateral femoral condyle impacts against the posterior lateral tibia. Because of this impaction, you see the marrow edema. So this is called as your translational marrow edema pattern. If you see this, you know that your ACL has been injured some or the other way. And you have to very carefully look at your ACL. So your uh, marrow translational marrow edema pattern on the lateral femorotibial compartment is a great clue. You may also see posterior medial tibial marrow edema pattern, which is also associated. Then like associated injuries we have been talking about. So we need to look at the anterolateral injuries as well as the posterolateral injuries. So let's start looking at the cases. So this is your anterolateral tibial marrow edema. And if you look carefully, you can see a tiny bony chip here. Just to zoom it up for you, you can see this small bony chip at the attachment of anterolateral ligament. So uh, now it is supposed that there is a tiny ligament which comes from the meniscus and attaches on the tibia. So that is called as your anterolateral ligament tibial sided, which avulsion leads to your Seagon's fracture. So this is nothing but your Seagon's fracture or the anterolateral injury. Then this is a case in which there is an avulsion of the fibular tip. You can see here, here. So this is your fibular collateral ligament avulsion injury. Then these are your femoral attachment popliteus as well as your fibular collateral ligament injuries. You can see they usually all the ligaments have to be very hypo intense on all your sequences. So you see increased signal. So this is at least an intermediate grade injury of the ligaments at the femoral attachment. And this one is your posterior horn, lateral meniscus injury. So you can see a longitudinal tear like we discussed. Usually this tear is in continuation with the Risberg ligament. And hence the name comes as Risberg rip. Right? Then coming down to your medial injuries. So medial collateral ligament, medial meniscus, and posterior medial capsule. If all these three are injured, what we always used to be asked about, that is called as O'Donogate triad. So let's see the example. So this is your medial collateral ligament and it is injured predominantly at its femoral attachment. You can see on axials as well. Then this is your longitudinal tear like we discussed right now of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And lastly, in this case, the meniscus is fine. And then you see a fluid cleft clear distinct fluid cap between the meniscus and the capsular structures. 
so this is your menisco capsular separation this is also referred to as a ram lesion it is important to be mentioned because as we understand this is in the periphery and repairable and with good results so this is an important thing to be picked up so carefully look at your posterior medial capsules as well just touching upon the posterior cruciate ligament in next 2 minutes so we have seen how a posterior cruciate ligament looks like so this black band on this pd and pd fat suppressed image trace it on all your planes don't just rely only on sagittals similar to acl you can have a femoral attachment injury here you can see hyper intense signal near the femoral attachment or a mid substance full thickness tear like in this case or maybe a tibial avulsion of the posterior cruciate ligament so just to summarize in meniscus if you have an understanding of the microstructure you will understand the tear as well so just remember your circumferential and radial fibers anything to be called tear should reach up to the articular surface otherwise it's just an intra substance signal identify the type of tear because it affects the management which zone is it and also look for complications because flaps and buckets needs to be removed or repaired coming on to the cruciate summary we should look at cruciates in all the plane for acute injuries look for bone marrow edema patterns they are our friends they help us to guide to reach the correct diagnosis and also the associated injuries they need to be treated simultaneously so like with segons we usually don't go and see that small thing until unless we know about it so if you know about it you will go and have a look about it uh that's all uh, just wishing you all a merry christmas and a happy new year in two advance though uh, thank you so much thank you ma'am that was a very interesting session indeed and we have a few questions for you in the q and a section sure okay ma'am yeah. the first question is is linear pdfs meniscal hyperintensity seen on a single image reaching up to the articular surface or the apex can be considered as a tear yes yes so you need to uh, if you see on any plane the signal reaching up to the articular surface it is a tear if you do a good resolution you might be able to pick it up on other planes as well uh, any checklist to follow so yeah so i was predominantly focusing on menisci and cruciates but uh, in our practice we follow a compartment approach so you go compartment by compartment you look at medial compartment then move on to the lateral compartment following the uh, patellar compartment or your extensor mechanism moving down to your cruciates and then you look for the neurovascular structures so if you follow this approach you'll not you're not going to miss anything in any of the uh, compartments and which is uh, very important so uh, i uh, i don't know if i have time but uh, always follow a compartment approach uh, how do we report a flap tear so if you see a flap tear you should clearly mention uh, so uh, we do not go round and round with the words we clearly say that we see a flap tear of the like i for an example a flap tear is seen in the medial menis uh, medial meniscal tear is seen with a small displaced flap in the inferior medial gutter or a displaced flap in the uh, superior lateral gutter wherever you see so you directly say the term yeah you see a flap sometimes you may see a flap anterior in relation to the posterior horn as well that is another location so you need to be very careful when you whenever you see a meniscal tear Uh, and a missing bit of meniscus you go ahead and look for the flap tears uh, i think those were the questions right yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am an interesting thank session you. very interesting thank you very much so we will so now you, yeah if yeah. there are more doubts you can post in q and i'll answer on that only yeah. okay ma'am yeah thank okay ma'am thank you ma'am so for the next session we have dr chinmay mehta So is musculoskeletal interventional radiologist and consultant at Pulse Chain of Diagnostic Centers at Mumbai, and he will be giving a talk on MRI shoulder. We welcome you, sir, to our webinar, and over to you. Thank you, Faiza, for that introduction. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Preeti, ma'am, and the entire team of MGM, as well as Malini, ma'am, for including me in this uh, in this wonderful Sunday session. 
so let's begin with the MRI of shoulder. It's it's a bit uh, it's a bit difficult to cover the entire cover entire shoulder joint in like half an hour or so. But thankfully, Ankita has finished well before time, so maybe I have some uh, some cushion to extend my time as well. Uh, so I would like. Uh, I would like all of you to participate in this uh, in this talk as much as possible. You can go ahead and answer in your answer in the chat box. Uh, address it to me so that I am able to read, and the rest of them are not uh, uh, rest of them are not disturbed by this uh, by the by your answers. So uh, everyone, please go to the chat box and tell me which of these is abnormal. Hmm? Is case A abnormal or case B abnormal? It'll be lovely if you can answer what is the abnormality. But at least if you can answer in the chat box which of these is abnormal, it'd be great. You can address the answers to all panelists so that uh, it becomes interesting. And the earlier you everyone answers, uh, uh, we get to see more cases and more slides as well. So there are which of these is abnormal? Yes. So uh, a lot of you are getting this right uh, that the case B is abnormal, and we'll see why it is abnormal. Uh, first, let's look at what is the normal rotator cuff ab uh, anatomy. Uh, and over the next half an hour or forty minutes, I would cover rotator cuff and um, try and also give a glimpse on the labral pathologies as much as possible as for the time permits. So let's look at the rotator cuff. So rotator cuff is made up of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis muscles. Uh, we use uh, coronal as well as axial and sagittal images to look at all these tendons uh, together. And uh, so we'll see each of these tendon on the coronal, sagittal, and uh, and a few axial sequences and how it looks on them as in a normal patient. So I'll just look. Yeah, so I'm scrolling from anterior to posterior. This is a coronal fat sat sequence, and the first tendon that comes into the picture uh, is the subscapularis. Uh, this is a coronal sequence. This is the coracoid process. So that's this is the first slice that you will see, and this is like a multi pennant tendon that you would appreciate. Uh, there is partial volume in, in the, on this coronal sequence. So subscapularis is better evaluated on a sagittal or an axial section. But we use uh, this coronal fat set to look for any fluid clefts or rents in this location as well. So that's the first slice you will see subscapularis over here. As you scroll more posteriorly, there would be the biceps tendon which swings along the humeral head. Uh, this is the vertical segment of biceps tendon. This is what we call as the pulley, and then it enters into the joint to form the intraarticular segment. So as soon as you see the biceps tendon. The immediate next slice is what you get a supraspinatus anterior footprint, and uh, this is the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, this tendon or the supraspinatus tendon is divided into an insertion. So if you can see that this is the insertional area, this part is the insertional area, and it is attached to the underlying greater tuberosity. When you come to this location, this is the articular cartilage. This gray structure is the articular cartilage, and the supraspinatus doesn't attach over here. So this junction. Wherein, from after the insertion to the myotendinous zone, is called as the critical zone of supraspinatus tendon. Uh, this is a bit hypovascular, and tears are common in this location. Uh, tears are also common in the at the insertion as well. But this is what we call as the critical zone. So whenever we see a tear, tendinosis, or any of these abnormalities, we have to def define where is the tear or where is the tendinosis. So if you see it in this location or in this region of the supraspinatus tendon then you call it as an insertional tendinosis or an insertional tear when you see abnormal signal in this zone of uh, the tendon then we call it as a critical zone tendinosis or a tear and proximal to it is the myotendinous junction so this is the muscle this is where it turns into a tendon so this location is called as the myotendinous junction uh, so just revising supraspinatus tendon has an insertional supraspinatus or infraspinatus for that matter has an insertional zone we have a critical zone and we look at the myotendinous junction so these are the three locations wherein you have to describe if there are stairs or tendinosus within it as you scroll more posteriorly the posterior fibers of supraspinatus and anterior fibers of infraspinatus join together to form the conjoint tendon and after the slice after that after the supraspinatus is the conjoint tendon insertion again you would see that this is the insertional zone this is the cartilage and therefore this location becomes the critical zone and this is the myotendinous junction over here uh, conjoint tendon is 
you, how do you tell whether it's a conjoint tendon or supraspinatus or infraspinatus? We decide that on sagittal sequences. Uh, on the coronal, uh, we usually align it with the sagittal and next in the window besides it and identify whether it is a uh, conjoint tendon, supraspinatus, or the posterior infraspinatus. So uh, it is usually conjoint tendon is usually at the level of AC joint, but that depends on the planning. So we do it on a sagittal sequence. So we saw the supraspinatus, then comes the conjoint tendon, then the next would be the infraspinatus. So again, infraspinatus insertion and the infraspinatus critical zone and infraspinatus myotendinous junction. Uh, looking at the sagittal sequence, uh, on the coronal, we saw the supraspinatus, we saw the subscapularis coming first, then we saw the in supraspinatus, conjoint tendon, and infraspinatus. Now let's look at these tendons on the sagittal sequence. Uh, sagittal sequence, we scroll from medial to lateral. Uh, the medial most section is usually what is called as the Y view. So this, if you can see that this is the Y, and that is why it is called as the Y view. This is the coracoid process, like the anterior process. This is posteriorly, this is the spine of scapula, and therefore this is called as the Y view. Uh, this is where we assess for the uh, muscle belly volume loss and fatty infiltration. So it is very important that you that the technician goes medially and acquires this Y view. Uh, and this is how you have to appreciate this. Uh, this is the supraspinatus fossa. This is the infraspinatus. This is the subscapularis. So uh, that is how we appreciate uh, the muscle. That is where you appreciate the muscle volume loss and fatty infiltration. So now I would scroll from medial to lateral. Uh, coming more laterally, this is the supraspinatus muscle. This is the myotendinous junction. This is the tendon that is forming. This is the infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. So as I had told, subscapularis is like a multi pennant muscle. You see these one, two, three, four, and the fifth tendon over here. So these are five pennates of the uh, or tendon slips of the subscapularis muscle. Uh, this is supraspinatus, this is infraspinatus, this is teres minor. I would scroll more laterally now. And this, when you come to this section, uh, this is the supraspinatus, this is infraspinatus, this is the tendon of supra, tendons of infra, this is the teres minor, and this is these are the five tendons of subscapularis. Now, this location over here is what we call it as the rotator interval. This is the biceps tendon, this is the coracohumeral ligament that is extending from coracoid process to the humerus. This is the superior glenohumeral ligament. And this is what we call as a biceps pulley. So why is this uh, location important is you can, you can appreciate the fat over here. This white thing is the fat that is normal. When you see this obliteration of this fat space, then we call it as rotator interval scarring or adhesive capsulitis is a chance is a possibility. So scarring in the rotator interval or edema in the rotator interval associated with inferior capsular thickening and edema is adhesive capsulitis. So this section is important to understand, to observe and to uh, report adhesive capsulitis is there or not. That's the sagittal section, that's the supraspinatus and this is the subscapularis. Uh, coming more laterally, uh, this is the supraspinatus tendon, infraspinatus tendon. These are the five subscapularis tendon at the lesser tuberosity. So any tear of the subscapularis tendon at its insertion is usually observed in this location. So that's the footprint of subscapularis. This is the biceps tendon. This is supraspinatus. This is the infraspinatus. Now, if we closely observe, uh, this is the these are the five tendons of supraspinatus. This is infraspinatus. One of this slip and one of one slip from supraspinatus will join in the next section to form the conjoint tendon. This is the supra. This becomes the in conjoint part. And this is the infra. Uh, so when you trace it from medial to lateral, you will see that one these fibers merge together. That's the supra, that's the conjoint, that's the infra to form a complete cuff around the humeral head. Uh, that's the subscapulars that are attached anteriorly. And when you come to the lateral most section, you will see that this is the supra, this is the conjoint part, and you have the infra over here. So uh, when you observe it on, when you scroll it from medial to lateral, you will be able to understand that conjoint tendon is formed by the posterior fibers of supra and the anterior fibers of infra. And at the footprint, we have the supra anteriorly, then we have the conjoint in between and the infraspinatus posteriorly. So that's the footprint attachment of the greater tuberosity. I hope it was clear and not very fast. Uh, coming to the axial sections, subscapularis is the tendon that we evaluate on the axial and the sagittal. 
so on the axial sections you see that this is the subscapularis tendon it is black and it doesn't have any intrasubstance signal this is the transverse ligament which some consider as the superficial part of the subscapularis as well and this is the biceps tendon in the sub in the bicipital groove so this transverse ligament or the superficial fibers of subscapularis uh, hold the biceps tendon within its place uh, so this is the axial section where you evaluate the subscapularis tendon so uh, that's the answer for this is very clear this tendon is black whereas in this you see that the tendon the, there's loss of normal signal intensity of the black or the black signal intensity of the tendon and therefore this is tendinosus uh, why this is not a tear is what we'll discuss in the subsequent slides so this is tendinosus uh, this is the normal tendon this is how a normal tendon should look like any abnormal signal in this location is called as tendinosus or a tear that's, that's the insertional tendinosus of supraspinatus so let's look at the next case now uh, what we have seen is we have identified normal versus abnormal and which tendon is involved so that's the first and foremost whenever you look at shoulder scan we look at the tendon supraspinatus most commonly we look at it first uh, we identify whether it is black or not so if it is not black if there's loss of signal intensity then we say that this is this is how normal it should have looked like but there is loss of this black tendon signal intensity so it is abnormal so that is the first thing that we have done we have identified normal versus abnormal and we have labeled which tendon and which zone or insertional zone or critical zone is involved so let's look at this next case again please go to the chat box and tell me which of these is tendinosus and which is tear so case a is tendinosus or tear case b is tendinosus or tear or both are tendinosus or both are tears uh, again quickly to the chat box so that i get some answers Yes, yeah, so I'm already getting uh, quite a few people giving the right answer. That A is tendinosus. Yes, I know A is tendinosus, but what is B? Is it tendinosus or B is tear? Yes, uh, a lot of them are giving me the exact answer as well, and I'm really happy for that. So uh, let's see how do we differentiate a tendinosus and a tear. When you see the signal intensity within the muscle fibers is not equal to the fluid, so that's the fluid signal intensity. when this signal intensity is not equal to the fluid around it then we call it as a tendinosus however when we see this signal intensity it matches the fluid signal intensity and therefore this becomes a tear it's simple when you see fluid it is tear when you see just signal that is less less bright than the fluid then it is a tendinotic segment so uh, this is this is tendinosus and this is tear and we are really happy about that that we made the right diagnosis uh but should we end it over here no so we have seen what is normal and what is abnormal next we identified what is tendinosus and what is a tear so then let's see uh, what what are the types of tear and how do you report a tear so again back to the chat box please tell me which of these is a partial thickness tear is case a a partial thickness tear or is case b a partial thickness tear or both are partial thickness tears Yeah, so I'm getting um, it, all of you are like really amazing, uh, and everyone's giving me the right answer. So this is a partial thickness tear, and this is a full thickness tear. So when do you call something as a partial thickness tear, and when do you call it as a full thickness tear? It's as simple as the name says. If the fibers are some fibers are intact, then you call it as a partial thickness tear. If you do not see any fibers intact, then you call it as a full thickness tear. Revising what I said earlier. if the signal intensity is not matching the fluid signal intensity it is less than the fluid signal intensity then it is tendinosus so we have said that no it is not normal it is tendinotic now next is is it tendinotic or is it a tear if it is fluid signal intensity it is a tear now if there is a tear is it partial thickness or a full thickness tear and in this we can see that this is a partial thickness tear because you can see these fibers uh, intact and over here you do not see any intact fibers so this is a supraspinatus insertional because the critical zone is defined the insertion is where the tear is so this is a supraspinatus insertional tear next point that we have to mention is whether it is articular sided or bursal sided so articular sided this side is the articular cartilage therefore this side becomes articular side this side becomes the bursal surface because you have the bursal lining over here 
the bursa is overlying subacromial bursa is on the outer side therefore that becomes a bursal site and if you have tendon in the substance then we call it as an interstitial tendon very simple partial thickness or full thickness if any fiber is intact even 10% fibers are intact then it's a partial thickness tear if no fibers are intact then it's a full thickness tear partial thickness tears can be articular sided bursal sided or interstitial they can be in the insertional zone or in the critical zone okay simple thing so what we have seen is we have identified normal versus abnormal and which tendon is involved second uh, differentiating tendinosus from a tear and third we have seen what is partial or a full thickness tear so let's go to the fourth uh, let's go to see how uh, how do you report these tears uh, partial thickness as i said it is articular sided interstitial or bursal sided and then we have the full thickness tears so this is an example of articular surface tear wherein we see inter intact bursal fibers and this is the tear is on the interstitial side uh tear is on the articular side sorry this is the example wherein you see interstitial tear the articular sided fibers are intact the bursal sided fibers are intact and this intrasubstance tear is seen and mind you that this is a tear and not a tendinotic because you can see that this is fluid signal intensity and not a tendinotic or a less than fluid signal intensity so that simple uh, interstitial tear wherein you see both the fiber both sided fibers are intact Uh, these are important because the arthroscopist won't be able to see the tear if he tries if he goes in and does a scopy of this patient. So that's the interstitial tear. This is the bursal surface tear, wherein you can see the articular sided fibers are intact, whereas the bursal sided fibers are torn. So that's a partial insertional supraspinatus bursal part bursal surface tear. So tell me what is this an articular surface tear, bursal surface tear? or a full thickness tear or an interstitial tear in the chat box which tear is this and with zone also if you can tell me zone it will be lovely tell me the zone as well yeah i get a lot of you are telling me the right answer but that's a partial uh, partially correct answer yeah so uh, a lot of you are getting this correct again uh, that this is mainly a critical zone tear of course i understand that some part of it is involving the insertional surface as well but majority tear is along the critical zone and this is a critical zone partial bursal surface supraspinatus tear supraspinatus or infraspinatus or conjoint we don't know on this single section but bursal surface critical zone tear uh, is what this is and this is a partial thickness and not a full thickness tear so i'm glad that everyone's getting it correct and so uh, i kept on saying that it is partial thickness uh, bursal surface or articular surface so how do you measure the thickness of the tear uh, i usually eyeball it over a period of last few years i've been reporting these tears so uh, eyeballing is what uh, i usually use but if you are a nav or a, or a new user or a new reporting in msk system or relatively amateur uh then you can use this method that you measure the tendon thickness adjoining the tear the normal tendon thickness so that's like this is 4.7 mm is this tendon thickness and you measure the thickness of the tear that's the fluid component in it so this fluid component is like 1.8 mm and that whole thickness of tear is 4.7 and if you divide these two you would know that it is less than 50% thickness or more than 50% thickness or 50% thickness so this is just an arbitrary method to measure Uh, if you are really just beginning to report these tears, uh, otherwise eyeballing is usually sufficient. So this is a less than fifty percent thickness tear involving the articular surface of the insertional supraspinatus tendon. Uh, the other thing that you have to mention is the dimension. So the transverse dimension is important, and the EP dimension. EP we do it on sagittal sections. This is how you measure the transverse dimension. That's the transverse dimension of the tear. So coming to how would you report these partial thickness tears? or this patient for that matter is this is an uh, so there is supraspinatus tendinosus uh, with an insertional partial thickness open in the bracket i would mention less than 50% thickness articular surface tear without retraction measuring 6 mm transverse and whatever is the ap dimension so that could be my uh, body as well as the impression 
of these partial sided partial articular surface or bursal surface supraspinate stairs so uh, till now we have seen what is normal what is abnormal which tendon is abnormal if it is abnormal is there tendinosus or is it a tear if it is a tear is it a partial thickness or a full thickness tear if it is a partial thickness tear is it articular surface interstitial or bursal which zone is involved and the dimension of it and uh, the next is we come to the full thickness tears so when you saw we saw that there are no fibers that are intact then you call it as a full thickness tear and we saw the example earlier so whenever you see a full thickness tear like all these are full thickness tears what is the first point that you need to mention first and foremost is what is the level of retraction so what is so where is the healthy tendon retracted to and why is this important because the treatment matters on this what do they do is they will pull this tendon from here that's the retracted end they'll stretch it till this location where the insertion is and then put an anchor or screw it over here so that's the screwing and that is why they need to know how much they have to pull so in this they have to pull and bring it closer by this much this this 1 cm or so in this they have to pull by 1.5 cm and in this they have to pull by 3.4 cm because that's the retraction that has happened so depending on the retraction they would decide if they can operate or they cannot operate uh, so these are also classified as per the patty's classification so when it is just close to the tendon tear so when it is very close to the insertional portion then you call it as patty's one if it is close if it is retracted up to mid humeral head then it is called as patty's two and if it is retracted up to the glenohumeral joint so that is the glenohumeral joint if it is retracted up to this location then we call it as patty's three i'll just quickly revise if there is a full thickness tear you mention the level of retraction that's the first and foremost thing first measure the transverse retraction how much is it then if it is retracted close to the insertion that is called as patty's one if it is retracted so that is the tendon that is retracted if it is retracted up to the mid humeral head that's called as patty's 2 give this dimension for the uh, operating surgeon and if it is retracted up to the glenohumeral joint then you call it as patty's 3 and these are the three uh, stages of retraction that are there coming to the next point you have mentioned the retraction the next thing that you have to say is fatty infiltration of the muscles Uh, and there is a gautilier classification for it but more importantly you have to know which view or which location you have to identify and one more thing that is important is the necessity to acquire non fat sat sagittal sequences because if you acquire fat sat sagittal sequences or the fluid sensitive ones like t2fs or pdfs or stor only those then you would miss out on what is fatty infiltration because the fat is suppressed so it is almost imperative that you in a shoulder mr there should be a sagittal non fat sat sequence for two things first is fatty infiltration of muscles and second is you would also end up missing the scarring in the rotator interval because if there is scarring in the rotator interval on a fat suppressed sequence the fat will be black the scarring will be black and you will miss out so in those stage of adhesive capsulitis wherein there is no edema but just scarring you would miss out on those so non fat sat sagittal sequence is a must for all shoulder mrs Uh, coming to the fatty infiltration this is how the normal muscle looks like on a on a y view that we saw this is when you see that there is there are these few fatty streaks that have come in but they are just barely a handful of them and you can count them on your fingers so these are barely few fatty streaks that have come in when you call it as gautilier grade 1 or early fatty infiltration of the muscles in this if you see there are barely any fatty infiltration coming to fat a uh, grade 2 it is fat is interspersed you can see these white areas are all fat within the muscle belly you can compare it with this there is no fat there is minimal fat the fat is increasing now as the lockdown has increased even we have become fatty maybe so that's the that's the fat that is there but it is still less than the muscle volume coming to the stage 3 now the fat is almost equal to that of the muscle uh, one point of significance over here is that this fat is not important this fat is not important that is the supraspinatus fossa fat inside this muscle belly is what you look for when you call it as fat infiltration so fat around the muscle is not important fat inside the muscle belly is what is important to understand what is the fat infiltration in the muscles so that's the infraspinatus you can see the fat infiltration in infraspinatus as well coming to severe fat infiltration 
you can see that this there is significant fat muscle volume loss is the amount of muscle that covers the supraspinatus fossa so that's the supraspinatus fossa uh, this is the muscle belly in it normally it should be this uh, normally this should bulge out of this above this line so that's the line uh, and normal muscle supraspinatus volume should bulge above it that's the normal normal uh, morphology if it doesn't bulge above it then we call it as like a grade 1 uh, grade 1 or grade 0 or grade 1 muscle volume loss then you see that this muscle over here shows moderate muscle volume loss over in this location so there is like you can see a lot of fat in this outside the muscle and this is when you call it as moderate muscle volume loss when you come to this part there is there's barely any muscle within the supraspinatus fossa and this is what you call it as a severe muscle volume loss so that's the uh, mild moderate uh, and maybe moderate and this is a severe most muscle volume loss remember muscle volume loss and fatty infiltration are separate things fatty infiltration is the amount of fat within the muscle belly and uh, uh, muscle volume loss is the amount of muscle that is forming the part of the supraspinatus fossa Let's show one more slide in which it is better uh which of these muscle uh, which of these case a b or c shows maximum muscle volume loss please go to the chat box and answer which of these shows maximum muscle volume loss case a case b or case c yeah this is pretty straight forward i kept the easier ones over here so it is very simple that the case b shows maximum muscle volume loss uh, and how do you evaluate is uh, how do you evaluate this is that this is the fossa this shows mild muscle volume loss this this shows moderate maybe this shows moderate this one is mild because if you compare the area of the fossa and the muscle that is occupying it so this is maybe mild or uh, this is moderate because you can see a lot of uh, uh, fat around the muscle and then this is the severe most uh, because you barely see any muscle belly over here Uh, a lot of supraspinatus muscle uh, supraspinatus fossa fat is seen and the muscle belly is less in volume uh, this is how this is supraspinatus this is the infraspinatus you use the same methodology for all these muscles assessed supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor and subscapularis so uh, when you mention in the report you say the full thickness supraspinatus and infraspinatus tears retraction volume loss and fatty infiltration for each of these separately so what we have seen is we saw normal versus abnormal which tendon is involved then we saw how do we differentiate tendinosus from a tear if it is a tear is it partial thickness or a full thickness if it is partial thickness is it articular surface interstitial or a bursal surface and lastly we saw full thickness tears wherein if there is retraction you say mild of uh, uh, patis 1 patis 2 patis 3 muscle volume loss mild moderate severe and fatty infiltration cotylear grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 uh, and you use this for all tendons you know, if there is supraspinatus tear if there is infraspinatus tear if there is subscapular tear mention each of these separately for all those tears and just summarizing the rotator cuff tendons we saw what is tendinosus like when it is not matching the fluid signal tears is when it matches the fluid signal if it could be partial thickness or full thickness ones if it is partial thickness it is articular interstitial and bursal if it is full thickness we say retraction which is fatty stage 1 2 or 3 muscle volume loss on the supraspinatus fossa in y view and then we look at fatty infiltration and give the cotylear classification so that's the that's all about the rotator cuff uh, pathologies in brief uh, and now i come to one of the most complex or confusing topics and the queries that i come across in most of the shoulder sessions that is the labrum is it torn is it not torn is there a variant is it normal what is the type of tear so on and so forth uh, and it is really confusing unless you have high quality high resolution images uh, and you are not used to reading shoulder mrs day in and day out so in the next 10 minutes or so uh, yeah i have 10 minutes so in the next 10 minutes or so i would just try and uh, make the concepts as clear as possible so what is the normal labral anatomy it just deepens the glenoid and the labrum is like it just circumferentially surrounds the glenoid cavity uh, at the uh, which comes and goes into the attached to the glenoid but otherwise the labrum is tightly attached to the uh, underlying glenoid how do we divide or how do we uh, label these labrum into quadrants or how do we tell them where it is torn 
so we divide the labrum into four quadrants and superior and inferior labrum so that becomes like six uh, pi section uh, how do we divide it is we draw a perpendicular that divides the glenoid into superior and inferior half and that superior and inferior half division is called as the equator so this line is called as the equator uh, anteriorly we call it as 3 o'clock posteriorly it is 9 o'clock and then this is further divided into uh, two by two uh, lines at 60 degrees which divide this into a six pi type of a uh, circle so this six pi the superior labrum and the inferior labrum then we have the anterior superior quadrant anterior inferior quadrant posterior superior quadrant and the posterior inferior quadrant so we have anterior superior superior labrum posterior superior quadrant posterior inferior quadrant the inferior labrum and the anterior inferior if you apply this to a clock face then we call this superior one is at 12 inferior is at 6 anterior is at 3 posterior is at 9 and then you can draw rest of the numbers fill in the rest of the uh, numbers over here just clarifying superior labrum is 11 to 1 like superior labrum is what we call in this location 12 is the superior most section 6 is the inferior most section so 5 to 7 becomes inferior labrum anterior superior becomes 1 to 3 1 o'clock 2 o'clock 3 o'clock anterior inferior becomes 3 4 5 uh, posterior inferior becomes 7 8 9 and posterior superior is 9 10 11 that's the clock face if you want to use uh, what is like how do we assess which sequence do we assess the labrum on uh, superior and the inferior labrum are better assessed on coronal the anterior superior anterior inferior posterior superior posterior inferior are better assessed on angel images so normal labrum should be triangular or rounded it should be hypo intense and there should not be any fluid cleft between the labrum and the glenoid or the labrum and the articular cartilage so these are the three things which is essential for a not to classify it as a normal labrum triangular or rounded that that's like a shape morphology uh hypo intense signal and no fluid between the glenoid or the labrum or glenoid or the labrum and the articular cartilage so there should be no fluid cleft between these two so let's look at the normal labrum uh, morphology on an on a coronal fat sat sequence so coronal sequence we use the we look at the anterior uh, we look at the superior and the inferior labrum so scrolling from anterior to posterior this is the biceps tendon this is the normal labrum this triangular structure is what we call it as the normal labrum as i scroll more posteriorly we have we are in the superior cord superior labrum that's the biceps tendon and this triangular structure is the uh, is the normal superior labrum it is attached to the underlying cartilage there is no fluid cleft it is homogeneous in signal intensity and normal in morphology or the shape that's it. it's like triangular or rounded or whichever shape it is so it's normal in shape normal in intensity no fluid cleft so that's a normal labrum scrolling posteriorly and one more slice normal in shape attached to the glenoid no signal intensity and high point intense on the uh, fat suppress sequence so that's the normal superior labrum that's the normal inferior labrum again normal in shape and attached to the underlying glenoid with no fluid cleft over here so that's the normal labrum that's the normal superior labrum normal inferior labrum that's how the normal labrum looks like On the axial sequence, uh, that's the normal triangular labrum over here. Uh, it's attached to the underlying cartilage and the glenoid with no fluid signal separating the two. That's the normal posterior labrum and you can appreciate it very well. It's normal in morphology, no fluid cleft separating from the underlying cartilage or the glenoid labrum. So that's how a normal labrum looks like. Uh, how do we classify labral tears? is above the equator you saw the line that divides into superior and inferior so all tears above the equator are usually we, what we call it as slab tears that is superior labrum from anterior to posterior uh post I, they can be isolated posterior superior labral tears which we see in internal impingement below the equator we have those instability tears that are like bankart lesions perthes alpha so on and so forth so these are just the eponyms that we use uh, and we see like if you see a tear that is in the it, that is below the equator you have to look for other signs of instability so those eponymous tears like bankart porphyse so whenever you go below the equator and you see a tear 
then you try to look for signs of instability uh, if you go above the equator and there is a tear in only above the equator then you think of slab tears or if it is posterior superior then you think of internal impingement so what are the slab tears uh, slab to superior labrum anterior to posterior it is tear of the labrum at the biceps origin that's the 12 o'clock biceps tendon insertion that i showed uh you have to give what location it is like is it extending into anterior superior posterior superior or just superior labrum morphologic appearance and then extension into the biceps tendon or not so the, this is the slab one or the intra labral signal superior labral degeneration so only thing that you see is you, it is attached to the underlying cartilage there is no fluid left but there is this intra substance signal within the superior labrum and this is when we call it as a just intra substance degeneration or uh, slap one that's the su superior labral degeneration uh, i commonly don't use slap one slap two slap three slap four but this is just for understanding and i don't get i get a lot of queries if i don't tell them what is slap one what is slap two what is slap three so just for ex explanation i'm telling you that this is slap one you can just say that intra substance degeneration is in the superior labrum that is also fine that's how the normal labrum should have looked like and that is how the slap one looks like so uh, just helps you differentiate why this is a degeneration and how it should have looked normally coming to the second uh, case that this is what we call it as a slap two or this is why we call it as like a discrete tear now this is extending to the surface there is a clear fluid cleft between the labrum and the glenoid cartilage and it is extending into the anterior superior quadrant as well on the axial sequence so if you compare it with the normal this is how normal it should have looked like this is how the tear looks like it is there is this intra substance signal which is extending to the glenoid articular surface and it is extending also extending to the anterior superior quadrant so normal triangular shape is lost intra substance signal is there and you also to see this fluid left or the gap between the the glenoid underlying it so that's that's like superior labral tear extending into the anterior superior and posterior superior quadrants uh the third slab or the fourth slab type is when the tear extends into the biceps tendon as well so uh, this is what you need to mention if you see a slab tear and if it is extending into the biceps this is the biceps tendon insertion this is where the normal labrum should have been there is loss of the triangular morphology there is intra substance signal and there is this fluid cleft between the possible labrum and the glenoid cartilage this is how normally it should have been that's the normal biceps tendon that's the normal labrum and that's the uh, contralateral junction as well over here no fluid cleft in this patient there is you barely see the normal triangular structure loss of hypotense signal fluid cleft and that extends into the biceps tendon as well so that is when we call it as a slap 4 or more importantly superior labral tear extending into the biceps tendon is what you need to mention in the report uh, coming to this next case just scrolling through the axial sequences from the inferior sorry yeah so and the scrolling from superior to inferior this is the anterior part and you see this very good anterior superior labrum over here it is it is almost triangular or circular it is black and there is no fluid cleft between the glenoid and the labrum but if you see the posterior superior quadrant you are hard pressed to see a normal triangular structure forget being hypotense you they barely see a structure and there is also the suspicious like like there is no discrete um, connection between the glenoid and the cartilage or this labral tissue that is there so we are thinking of this is posterior this is anterior this is posterior this we are superiorly because i'm scrolling from superior to inferior so the posterior superior labrum looks bad as i scroll inferiorly you can see that this is the normal posterior superior labrum that has come into the picture so normal posterior so this posterior labrum is normal at the equator but as i go above you barely see a healthy labral tissue here you do not see a healthy labral tissue over here as well so this is raising concern for a posterior superior labral tear but uh, there is lot of magic angle artifact in the posterior superior labrum so what i do is i go to the coronal section and check whether it is normal or abnormal and on this posterior on this coronal sequence uh, i'm scrolling from anterior to posterior and you see that the superior labrum looks bad but as i scroll more posteriorly there is this hyperintense signal where the normal posterior superior labrum should have been 
and you see that this is almost an early paramenisca cyst paraliberal cyst that is forming so that's a posterior superior liberal tear and uh, we see this posterior superior liberal tears commonly in internal impingement so there are other signs about it which we won't discuss today but uh, what this what the point that i wanted to put across is identify the tear which quadrant it is superior or inferior or posterior superior um, see uh, put that into a box wherein you have posterior superior liberal tear so think about internal impingement if you have anterior inferior liberal tear think about instability if you have superior liberal tears they are usually degenerative so just think of liberal tear identify the location and then put them into per appropriate perspective so these are the inferior quadrant tears what we call it as pancart lesions porthes and alps and etc uh variants uh, i think i have a minute or two to cover the variants as well uh, so majority of these variants are in are about the equator and how do we differentiate from a tear is what is the most important thing and i'll show those variants and how to differentiate as well uh the first is the sub sublabral sulcus or the recess uh, and you can see that this is smooth this is the fluid that is why we call it as abnormal but it is very smooth it is linear and it follows the curvature of the underlying glenoid so it just follows this curvature and uh, this is why we call this as a sublabral recess or a sulcus uh, it is about the equator in the superior labrum now uh, this is how normally it should have been in this we see this discrete fluid cleft but if you appreciate that this labrum is so well seen it is triangular it is almost hypointense and this margin is so smooth and if you compare that with a tear you can see how irregular these margins are so it is pretty easy to say that this is a tear and not a variant whereas in a variant you will usually see a well defined uh, well defined smooth margins and a well defined cleft that lines it so that's the variant uh, the next is sublabral foramen it is in the anterior superior quadrant how do you identify is in the first slice you will see labral attached to the glenoid in the next slice you will see it is deficient there is this cleft and in the third slice you will again see it attached to the underlying glenoid so that's like a foramen which is again smooth marginated the labral quality is healthy you can see this is triangular and black uh, this is this margins are so smooth over here and the cleft is seen in a single or at the max two slices so that's a sublabral foramen uh we ford complex is this 1 to 3 o'clock labrum in anterior superior quadrant is deficient with a thick mghl so you can see that this is the posterior superior quadrant the labrum is normal triangular black and no cleft in the anterior superior quadrant you do not see any healthy labral tissue but you see this thick mghl so when you see this thick mghl with an absent labral tissue we call it as a buford complex in the anterior superior quadrant so when is it normal or a variant and when it is a tear that's let's really a million dollar question so use these uh, points like it parallels the glenoid in the variant the abnormal signal is in the labral substance also we saw the tear had this uh, rarefied margins whereas the variant had a healthy labral tissue the margins are smooth and regular in variants it is orientation is along the glenoid uh, it usually does not extend usually does not extend up below the equator uh the width between the glenoid and the labrum is like 2 mm or less than it and the paralabral cysts are not seen so if you use these criteria you might be able to confidently say whether it's a variant or a tear it comes with experience of course so quickly tell me uh what is this labral appearance i think i've already shown this case but is this a tear a variant or a normal thing just to just to finish this session yes so i am getting the right answer and i am happy that the, that i could solve the conundrum of labrum up a bit uh, and i didn't uh, make it clear as mud i guess so important is if there is instability then they have surgical management that's in the inferior quadrants but slap lesions are usually conservative unless it is in young and there are no other pathologies so the take home point from this is do not scratch your head if you see a slap with a complete rotator cuff tear they are not bothered about the slap lesions if it is there it is not there it is immaterial so if you have only slap lesion in a young patient and no other concomitant pathologies 
then you spend time on it if you see slab lesions with a complete full thickness full thickness rotator cuff tear or some so on and so forth then do not waste your time on dis deciding or deciphering whether it is a slab lesion or not just summarizing quickly identify the labrum normal variant or tear if it is a tear give the location extent paralabral cyst and associations uh congrats to ma'am for the wonderful conduct of this conference and wish you all a very merry uh, like a wish you all a merry christmas uh, i maybe overshot the time but ankita had given me time to cover up mm -hmm. i would take the questions maybe i'll answer them in the q and a section yes sir thank you sir that was a great session indeed thank you very much Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Siddesh Jarwan, radiology from MGM Medical College. I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Nidhi Bhatnagar, ma'am, for the session of USG ankle. She is the vice president, musculoskeletal ultrasound society member, Delhi State Chapter IRIA, member of European Society of Skeletal Radiology, member of World Institute of Pain Management, and e member of American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine. We welcome you, ma'am, and request you to start the session. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, Dr. Siddish, for a very warm introduction. <clears throat> and my special thanks go to Dr. Nitin Kadam. So good afternoon, all delegates. After that wonderful talk from Dr. Chinmay, I'm sure you're all ready now and energized to listen to ankle ultrasound. Uh, today's webinar is on basic and intermediate information on the ankle ultrasound. And um, before I start on, I think it is imperative to start with the bone anatomy of ankle, which is rather complex and confusing because of so many bones there. So a quick recap, if I drop a perpendicular right from the middle of the tibia, we can see that it traverses through the talus, lateral uh, navicular, middle cuneiform, and the second metatarsal. So now we, an ultrasound, take this as the standard scan plane to map out the bony acoustic margins either ways, medially as well as laterally, as a result of which keeping the metatarsals as your landmarks, the bony landmarks, we can go dis proximally or distally to map out what bones are we dealing with, particularly when we are dealing with trauma. So with the bones out of the way, the scan planes out of the way, we start with the technique. I am sure that I don't need to elaborate on the reasons why we need to do an ankle ultrasound. There are trauma, inflammatory diseases, uh, overuse syndromes, pain, limitation of movement, swelling. So the works are there. We start on with the technique. Now the patient is usually supine or in lateral decubitus, that is for the lateral and the medial ankle, except when we are evaluating the posterior ankle and we're talking about the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia when the patient is prone. So what we use here are the 7.5 to 10 megahertz linear ray transducers. Not all units have or not all radiologists are using the compact linear ray transducer, which is definitely the mode, the transducer of choice because it's small footprint hockey stick probe and it conforms to the bony landmarks very easily so you don't really have to take a lot of gel coupling gel however even with the linear array transducers of the broad footprints we normally today because the near field resolution is so beautiful that we don't really have to take a standoff gel or take Coupling gel is usually sufficient when evaluating these superficial structures. Now, comparing is extremely important, at least in ultrasound, and we are fortunate, not like in MRI, that we can always go to the symptomatic side, keeping that as our standard. And doing that, we can always go to the asymptomatic side, back to the symptomatic side, to have a conclusive proof as if we are dealing with a normal variant or we're dealing with a pathology. And this keeps us in internal control also, particularly when we are dealing with diseases. Now, all the pathological conditions must be confirmed in both longitudinal and transverse planes, and ligaments and tendons should be evaluated from their musculotendinous junctions up to their insertions in the foot. When the alignment is oblique, and this is just not for the ankle ultrasound, we're talking of generally musculoskeletal ultrasound. There is 
an anisotropy, which is an artifactual pitfall if your probe orientation is a little oblique and not completely perpendicular to the underlying scanning structure, then there is a, a, a it, it mimics tendinosis or tendon tear by way of giving a little bit of hypoechogenicity. So it's very important that we keep our scanning planes absolutely perpendicular, the probe perpendicular to the structures that are scanned. And a few tips here, particularly in ankle. So there is usually no detectable fluid, which is seen around either the uh, FDL, um, the tibialis anterior tendon, posterior ankle recess or joint, and in the retro, retro Achilles tendon bursa. Achilles tendon is the only tendon in ankle which does not have a synovial sheath. What we have is a palatinon, which is a loose connective tissue, compressed to give stability to the tendon. And the physiological amount of fluid may be unilateral. Uh, um, usually it's physiological if it's less than three millimeters. And when bilateral, it can be asymmetric as well. Ankle is broadly categorized into anterior, medial, lateral, and posterior compartments. And I think you remember this from your undergrad days. Before we move on to the focused scanning and study of the ligaments and tendons, there are a few structures that are very important, particularly in the ankle. And one of them is retinaculi. They usually are a bane for starters, beginners, because it's very difficult to localize them. So I'm just trying to here sort it out and make it a little easy so that when you go back to your clinics, you will be able to probably follow them in a more um, confident manner. So what we have is a superficial extensor retinaculum. Now this moves from the crest of the fibula down to the, uh, from the tibia or the medial malleolus going to the distal end of the fibula. This is a kind of broad, and um, these are the dense deep fascias that keep the tendons into appropriate positions. Don't let them subluxate or also dislocate. Um, under stressful conditions and of course jogging and rest of the things are there. There are lots of spots where they are, the tendons are under a lot of stress. So the superior retinaculum is something which actually takes care of all the anterior ankle tendons. From, these, from the uh, superior extensor retinaculum, we go to the inferior extensor retinaculum, and this is a Y-shaped retinaculum. It has four structures, and first of all, I'm going to go to the stem. The stem of the retinaculum of the inferior um, retinaculum is, extensor retinaculum is actually the, the most important part, and it actually cradles the extensor hallucis tendon and the extensor digitorum tendon. This is also called as the fondiform ligament, um, a key name to be remembered. So the fondiform ligament or the stem is the one part of inferior extensor retinaculum and then it goes and splits into two medially. So there is a um, supromedial and then there is an inframedial. The supromedial goes towards the medial malleolus, the inframedial goes and gets blends with the calcaneus here. Then, of course, there is a lateral slip, and this lateral slip goes and blends with the uh, I'm sorry, calcaneus here. It goes and blends with the navicular and the superficial structures. So, coming to the uh, coming to the sonar anatomy of these um, retinaculi, superficial extensor tendon. Now, this is a superficial extensor tendon right here underneath. You can see the extensor tendons. Now, following these. Following these, if I um, zoom in the extensor digitorum longus, you can very clearly see the tent, the extensor retinaculum that is covering here. It is echogenic and it is of even thickness, going from medial to lateral. I'm going to leave the flexor retinaculum for a moment here, flexor retinaculum, which goes on medial side. And I'm going to come to the inferior extensor retinaculum. As I come to the inferior extensor retinaculum, this is the extensor hallucis longus tendon, extensor hallucis longus tendon. And what you see is the superior, the supromedial part, the supromedial part, which is going medially to blend with that of the medial manulus. Then for the inferior one, you can see here again, the extensor hallucis tendon, the extensor hallucis tendon, and it goes a little obliquely downwards to blend with the malleoli here, the um, navicular here. And on the lateral side, the lateral slip, and I'm so sorry, I'm gonna go back. 
And on the lateral side, the extensor digitorum longus tendon, extensor digitorum longus, fondiform ligament, or the stem of the inferior extensor retinaculum. As you can see it blending here, it actually goes downwards and into the sinus tarsi. And this is the slip which goes all the way laterally to blend with the calcaneus, to blend with the calcaneus. Of course, the flexor retinaculum. Flexor retinaculum is something which goes from medial malleolus and it blends down onto the calcaneus, takes in the tarsal tunnel with the three tendons of the medial ankle, and we will deal with them as we go through the presentation. This is just an overview and we will be referring to all the nerves as and when we come to them. So on the anterior side, we have the deep peroneal nerve, which is a branch of the CPN and the special peroneal nerve, which from the lateral uh, leg moves over, enters piercing the lateral fa fascia uh, of the lateral compartment and enters into the dorsum of the foot to go laterally. Then laterally, we have the sural nerve and of course medially, our um, tibial nerve, which divides into medial plantar and the lateral plantar nerve. And of course, we will be addressing them in the slides further. Now, unlike the knee joint, we have a uh, knee joint has got multiple, multiple bursae, but in the ankle, we just have two bursae. The important ones are the retrocalcaneal bursa, and this is also called as the subtendinous bursa between the anterior part of the tenio achilles and the posterior surface of the calcaneus. Then we have what we call as it is a superficial bursa, and it's a subcutaneous bursa, so it's also called as a subcutaneous um, calcaneal bursa, and this is pre achilles bursa which has got an importance when there is a pathology such as Hadland's disease. We'll just forget about these metatarsal bursas and then we come to adventitious or the occupational bursa. So we have the lateral malleolar and lateral premalleolar bursae. These are occupational, uh, particularly seen in Southeast Asia where people have squatting position. Uh, so the malleolar bursa, the malleolar bursa is something which is present anterior to the ankle uh, uh, is present lateral and superior to the fibular steloid. And then we have what is called as a premalleolar bursa. So premalleolar bursa is somewhere here, which is anterior to the fibular steloid. So bursi are the way we start with the ankle. Now, ankle has got, of course, this is the anatomy that I have displayed. Uh, we have the tendons and, of course, we have the ligaments. We're going to start with the tendons first. And the tendons are the primary extensors or the dorsiflexors of the ankle and foot. They have their independent synovial sheaths, all three of them, whereas the synovial sheath of the extensor digitorum is also shared by the peroneus tertius. Uh, tibialis anterior is the most medial tendon, and it takes its origin, of course, from the proximal lateral tibial condyle, expands downwards to take its insertion at the base of the first metatarsal. Then we have the extensor hallucis longus, which is more lateral, and this extensor hallucis longus takes its origin, we know, from the um, uh, fibula, the medial border of the fibula and takes its insertion at the level of the base of the distal phalanx of grade two on the dorsum. And we have extensor digitorum longus, of course, taking from both the fibula and the tibia, going distally, dividing into four slips. And these slips go on to attach themselves at the base of the dorsum of distal phalanges of second to fourth toes. More important is, of course, they are held together by the superior retinaculum and the inferior retinaculum. And it's most important to remember that um, the stability of the entire system depends upon not only the tendons, but also of the ligaments. This is, of course, the sonar anatomy and short axis scan. If we place the probe right here in a short axis scan, just at the level of the ankle joint line, we see tibialis anterior, the tendon in short axis going undergoing a little bit of a nisotropy. Then we have the extensor hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus with the fondiform ligament. And in between the extensor digitorum and the extensor hallucis, we have what is called as the anterior tibial artery, which we'll expand in further slides. So I'm going to just stop this for a while here. Again, the um, the, the anterior tibial artery, as is seen in the image and illustration here, between the extensor hallucis and the extensor digitorum, and medial to the, um, to the anterior uh, tibial artery is seen 
the deep peroneal nerve, which we will again see in later slides, but it is not very clearly visualized here. There was a little bit of, um, uh, of a, a, a hemangioma kind of um, pathology that was seen at this level, which could not be really corroborated because the patient was lost to follow up. However, we have the probe position, short axis scan, and of course the orientation facing onto the lateral side on the right side of the foot. Um, as I go through the short axis scan, as I said, all the tendons have to be followed in short axis scan as well as the long axis scan. So we begin in short axis scan, and that is the protocol we follow. And of course, as we go, tibialis anterior, short axis scan, but as we reach the insertion at the level of the base of first metatarsal, we make it into a long axis scan in order to see the insertion, the fibular pattern of the tendon. And this was a dynamic scan to test the integrity of the tendon as well. This is just a uh, Cine clip to show you the movement of the probe as we go from the proximal to the distal following the path. So, of course, we must know the anatomy going over to insert at the level of the base of the first metatarsal. In long axis scan, we always have to confirm that the insertion is smooth and there is no um, tendinosis that may be sitting in insertional tendinitis at that point. Moving on from here, we're talking about the dorsal recess. And in this, of course, we examine this in a long axis scan and evaluate for the joint effusion and the cellulitis. What we see are the boniacostic margins of the distal tibia, then of course the rounded head of the dome of the talus and the neck of the talus. It is important that this uh, the joint capsule is addressed and we can see the joint capsule which is hyperechoic and it is closely approximated to the anterior tailor margin and the cartilage of the tailor dome with the tibialis anterior tendon which is running superficial to it. The fat pads are seen very clearly at the neck and as well as in the decreases between the tibial tailor joint and these fat pads do get displaced every time there's a pathology in form of fluid of course giving rise to what is very popular and we all are familiar with this phrase or the, scent or the uh, catch words uh, from shoulder, the cartilage interface sign, and this becomes more prominent. You're able to see the cartilage, which you're not mm -hmm. able to see in a normal condition. That's, of course, the proposition for evaluation of the dorsal recess or the anterior tibiotalar joint space. Now, the ligamentous complexes in the ankle joint, and I'm going to bring you to pay attention to this diagram here, we just know that they are composed of three groups. So we are very familiar, of course, with the lateral ligamentous complex, then the medial ligamentous complex, also called as the deltoid ligament. But there is something which is present in the anterolateral distal region, and this is called as the syndrome the syndesmotic ligamentous complex. The syndesmotic ligamentous complex consists of the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Then it has an entrocious membrane. It takes its contributions from the capsule of the ankle as well as from the anterior talofibular ligament. And posteriorly, we have the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament as well. And this entire complex is called a syndesmosis. The function of the syndesmosis is to hold the tibia and the fibula together in an, appro an appropriate distance. And if on a scan in which the probe is placed supramedial in a manner closely aligning with the direction of the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, if this appears to be right here, it is seen in the order of hypoechogenicity, and if it also feels um, thickened, it looks thickened, and on probe palpation, it is tender. Then when we compare it from the asymptomatic side, we can always say that we are dealing with probably a syndesmotic ligamentous injury. This is how we see for the entrocious membrane between the fibula and the tibia. And um, uh, this entire complex should be dealt with in high tibials, uh, high ankle sprains. Of course, the probe position to look for the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. Moving from here, this is just one of the um, catches that I had of the tear of the inferior extensor retinaculum. Tibialis anterior was spared. As you can see, this was a proposition. So tibialis anterior tendon was spared and the thickened extensor retinaculum, which was chronically uh, thickened and there was a history of injury 
which was about three years old, neglected, and is encircling the extensor hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus. So now we are going from distal to proximal. And here we go from proximal to distal, and there's a thickening of the extensor retinaculum, which showed a chronic tear. So, uh, of course, that was the probe direction. Moving from the anterior, we come to the medial compartment. Now, the medial compartment, again, has got three tendons, and of course, the ligament, the famous deltoid ligament. We will be dealing with the tendons first. The posterior tibial tendon, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis. Now, all the three muscles are the primary adductors and the inverters of the foot. So when we come to tibialis posterior, the muscle, of course, takes its origin higher from both the tibia and the fibula, and inserts on the navicular, distally, right here, and a little part of the medial cuneiform. The flexor digitorum, so it is from this, of course, it's a probe in orientation, and all the three, uh, the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus with the neurovascular bundle and the tibial nerve are contained in what we call as a fibrosis tunnel. And this fibrosis tunnel is called a tarsal tunnel, which is covered by the flexor retinaculum moving from the medial malleolus going on to the posterior superior surface of the calcaneus. Now, it's important that we know that the tibialis posterior is um, most anterior, then posterior is the flexor digitorum, and more posterior is flexor hallucis longus. Uh, flexor digitorum longus, of course, takes its origin from the tibia, goes down and crosses over down along the medial plantar arch to take its insertion into the second to fifth toes and distal uh, phalanges of second to fifth toe uh, at the bases. Flexor hallucis longus takes its origin, of course, from the upper, which is fibula, and it goes down again distally through the tarsal tunnel to take its insertion at the level of the base of the distal phalanx plant surface of grade two. Done with the anatomy, it's just important that we must realize that all of them have got their separate tendon sheets. And these tendon sheets are all up to the level of the mid plantar arch bound by the flexor tendon, of course, they remain protected and they don't really have to, um, under the stressful conditions, unless there is a tear or a pathology, get separated. This is a path that we take for the scanning of the plane of the in a short axis scan and, of course, then also of the long axis scan. Coming to the sonoanatomy, that is the scan plane in the tarsal tunnel with the oblique scanning plane, short axis. What we see here is the tibialis posterior tendon, most anterior. Going posteriorly, we have the flexor digitorum and the flexor hallucis longus. Overlying is the flexor retinaculum, which is going from the medial malleolus all the way down, and it will then blend over the calcaneus, the neurovascular bundle with the uh, tibial nerve in it. Uh, this again is for you to look at the flexor retinaculum and this is an important landmark, bony landmark, where if you go more posteriorly, so if you place the probe a little more posterior as a seen here, you'll be able to see the tendon of flexor hallucis longus in between the medial and the lateral tubercles of the talus uh, along the, along the uh, medial surface of the talus. Uh, this is just a small clip, tibial nerve, of course, the flexor retinaculum, arrangement in an oblique manner from anterior to posterior, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum, flexor hallucis. Now, sometimes what happens is the flexor hallucis longus is a little difficult. The tendon is a little difficult to examine. And what we do is that we can move the lesser toes. And as we, this is, of course, we're moving the great toe. So we can see that this is flexor digitorum longus. And as we move the lesser toes, in flexion and extension, we can see that this is flexor hallucis longus that is moving, and it's easier for us to uh, or to optimize our image and bring the tendon into a uh, into a proper orientation for examination. Moving from the cine clip, this is just one of the examples in a case illustration where the patient landed up with the what we call as a tarsal tunnel syndrome, and this involves the posterior tibialis tendon majorly, but it may also involve the ligaments of the medial ankle. So the posterior tibialis tendon, as can be seen, 
and um, we are moving from the proximal to the distal. As we are moving from the proximal, as you can see, that there is an enlargement of this tendon with the heterogeneity. There is thickening of the flexor retinaculum that can be seen above it. And there is a tendon sheath effusion. There is a bit of an effusion here. Again, more effusion in synovitis on color Doppler. There is hyperemia. And then there is a, this big intrasubstance tear, the heterogeneity of the intrasubstance tear, where there was posterior tibialis tendon tear, thickening, enlargement. Now from the short axis scan, we make the orientation of the probe into long axis scan to prosody median of the navicular and the os naviculare that you can see for the insertion coming onto the insertion. And the heterogeneity that can be seen is of chronicity as well as acute on chronic. There was a re-tear of this posterior tibialis tendon and this patient landed up with a bad breast planus and medial foot pain. So this is the tarsal tunnel syndrome or the posterior tibialis syndrome. And other components of the posterior tibialis syndrome, we've already seen the tear or the tendinosis of the tibialis posterior tendon with thickening of the overlying flexor retinaculum. So flexor retinaculum would be probably somewhere here like this, thickened, the probe orientation. These are the regions in which the patient complains of severe pain on standing and walking. The best plan is there because uh, the the posterior tibialis tendon is actually responsible of maintaining the plantar arch and also supporting the tailor head here. This was accompanied of the tear that was present in the deltoid. The component was the tibiotalar ligament. Moving from the posterior tibialis, uh, we move to the flexor halysis and flexor digitorum. As you can see, uh, we have already covered where it comes up to the tarsal tunnel in their tendon sheets. And then along the plantar surface, they cross over each other to go up to their insertions. So this, of course, is the flexor hallucis going to the base of the distal phalanx of great toe and the flexor digitorum longus. And at the plantar arch, mid-plantar arch, they cross over each other and famously called as what is called as a knot of Henry. And this is the knot of Henry that you can see here, where they're crossing over along the mid plantar arch. In short axis, you can see them both overlying each other. And in the long axis, you can see this crossover very clearly. So along with the posterior tibialis syndrome, this becomes a differential diagnosis of the patient is complaining, then you ought to be looking at, because this would be strain if the plantar arch becomes straightened, it de definitely causes a strain of both flexor digitorum and flexor halysis and can result into tenosynovitis and giving a pain overlying, of course, on the plantar surface, we see the quadratus planti and the flexor digitorum brevis. Moving from the tendons, we come to the medial ligamentous complex or the deltoid ligament, delta, triangular in shape, so-called triangular in shape, and that's where it derives its name from. And deltoid has got two components. It has a superficial and a deep component. So superficial is the anterior tibial tailor, anterior tibial tailor, and the posterior tibial tailor is the posterior or the superficial component. The deeper ones are, which are more important from the um, from the clinical pathological perspective, we have tibiocalcanean, so from the medial malleolus going to the sustenticulum tali. Then we have what is the tibionavicular going to the tuberosity of the navicular, and then tibiospring ligament, also called as tibionaviculus calcaneal uh, spring ligament. So talking about deltoid ligament, I just thought that it would be easier for us to go over some of the bony landmarks, particularly if you're initially starting and doing, it kind of gets sometimes confusing. So this is just to help you out so that you can optimize the uh, image recreation. The pedial malleolus, cystanticulum tali, and the bony tuberosity of navicular. And posteriorly, if you feel, is the talus. I'm just going to just show you a small video clip. All you can do is palpate here the medial malleolus, navicular, the sustanticulum tali, and the tuberosity or the medial pole of the navicular. That is how it goes. Stopping here, how we proceed is keeping the superior end of the, uh, of the probe in a manner like this. So this becomes the fulcrum. And we move the probe all the way around along the long axes of the orientations of the three components, the deeper components of the 
deltoid ligament. So if I just put on, this is how you go all the way to come into a long axis of the tibio navicular. So we have the tibio calcanean going on the, to the sustenticulum tali of the calcaneus, tibio navicular going to the medial tuberosity of the navicular, and then the tibio tailor, which is going at the back to take the insertion on the um, talus. Coming to the sonar anatomy, again, the probe orientations have been shown in the images at the corner. And what we are dealing with here is the medial malleolus and the talus and the striated thick tibiotalar ligament as we move our probe more anteriorly or more distally. What the more distally is more appropriate, we find that we come to the tibio calcaneal. So I'm just going to leave the tibio calcaneal for a bit and come to tibio navicular. So from the navicular to the medial malleolus, you can see the tibio navicular ligament very clearly. Now in between the two, in between the two, there is a part, if you can see the echogenic striations here, this is part of the tibio calcaneal ligament which blends with it. So superficial to it, you should see the short axis scan of tibialis posterior right here. And deeper, it blends with the tibio -talar ligament. So if I have, this is of course the tibio -talar and part of the tibio calcaneal ligament that can be seen right here. And as we move a little more distally, we'll be able to then see the tibio navicular ligament. Spring ligament is extremely important because again, this helps to maintain the plantar arch and of course, gives support to the, uh, the talus as well, the head of the talus. And it is a, it is a kind of hammock shaped ligament, which takes its insertion or origin from the calcaneus cystanticulum tali and gets attached to the to the navicular as can be seen right here. That is the probe orientation. We've just seen those bony prominences. You just have to put the probe on those two bony prominences just beneath the medial malleolus and voila, you get the spring ligament. Over and above that, you can see the short axis scan of the tibialis uh, posterior tendon. It's very important that you must see the orientation, the configuration of the spring ligament, which is hammock shaped. If there is a tear or tibialis posterior uh, tendinosis or posterior tibialis tendon syndrome, this of course becomes lax and it kind of loses its strength and the configuration. Maxis nerve entrapment is just, I brought the question because this is one of the causes of pain syndromes in the lateral uh, heel. The tibial nerve divides into the lateral plantar and medial plantar nerves, and the lateral plantar nerve gives out an inferior calcaneal nerve branch, which gets entrapped between the quadratus planti and the uh, and the superficial structures, and that leads to a continuous pain. This is one of the differential diagnoses of heel pain of um, uh, secondary to the plantar fasciitis or fasciopathy as well. And this is a small video clip that I'm just going to share with you where it's very easy to follow tibial nerve. And as we move down distally, you can see the tibial nerve divided into the lateral plantar and medial plantar. And this lateral plantar gives out a branch which goes rather posteriorly and gets entrapped between the quadratus planti here. So this entrapment syndrome should be looked out for whenever there is a pain uh, on the pain on the medial side of the heel joint of the heel. And this medial pain has to be differentiated from the plantar fasciopathy. And this is the scan plane that we follow from the proximal to the distal, where the tibial nerve divides and gives out the inferior calcaneal nerve, giving the entrapment neuropathy. From the lateral, we move to the lateral compartment anatomy. Lateral compartment anatomy has got, again, the tendons. The tendon sheets are very important because they're a little different than the rest of the ankle. Then we have the ligament, which is the um, anterior telofibular ligament, calcaneofibular ligament, and posterior telofibular ligament, and the peroneal retinaculum. So when we talk about the anatomy, I'm just not going to take over, over the origins in the interest of time. The tendons in the, uh, there is, this of course is the fibrostaloid. So above this is the supramalleolar region, 
then we have the retromalleolar region and the inframalleolar region. And as is very clear here, in the supramalleolar region, both the tendon peroneus and longus share a common tendon sheath or synovial sheath. This is extremely important for us to remember when if there are subluxations. And in the, it extends up to the retromalleolar area and in the inframalleolar area, then they take on separate tendon sheaths to their insertions. The peroneus brevis goes and attaches itself to the base of the fifth metatarsal and the peroneus longus then takes a course underneath the uh, foot plantar surface to take its insertion at the base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. Now, the superficial or the superior peroneal retinaculum again forms a bony fiber osseous canal, which is not as bad as the tarsal tunnel, yet it sometimes leads to impingement syndromes here and, uh, and the peroneal tunnel syndromes here. So uh, these are the ligaments that we just discussed. This is, of course, the anterior lateral syndesmosis. So we are talking about the anterior tibiofibular ligament and the posterior tibiofibular ligament, but just beneath that, we have the anterior talofibular ligament. Then we have the uh, calcaneofibular ligament and the posterior tibiofibular ligaments that we will be discussing mm -hmm. shortly again. So um, I'm just going to share here a small video clip to show you the path that we take to scan the lateral ankle. So we go from the supramalleolar to the retromalleolar and then the inframalleolar region. And this is a small video clip to show you the tendons. Now in tendons are, this is peroneus longus, and in between the peroneus longus and the bone, the fibula, we have peroneus brevis. Underneath that is the calcaneofibular ligament. And as we go down distally, we follow it in long axis scan and see the peroneus brevis takes its insertion at the peroneus at the fifth metatarsal. So I'm just going to go over again and stop this video for a while to show you bit by bit as to where the anatomy lies when we are talking about doing the scan. So this is where I will stop. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I'm just going to stop here. And in between the peroneus longus and the brevis, what you see is a hypoechoic, hypoechoic peroneus brevis. So if I am going to start and just take you bit by bit, peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, and fibula, and going again, so as we go distally, this is a retromalleolar area, one sheet, one sheet in the retromalleolar area. And as we go into the inframalleolar area, they separate out. This is a long axis scan, so I'm, uh, I'll be sharing another video clip in which I'll be more clearly be able to show you how they differentiate into two separate sheets. Uh, stop this here, the long axis scan of the peroneus brevis taking its insertion and peroneus longus, which will go under the plantar surface. Again, peroneus brevis taking its insertion on the base of the fifth metatarsal. So coming to this video clip, I'm going to again share where I can show you this is the retromalleolar area, peroneus longus and peroneus right here, peroneus brevis, covered by the superior peroneal retinaculum. If you can see, peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, calcaneofibular ligament over above. And as they go distally, that's a peroneal tubercle. Peroneus longus separates. Again, we are going to go peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, and the superior peroneal retinaculum, as you can see right here, covered in the fibrosis fibula, the calcaneofibular ligament, peroneus brevis, peroneus longus, as it moves dif dif distally, the peroneal tubercle, peroneus brevis, and they separate out into two tendon sheets as is seen in the image here. Uh, some of the pathologies that are very important with relation to the peroni. The first one, of course, is subluxation of the peroni. Not a very common injury to happen, but if there is a tear of the superior peroneal retinaculum, or they actually go and uh, in the common tendon sheets, there is a subluxing peroneal longus ligament, whenever that, of course, is the probe orientation. And the maneuver that we do is that we evert and dorsiflex the foot in this position of the probe, as we do the version dorsiflexion, we see that the peroneus longus in the common tendon sheath actually changes its position. So this is uh, along the lateral malleolus, posterior to the lateral malleolus, peroneus longus and peroneus brevis are 
uh, noted as we saw, saw in the video clip. And as we do the maneuver, it actually changes its position within the tendon sheath, and that's a subluxing peroneal tendon. Tenosynovitis is a very common pathology, which in, uh, any tendon actually suffers from. Nothing new, but this is peroni are more prone to it, where you can see the synovial sheath, thickening, thickening of the synovial sheath with the synovitis, a little bit of fusion, overlying extensive tendon, ex uh, overlying peroneal retinaculum thickening. Again, the fluid echogenicity is altered with a thickening right here. Another companion case here, where you can see that there is a tear of the peroneus brevis as well, and the entire peritendinous area is altered in the fascia and uh, in the retinaculum thickening that can be seen. So tenosynovitis, of course, should also be combined with color doppler imaging to see if there is a hypervascularity or a neovascularity. We talked about the tear of the peroneus brevis in the earlier case. These are usually longitudinal splits, both the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis. They actually don't divide into two and retract. They have longitudinal tears, as can be seen here. And this is just one of the images where there was a tear of the peroneus brevis. So there were hemitendons of both the peroneus brevis, and you could see the subluxation of the peroneus longus in it, little bit of tendon fluid sheath in, in the uh, sheath that could be seen here. So peroneus brevis has to be not even though the tears are in long axis, you have to go and take it in a short axis in order to elicit the hemitendons and the tear, uh, which causes the cleft to, to happen and the longus imaginating into it. So coming to the ligaments, we are talking about the anterior telofibular ligament here. This is diagram here. Um, the probe orientation for eliciting anterior telofibular ligament, normal anterior telofibular ligament, which can be seen in the diagrammatic. It is an echogenic thick fibular structure, which takes its origin from the fibula and goes on to the talus. Grade two injury, where you can see the thickening, altered echogenicity, a lot of thickening. And of course, it was symptomatic, tender. And this is complete tear. You can see the retracted tendons here of the peroni. And there is a complete tear of the anterior telofibula, grade three injury. Now, there is something which is called a sonographic anterior rose test, which when we perform, we perform it uh, so that the foot is drawn anteriorly and the talus then is actually moved a little anterior and this anterior movement causes space to open up and if there is a tear then it can be elicited more clearly in cases of particularly where there is a thickening. So there is just a small video clip here where the draw stress, sonographic draw stress was performed and as we pulled the talus forward, we could see that the thinning of the tendon the anterior of the ligament was seen and there was a little bit of the torn part of the ligament which was hanging within the fluid in the lateral gutter and the thinning of the tendon could be very clearly seen only after we did a drawers test. Otherwise, it just felt that the tendon was intact as when we go back uh, if I go back to the, it almost looks like normal tendon here with a fat pad. Calcaneofibular ligament is the next ligament of the lateral ligamentous complex. Peroni are seen in short axis scan. If you see them, this is a probe orientation, and if you see calcaneofibular ligament in long axis scan, in a neutral position, then what you see is a lax and hypoechogenicity of the ligament. So what, you, what we do is that we dorsiflex. On dorsiflexion, there is a taut ligament that is seen. And this, of course, shows the integrity, a companion image for you to see the calcaneofibular ligament. And this is, of course, it is the it's almost vertical from the fibula goes on to the calcaneal tubercle for its attachment. So it's kind of easy with the probe orientation to elicit the calcaneal fibular ligament. And of course, the short axes of peroni are landmarks, soft tissue landmarks to show you we are in right position. Then the posterior talofibular ligament, this is very difficult to elicit. And for that, we do an extreme flexion to open up the space between the fibula and the talus. And sometimes then also this kind of looks easy right here, but it's difficult to elicit. It's almost horizontally placed, as you can see here, horizontally placed to the 
um, to the plantar surface of the foot. So it should not be difficult, but yes, with dorsiflexion, it kind of becomes easy just in case we're talking of uh, some sort of a complex ankle injury. Uh, the subtalar space is the space that is created by the talus and the calcaneum. And the subtalar space or subtalar joint has got a tunnel which runs from medial to lateral called as a sinus tarsi. It is wide on the lateral side and very narrow on the medial side. So in order to elicit sinus tarsi syndromes where there are pain syndromes and they are particularly useful if there is a subtalar osteoarthritis to inject. This is a probe orientation to elicit the sinus tarsi, a dip that is seen between the talus and the calcaneum and overlying that is the inferior extensor retinaculum that runs. This is a fluid that is present in the sinus tarsi and sinus tarsi syndromes are extremely painful, particularly in osteoarthritic limbs. So the pain management people find it very easy to inject steroids to relieve the patients of the pain. Coming to the posterior compartment, posterior compartment has tendo Achilles with the master of all the tendons in the foot. Uh, it does not have a synovial sheath. It has a parotenon, which is a loose connective tissue compressed surrounding it. Kager is fat pad, which is fat pad anterior to the tendo Achilles, retrocalcaneal bursa. Plantaris tendon, which lies medial, sural nerve, which lies lateral, and the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa. Now, this is an important thing that I want you to address here. Lateral gastrocnemius, medial gastrocnemius biceps suri form a tendon not here but they go on to form the tendon somewhere low down as we come to the soleus the soleus joins the biceps suri tendon a little low down in this region and when it extends downwards the tendon of tendoachylis consolidates to take its insertion on the calcaneus and the path that it follows we follow to um, assess the tendo Achilles just does not stop at the ankle. We must or will follow it up at the level of the musculotendinous junction, both at the biceps suri as well as the triceps suri. So this is just a video clip. Uh, the atrophied lateral and medial gastrocnemius, the aphiderosis of the gastromedial um, medii, then the tendon that forms soleus. Again, the tendon of the soleus goes on distally to form the tendo Achilles. This is, of course, the flexor hallucis longus belly here. So moving on to the sonar anatomy, tendo Achilles, calcaneum, and here it just shows the tendo Achilles insertion just doesn't stop here. It goes way back almost up to the level of the origin of the plantar fascia. So we must really go all the way back up to the plantar fascia. Then the Kager's fat pad, Kager's fat pad, hypoechoic with the retrocalcaneal bursa, which is not normally seen in normal conditions. And this is hypoechoic. Uh, if I have to do the dynamic scan, this is a dynamic scan that we do, plant flexion and dorsiflexion in order to elicit the tears of the tendoachylis or the pathologies. And this is a video clip I'm sharing here to show you how the normal comma shaped retrocalcaneal bursa looks like. It goes back and forth, freely mobile, and that is the tendo Achilles, Kager's fat pad, and the calcaneum. Moving from the uh, tendo Achilles again, no, we're still on tendo Achilles, the long axis scan, Kager's fat pad, retrocalcaneal bursa. This is in an immature a skeleton, the patient was young, about 11 years. So this is an unossified epithelial cartilage of calcaneal, should not be uh, diagnosed as having a pathology or Siebel's disease, uh, Kager's fat pad. Normal short axis scan, which is very important. Do you see the fibular pattern, the homogeneity, and the surrounding palatinon, which is of normal thickness. More importantly, the anterior part, the anterior surface of the tendo Achilles should always be flat or a little concave versus when there's a pathology, as you can see here, intercepts and stairs, very thick paratenon. This is heterogeneity of the tear. And of course, the anterior surface of the tendo Achilles has become convex as compared to this portion. Moving from here, the tear, of the, as we saw, that was the partial intrasubstance. This is complete tear of the tendo Achilles. Now, when we are here, we really do, do not uh, appreciate where the distal end of the retracted 
edge of the tendon Achilles is the movement of the ankle that should be done. And this is a video clip of the same patient where we were able to elicit that the, this is not the retracted segment. This is, of course, the fibrous tissue, the seroma that fills in at the level of the tear, muscular tendons junction, Kago's fat pad has completely changed the psychogenicity to now being very echogenic rather than hypoechoic. And that is the tapered end of the proximal retracted segment. We are doing a dynamic scan here. And as we're doing dynamic scan, we are able to appreciate that on an apparently it looks as if this is the edge of the distal retracted segment, but this is fibrosis. Distal retracted segment is far distally. And of course, the Kager's fat pad is invaginating or herniating into that area. So this would never end up healing spontaneously. Hagland's syndrome is something which is very important. Hagland's deformity is a sort of bony tubercle that is there on the posterior superior surface of the calcaneus and keeps rubbing against the retrocalcaneal bursa against the shoes. What it results into is the retrocalcaneal bursitis, fluid thickening, and inflammation, which ultimately leads to, of course, the insertional enthesopathy of the tendoachylis. It can lead to cal calcifications that are there, a thickening of the retrocalcaneal bursa right here, and the preachylis bursa, which can have fluid or it can just show thickening in the subcutaneous region. So retrocranical bursitis, insertional enthropathy with or without the tear, retrocalcaneal bursitis with a Hagland's deformity is also called as Hagland's syndrome. Plantaris tendon is extremely important because it's a part of two important processes. The first, which is lesser of the two, is that it is a tendon which is very commonly used for grafts. Promise tendon and palmaris a longest tendon is the first choice, and then it's a plantar tendon. The second is that it is important part of a pathological process called as a tennis leg. So either the plantar is taking off or the medial head of the gastrocnemius at muscular tendons taking off or both of them taking off, all of them land up with something which is called as a tennis leg. Now, when there is a tear of the plantaris, the only tear of the plantaris is not an emergency, but if it is of the gastrocnemius, it does become an uh, emergency in active sports player. Plantaris tendon between the gastrocnemius and the soleus in long axis scan. Plantaris tendon in short axis scan right by the side of the tendon, Achilles tendon. It takes its insertion on the calcaneus. 20% of the times it may blend with the tendon Achilles here. Normal plantaris versus a tear of the plantaris. Normal short axis plantaris versus tear of the plantaris with a retracted segment at the level of the calcaneus. From the plantaris tendon, we move, move to sural nerve, and it's a very important nerve. Why is it important? Because it has a close association with three structures. It has close association with tendo Achilles, then it has close association with the short saphenous vein, and then with the peroni, all the three peroni. So it tends to get involved in orthopedic surgeries or in stripping of the short saphenous veins and can land up because it's a sensory nerve. So it can land up with a lot of debilities with the patient. These are the propositions in the, uh, in the uh, supramalleolar, then in the uh, retromalleolar and the inframalleolar region. So short saphenous vein. This is the uh, sural nerve here, peroni calcaneofibular ligament and as we go distally we can see the nerve changing its position along with the saphenous vein right here tenuaculis short saphenous vein and the sural nerve and it's very important that we are able to elicit should there be a symptomatic patient in case of sensory loss with this i come to the end of my presentation thank you so much for your patient listening and if at all we have delegates who get inspired by the musculoskeletal ultrasound. This is a course that is going to be released. It's an international course in June of 2021. So do log on to mus-ucam.com for more information. Thank you very much, Dr. Preeti, for all your support and congratulations on an extremely well-conducted conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. That was indeed a great session. We request you to address the questions, if any, in the Q&A section. Yes, I will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much you, and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Next, uh, we have 
Dr. Amit Kharat sir, who would be taking a session on MRI ankle. He is a professor of radiology mm-hmm. at D. Y. Patil University, Pune, and a consultant of musculoskeletal imaging at Sanjeeti Institute of Orthopedics. We welcome you, sir, and request you to start the session. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thanks, everyone, uh, for calling me. Uh, indeed, a great pleasure to be here, uh, and thanks, Nidhi, for making my job easier. Hi, by, yeah, thanks. How are you doing? Uh, doing well. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Nidhi. All the best. Thank you so much. You made my job really easy by going so much into the detail anatomy of the tendon. So thanks for that. So I will kind of use that to uh, as a leverage for my lecture. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. So uh, just to uh, quickly summarize in terms of the from the MRI uh, perspective, uh, the anatomy. So what we will do is uh, uh, consider the ankle in terms of various ligaments, joints, as well as uh, tendons. And I think uh, we will study all of them one by one. We'll also study the articular cartilage and we will also study the uh, joint per se. So over an, uh, uh, I'll grossly divide the topic into three areas. First is the ligaments. And what I have is a set of images which uh, we could use to uh, review these findings. So on the ligament side, uh, as Dr. Nidhi has already covered from the ultrasound aspect, I just want to add uh, important highlights from the MRI aspect. Uh, we have the uh, on the deltoid ligament, which is on the medial side, on the lateral side, we have the lateral collateral ligament complex. And then along with that, we have the uh, distal tibiofibular syndesmotic complex. And I think uh, all of them look uh, quite different from what they look on ultrasound. Uh, just to quickly showcase these and uh, very, very briefly, we have uh, on the lateral side, the anterior talofib. I'm going to show this much in detail. Uh, this is the uh, calcaneofibular ligament. Uh, again, we are going to study this in detail and posterior talofibular. So that's the important three ligaments which we are going to see on our MR images. Also, we are going to see the syndesmotic ligament complex, which is basically the anterior and the posterior tibiofibular ligament complex. And these are pretty weak ligaments. They are uh, easy to uh, rupture or break even with a smaller injury. And that's why we need to know a little bit in detail about them. While on the lateral side, we have the deltoid ligament, pretty complex ligament, multiple parts. In fact, seven parts of the deltoid ligament have been described. And what we are going to do is uh, see all these components to some extent as in uh, easily how it is possible to see on various uh, sequences and imaging planes on the MR. Just to enumerate, once again, we have this large deltoid ligament, which has superficial and deep components. But here we are going to just consider the ligaments not as superficial or deep, but components which are actually visible or easily appreciated on uh, various images, whether it's actual coronal or sagittal. So that's the tibio-navicular ligament. We have a tibio-calcaneal ligament, uh, which is the green one. We have the tibio-spring ligament. And the tibio-navicular, if you see, it has an anterior as well as a posterior component. So that's, that's about the deltoid ligament complex. Then we go to te- tendons. And I think tendons have been described in detail, just to give you that there are four important compartments we are going to see, out of which the t- anterior compartment tendons, which is tibialis anterior extensor hallucis extensor digitorum, uh, medial compartment, which are the tibialis posterior flexor digitorum longus and hallucis, the lateral tendons, which is the peroneal tendons, and of course, the tendoacle is the most important. So before we go and see all these things, I will just kind of uh, move from the presentation to uh, the DICOM image data where we could just easily appreciate all of them. So uh, if you see most of these images, uh, what we are seeing are going to see in all the three planes, axial, coronal, and sag. And in that, we basically, uh, I uh, I think the sequences vary from institution to institution, but uh, I typically uh, see to it that I have at least uh, a PDFS, a fat saturated, fat suppressed image in all three planes. And I supplement it with a, a T1 image without any suppression in the or a PD image in an actual as well as in the sagittal or coronal plane, depending upon what pathology I'm looking at. So uh, let's see the anatomy one by one. So first is we'll start with the actual images and I hope the screen is visible and you're able to see this anatomy well. So uh, moving from superior to inferior, I am just going to quickly scroll through the images and I'm going to show the various anatomy. So that's the identification of the distal end of the fibula. That's the distal end of the tibia. And you can see that there are ligaments which are bridging across at the level of the distal tibiofibular joint. And that's the 
what we call as the syndesmotic ligaments, which consists of the AITFL, which is the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. The posterior dark structure is the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, and between them is the interosseous membrane. And uh, this ligament is a pretty weak ligament, very easily broken. The most commonly tone aspect is the AITFL, which is anteriorly inferiorly located here as a thin band, and the ligament may appear wavy and the contour may get disrupted and you may see fluid on FS images, fat suppressed images. As I go more inferiorly, I'll see another ligament and that's the fibula, that's the talus and a ligament which bridge, bridges from the fibula to the talus anteriorly, that, that's the anterior talofibular ligament. That's a very important ligament because again, in cases of twisting injuries at the ankle, this is very commonly torn. While there is another band-like ligament, which is very thick, you can really appreciate this ligament on this image, which is from the fibula going towards the talus posteriorly, and that's the posterior talofibular ligament. The calcaneo fibular ligament is a very thin ligament. It runs between the calcaneum and the peroneal tendons as a thin dark band, and it will be seen only as cut sections as a cord-like structure on your actual images, but it's on your coronal images that you may be able to appreciate this ligament a little bit more in detail. So that's about the actual anatomy visualization of the lateral ligament. I will also show it from the coronal plane. Similarly, I would like to showcase the ligaments on the medial aspect and that's where the deltoid ligament comes in. And deltoid ligament is a very thick ligament. It's a very difficult ligament to rupture or break as compared to the lateral ligament complex, which is very easy to tear. And it uh, we have to actually describe which component of the ligament is torn. So, so that's the malleolus. We have to identify the malleolus, go down and then start appreciating the ligament. So it's going to be seen in this area and I'm going to showcase various parts of the ligament in the coronal plane better because that's where I really appreciate the ligament well. Uh, moving from the ligament, I will also show other anatomy here and that's the tendoaculus. It's a very flat structure. It is typically con flat or a concave in a margin here. And when it starts bulging, it becomes abnormal. And that's where the disease process will be better appreciated in the ligament, uh, in the tendon, sorry. And uh, also from medial to lateral, I would like to identify the various tendons. And that's what we have the tibialis posterior as a black dot. Next to that is the flexor uh, digitorum. Uh, and then we have the flexor hallucis, which is located laterally. And between them, we can see elements of the neurovascular bundle. Also, we have on the lateral aspect, the peroneal tendons. One is seen with the tendon and some component of the muscle, that's the brevis. And the one which is the only purely seen as a tendon round cord like structure is the longus. And I'm going to appreciate as it goes down below and goes very close towards the lateral malleolus. It will be bridged across by a thin fascia, which is the peroneal retinaculum. It has two components, the deep and the superficial, and they kind of cover this Similarly, we have the flexor retinaculum here, which is bridging across the flexor tendons. So you can see them. The, all these are better appreciated on T1-weighted images. They will not be appreciated on your PDFS images. That's why uh, taking a T1-weighted image is important. Uh, moving ahead, I want to also showcase to you the anteriorly located extensory tendons, which are going to be here, which consists of the tibialis anterior as well as the extensor hallucis and extensor digitorum. So they are all anteriorly located and they will be bridged across by a retinaculum as well, which is the extensor retinaculum, which has two components and one of them will definitely be covered. The lower component will definitely be covered on the ankle MR imaging. And uh, that also could get torn in various conditions and that's why we need to look at it carefully, map it. Now that we know these anatomy in the actual plane of the various tendons, we will also try to look at the anatomy in the coronal plane. So that's the coronal image. And uh, uh, again, first I will showcase to you is the uh, image in without fat suppression to better appreciate the anatomy. And first I basically scroll from anterior to posteriorly to see and get the bearings right, where am I? And then I could go back and showcase the images. So that's the medial malleolus. If you see, it's very large, thick, and that's the uh, talus. And you could really appreciate that there are a few ligaments going from the medial malleolus to the talus and accordingly you can uh, gauge which ligament am I looking at. So once again from anterior to posterior and as I go uh, anteriorly from I can see some ligament which is attaching from the medial malleolus to the talus and that becomes part of the tibiotalar ligament complex. 
I will also be able to appreciate some thin component anteriorly. So I have gone anteriorly. I can see some thin component that could be the anterior tibiotalar. Then we also have some ligament which goes towards the navicular bone. And if you are able to appreciate the navicular bone in the images because it's far anteriorly, that is what we call the tibio navicular component. But not necessarily it will be seen in all patients because the ligament is typically thin and not necessarily that in that particular plane we are able to appreciate it. There is also a tibio spring component which is which could be appreciated in some of the images which is again merges with the spring ligament of the uh, of the ankle joint and that's where this component will be seen so typically we don't differentiate the ligament as superficial or deep but as per the anatomy what we are able to see and appreciate so uh, that's about the medial complex uh, there is a sinus tarsi as well there could be uh, the uh, cervical ligament which is uh, or the interosseous ligament which are located within this and this space is necessary to be seen because a lot of time many times you can see sub articulus erosions uh, there could be ganglions uh, because of high pressure within this especially common in uh, sports related injuries and uh, runners uh, where there is a very high intra uh, pressure which gets developed within this tunnel and that can cause erosions and marrow edema in the adjacent bones so that's important anatomy there Second important thing is this is one of the best images to see in the coronal plane and I'm going to also open up a SAG image because I want to show you uh, before that I would like to show the same anatomy on the coronal because the cartilage is something which is going to be appreciated on the PDFS image very well. And again you can see some ligament complexes attachment to the bone, some subtle erosion starting happening, some signal within this uh, ligaments. And these signals could be very well normal. You need to really correlate with the clinical history before calling any of these as grade one signal or sprain unless there is a clear-cut history of trauma there is associated significant marrow edema and there is swelling if you look at the cartilage we we can see that's very smooth and there is no erosions uh, the ankle mortise looks absolutely normal and uh, what we need to look for here is in young patients is a osteochondral defect and in senior uh, or el elderly individual is a uh, is the defect and in young individuals what it could be an osteochondral uh, osteochondritis desiccans so looking at the age we classify them and we give them different nomenclatures as whether it's osteochondritis desiccans in young individuals and an osteochondral defect in uh, senior individuals or uh, secondary or degenerative cases at the knee joint so you can also appreciate the syndesmotic ligament very well in this area and this is where we need to look carefully for these deeper classification of fractures which could be low medium or high uh, moving from here uh, to other structures at the angle uh, is let me open a SAG image and showcase them to you. So critical to understand is the tendoachillus and that's the nicely demarcated tendoachillus. Let me see I have, if I have an additional image in the SAG plane. Yeah, so we have these images, both of them. Yeah, and uh, so that's the tendoachillus. So if you see the tendoachillus is very flat, large, cord like structure typically dense uh, and uh, as a very dark band if you see anterior there's a kegel's fat pad which is absolutely bright on the fat suppress uh, on the fat uh, t1 images uh, and the fat suppress images there is no fluid in this this is a very critical zone because a lot of inflammation happens here why it is important is because this is the stider process of the uh, talus and uh, we need to see this very carefully because at this area we could have os trigonum and if there is a separate ossicular bone which is not there in this case uh, there could be impingement especially when there is significant plantar flexion again in sports in ballet dancers or maybe in other kind of sports injuries as well we could see this impingement here and that time you can see inflammation in this fat in this patient we don't see any of these but you need to be carefully looking at the stider process should be looking at the os trigonum if at all it is there also appreciate the tendoachillus as it inserts on the calcaneal on with a very large footprint because because of its constant pull here uh, there could be enthesophytes and these enthesophytes uh, will be seen as foci of calcification or a large uh, bridging uh, what we call as a tractional spur at the attachment of the uh, tendoachillus tendon and this will cause some element of insertional tendinosis of the tendoachillus secondary it causes inflammation at the retrocalcaneal bursa which is located here between it has a superficial and deep component superficial is outside deep is inside if you see any inflammation of fluid collection between that uh, the calcaneum and the tendoachillus that's the deep retrocalcaneal bursa same plane 
is a great plane to appreciate the plantar fascia to see if there is any element of plantar fasciitis which will be seen as bright signal within this thick band of fascia also there could be a prominent spur which will be better seen on radiograph but could be easily corroborated on the sag images so that's the important anatomy which i would i typically appreciate i also look for any effusion in the anterior inferior joint space uh, which is so ankle joint basically has two components uh, on a sag image they have the anterior as well as the posterior dependent areas fluid typically gravitates in the anterior dependent area when it starts getting uh, significant it starts distending and it is seen as a bulging fat pad on your x rays so in this case you can just see a little amount of fluid little reactive synovitis is not something which is uh, significant or needs any mention but unless uh, if there is symptomatic also look at the talo navicular joint look for the articular cartilages look for the capsule and in this case you can incidentally see ganglions like something like these may pop out between the various joint like the calcaneo cuboid as well so sometimes they cause pain sometimes they are incidental finding but when you see them it is worth mentioning them uh, moving from these images uh, i think i have covered most of the anatomy in the sag plane and the coronal plane let me see if i have uh, also try to look at the arches of the foot so sometimes it is very vague we don't know what we are looking at in an ankle mr Uh, the problem may be somewhere lying in the forefoot and that may have not been covered so ideally always take one large fov uh, field of view image in a uh, if you are comfortable in the sag and if you want a t1 or a pdfs or it is regular t1 without fat suppression you can just take that to look at the anatomy always look at the x ray without x ray kindly do not report Uh, unless and until it is purely a ligamental injury because there could be small avulsion fractures which may not be very easily picked up on the mr study you may do a ct cut if required also look at the arches because if there is a flat foot uh, then we probably need to look at the spring ligament in much more detail look at the plantar fascia in more details uh, we may also have plantar fibromatosis in this area so that's why a larger field of view image is absolutely necessary uh, to be seen Uh, so that's the pdfs again axial plane i think uh, all these anatomy i have uh, covered in quite a bit of detail uh, one important applied anatomy of the peroneal tendons is that the peroneus brevis is the one which gets most likely injured as compared to the peroneus longus because it is very uh, easily impinged between the bony aspect or the the ligament which is lying below that uh, which is which could be the calcaneo fibular ligament as well as the bone and the peroneus tendons especially in eversion cases and it may get split also uh, the retinaculum can get torn and when the retinaculum tears the uh, the peroneal tendons may get subluxated so that's uh, important applied anatomy also uh, one important point is the magic angle effect and i think that has been covered in detail by previous speakers as well also on ultrasound we call that anisotropy what is important to know here is Uh, on ankle the anisotropy as you see it in supraspinatus tendon is very evident or even on t1 weighted images as the tendon curves next to bony sites like in this case that's the distal end of the fibula that's a tendon which is curving below and you may end up uh, kind of calling this tendon really abnormal because you feel that there is some bright signal within it but frankly this tendon is not abnormal this tendon just basically has uh, the the challenges which are created because of magic angle effect so uh, if you are any time having doubt about the tendon always better go back to your actual images and try to uh, see those images and uh, get uh, kind of confirm that there is no abnormality so i think with this uh, i quickly go back to my slide presentation because anatomy is the key and uh, i don't want to kind of miss out in discussing all the various uh, important ligament so let me quickly showcase to you a uh, few pathological cases yeah that's uh uh case 124 year old male patient came with history of twisting injury to the ankle and there is swelling and pain in the left ankle since 2 years so uh, that's the mr images so what's evident on the images marrow edema in the neck of the talus also in the head of the talus you can clearly see that there is some cortical irregularity as well in this and uh, let me see if i have more images yeah so our imaging should not stop at that so most of the time what happens is 
we end up just mentioning about those irregularity and then we stop at that particular point so that is not uh, not done because uh, important is the patient has come for assessment of ligament so look at the ligaments very well and if you clearly see in this case uh, the ligament here the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is definitely disrupted there's also fluid in between the joint space and you need to comment on that this is something which is very evident is it anyway going to be picked up very well also go down below and see your ai atfl which is the anterior tibio fibular ligament and if you see there's some fluid around it maybe some strain but definitely not a tear so this is just to highlight that uh, all stress fractures not necessarily are uh, seen in the calcaneum or in the metatarsals they could also be in the neck of the talus and you need to do ct cuts especially in the very thin cuts it's not that you do a ct cut just for the name of a ct you're doing it but you need to take actually thin sections because these stress fractures are not going to be picked up on your x rays uh, you can only pick up marrow edema on your mr and unless you don't take very thin cuts uh, there are very particular fractures where thin cuts are necessary especially neck of the femur uh, intracapsular fractures which are very easily missed in spite of taking the best ct images unless you don't see them in all three planes and that is the importance uh, going back going to the next case uh, this is a 32 year old female who came with pain in the ankle associated with tenderness since one year but which has increased since four days so let's see what is this so here it is there's if you see what's abnormal here is uh, x ray gives so much information which uh, we don't really get from uh, from even by doing an mr frankly what we need to see is use this information as a cue to make our mr diagnosis far easier and confident so these fine calcifications is the enthesophytes uh, and they uh, within the Uh, as well as the tendon calcification what we are seeing within the tendo achelis so that's the uh, calcification within the distal end you can see the tendon bulk you can clearly identify the tendon here is normal that's the fat that's the tendon you can clearly see its margin and here it has become so edematous so on x ray itself you can judge that this patient is going to have some tendinosis there's a plantar spur as well but you don't see any other bony protuberances uh, some fat may be blurred here so going to the mr image you can clearly see that there is tendinosis there is secondary reactive marrow edema and there is deep retrocalcaneal bursitis and that that's how x rays need to be always uh, used to be correlate with your finding but at the same time also want to showcase some important uh, syndromes and when we talk about ankle uh, important is to know about this hagelin syndrome and hagelin syndrome basically is a triad and there are three things that happen one is insertional achelous tendinopathy there is retrocalcaneal bursitis and there is a hagelin's deformity there's a posterior superior calcaneal exostosis so can you see this exostosis so is this case which i saw show, showed you before uh, hagelin syndrome no this is not because we don't see the exostosis but if you see the triad complete when you see this bony protuberances then so why this happens uh, if it's again occupation time kind of shoes which you wear or a period of time could also be one of the contributing factors so very hard shoes with the uh, um with a less amount of flexibility uh, with constant rubbing which happens here also in certain occupational conditions you may end up with this kind of a problem so we need to know this entity that and there are three components for that entity moving to another case which is uh, a 54 year old male patient with pain and swelling in both feet so it is not a unilateral it's a bilateral problem and of course we clearly have that the patient is having gout and is on treatment so diagnosis is pretty clear because now we have a clinical history with us and mr is just for confirmation and what is important to know is that this reactive synovitis here is not anteriorly but posteriorly uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, subtle edema and erosions in the uh, sinus tarsi also we see this typical spotty edema pattern now classically it should be in the forefoot and not in the ankle so even if this patient came for a ankle it is our job to increase the field of view and cover the entire ankle and here we have done exactly that and you can see all these classic eccentric erosion so you know they have crenellated margins they are eccentric and uh, there could be tophaceous deposits now the unless we don't have a x ray we can't comment on that but on mr you can definitely see these classical subarticular erosions uh, some element of synovitis in between these wherever these bones are articulating and spotty marrow edemas and this should give way to the diagnosis okay we have i think 8 minutes uh, so coming to case 4 uh, this is history is very classic 67 year old male patient 10 year history of type 2 diabetes and there is now swelling and this is looking more like a sepsis in the foot and that's the mr image 
There's the actual image. Now see the reactive tenosynovitis across all these tendons, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum, flexor hallucis, even the peroneal tendons. A lot of granulation tissue is hardly ligaments are seen, all are stretched. And you can see the bones, they're all showing significant marrow edema erosions. In fact, a lot of abnormality. The entire uh, ankle is showing complete disarticulation and only granulation tissue. And when you see this picture, and let me showcase the same in the Sag plane, there's the foot, if you see the arches also flattening out, there's granulation tissue even there. Look at the articulation, articulation between navicular and talus. This is complete disarticulation or subluxation. Uh, there's also telescoping between bones. Uh, your talus is telescoping between into the calcaneum. The bones are eaten up. There are a lot of erosions. And when you see this, uh, you can see this synovial thickening, which is there. The tendons are also getting stretched as if like a C-shaped structure. This foot is becoming more like a rock bottom kind of a foot. And when you see these changes, you know that this is all um, deformity, debris, and uh, this disarticulation, which is classically seen in neuropathic joints. And we know diabetic foot can also present with this leprosy, chronic insensitivity to pain, and other causes will also present with a neuropathic foot like this. And this is one similar case. If you do an x-ray, you may also see some kind of element of vascular calcification. And now in this space, you can see the peroneal retinaculum so well because it is so much stretched. You can see the flexor retinaculum so well because it is so much stretched because of the fluid around it. Of course, there's a lot of subcutaneous edema also which is there along the foot and the granulation tissue is very well appreciated. Is there any rule of contrast? Frankly, no. Even if it is, uh, you, you may end up doing a biopsy in this case, if you want to assess whether this is really infective or it is uh, kind of aseptic. Moving to another case, uh, this is case five, 26 year old female, history of ankle sprain and uh, six months back and swelling over the tendoachillus region associated with intermittent watery discharge. Now X-ray is important, but if you look at the MR, you can clearly see the focal erosion in the calcaneum. Uh, that's the tendoachillus, which inserts on the calcaneum, but it is not directly related to tendoachillus. It's primarily in the bone, not within the tendon, not in the retrocalcaneal bursa as well. So when you see a focal lesion, probably some element of also, uh, there is a cortical disruption. And uh, that's the MR image. And you can clearly see that's the, probably some element of uh, tendon disruption, even cortical disruption. And when you see this, this is basically nothing else but a case of focal tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, as you know, can occur anywhere, any bone. It is not a bone tumor. It is basically tuberculosis involvement of the calcaneum. And that's how, why we are not calling it a bone tumor, because if you see, it has no distinct margins, is kind of very ill-defined. And, uh, and there is a lot of soft tissue associated. With it is kind of disrupting the cortical bone as well. And that's why we are calling this uh, as an infective focus rather than a bone tumor. Let's see this case six, a uh, 38 year old male patient swelling in the foot and distal leg. And there is a car which had ran over the right foot. And so, but that probably was an incidental finding that the car had ran over the foot because I am seeing something else. Of course, you do look at the ligament, but what, what is evident here is this incidental finding. And I think this is a spot diagnosis. We know that this is an osteochondroma ar arising from the long bone with a cortical and medullary continuity with the underlying bone with the end direct of the osteochondroma directed away from the articular surface. And of course, there will also be a cartilage cap that you can clearly see it is indenting the surrounding muscles and also displaying them. And because of that, it may also cause some pressure symptoms on the surrounding nerves as well, depending upon that, whether it is in, uh, in uh, articulation with the nerves. So uh, that that is about uh, the that is about the that particular case. So let me take you to another case. So yeah, sorry, yeah. So that's the articular cartilage, and uh, um, that's the that that you can see that basically uh, the articular cartilage thickness is especially important. And if the cap is less than five millimeters, not to worry. Between five to ten millimeters is really uh, worrisome and more than 10 to 15, 20 millimeters. It is really, really bad because it's very high possibility that this patient is going to end up with a, uh, some kind of a malignant transformation. Uh, moving to another case, I think I have three minutes so I can just cover one case more. Uh, this is a 12 year old male, uh, sorry, boy who came with pain in the left heel since 13 days and he had a thorn prick injury. And now there is a swelling and let's see what we are seeing. So that's the, 
uh, apophysis. So that's not an epiphysis, but an epophysis. And uh, there is a lot of inflammation what is seen. Uh, you see a lot of reactive edema uh, in the entire calcaneum. There's a deep retrocalcaneal bursal in, uh, infection or bursitis. Uh, you can also see the tendoacrylus uh, is partially getting peeled off from its attachment to the epophysis and the calcaneum. And the entire Kegel's fat flat is significantly inflamed. This is a immature skeleton and the apophysis is already showing sign of lysis and necrosis at this point. And when you see this finding, uh, basically you're looking at classical infection because of a penetrating injury. And in this case, a thorn prick injury, which must have caused this uh, septic infection and uh, secondary retrocalcaneal bursitis. So I think with this, uh, we probably, I may just take up one last case uh, because one, uh, I think uh, probably I'm already overshooting the time. So let me stop at this uh, point and ask any questions because I have around multiple cases, but I think time is very limited. So do guide me if you have any questions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Navid Khan, junior resident in the Department of Radio Diagnosis. I welcome back all of you after the break. And now I would like to invite Dr. Kushbu Pilania to speak on the topic MRI wrist. She's a consultant radiologist at Picture This. We welcome you, ma'am, and request you to start the session. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, a very good afternoon. And uh, thank you, uh, Navid, for the kind introduction. Uh, so this post lunch session uh, will be uh, on a few topics amongst which will be the MRI of the wrist. I'll be taking next 30 minutes. What we will be uh, discussing over the next 30 minutes is uh, we'll start with the easier part of the wrist. That is the bony pathologies, um, the scaphoid fractures, the lunar, lunate avascular necrosis and few other named pathologies around the wrist joint followed by a little more complex part of the wrist, that is the TFC-TFCC complex. I'll be touching on the scaphoid and the lunato triquitral ligaments and wind up showing up a few prototypical cases with respect to the muscle tendon tears and the nerve pathologies. So uh, we know that the entire essence of doing an MRI of the wrist is to find out the cause of pain in the wrist joint. As I've enumerated, the cause of the pain in the wrist will be due to either of these uh, enumerated uh, list of pathologies. So either the bone is involved, the ligaments, the muscles, tendons, or the nerves. So we should be looking at each one of them one by one. Or yes, of course, if we have a leading information from the referring physician, we should be targeting our approach towards it. This is one of the most common conditions for which... Uh, not so much an MRI of the wrist is done, but yes, very often radiographs are done. So it is very clear from these um, uh, radiographs that we have, this is the scaphoid. This, this is a fracture of the scaphoid, again, a fracture of the scaphoid and again, a fracture of the scaphoid. So now why am I showing these three images? Because we know that with respect to the fractures of the scaphoid, it is not enough to mention that, yes, there is a fracture of the scaphoid. We need to say whether it's a fracture of the proximal pole through the waist or through the distal pole. So this is a fracture of the distal pole. This is a fracture of the waist, and this is a fracture of the proximal pole. Why is it important? The importance is because the union rates of the fracture within the same bone varies significantly. So um, if it's a fracture of the proximal pole of the wrist joint, uh, the rate of union is only 25% versus if it's a fracture of the distal pole of the scaphoid, it almost always unites. And at the same time, the healing time is also different. So it's not sufficient if we just say that it's a fracture of the scaphoid. It is very, very, very important from the management perspective to mention whether it's a proximal mid pole or a distal pole scaphoid fracture. Well, once we have said that it's a fracture of the scaphoid and yes, that's quite all that is expected in an acute trauma. But what if the patient, a known patient of a scaphoid fracture 
comes to us again after four months or one year and we say that the symptom is persisting. The referring physician has two things in his mind. So if it's been four months, he'll think of delayed union. If it's been more than a year, he'll think of non-union. So these things are more often known on the radiographs. Then why will they send the patient to us? The important question that they have always is whether or not there is an avascular necrosis of the proximal pole. Because the further management in large ways depends upon whether or not there is an avascular necrosis. So even if it's a delayed union without avascular necrosis, they might still want to conserve it or preserve it. Or even if they do some kind of surgery, they might not have to replace the proximal pole. Vis-a-vis if an avascular necrosis has set in, they might have to plan different surgery, different pattern of surgery wherein bone graft, etc., is needed. So it's very important to be able to answer this. <laughs> As we know, the concern is because the blood supply of the scaphoid is from distal to proximal. The moment, So this is the last part which receives its blood supply. If there has been a fracture which has been long-standing, this sub supply may be completely cut off and this part of the bone may undergo avascular necrosis. So this is a very characteristic radiograph. We see that the proximal pole is small, fragmented, sclerosed. It's a very characteristic of an avascular necrosis. The features that make us think of an avascular necrosis is sclerosis, fragmentation, and decreased size. Similarly, we have a radiograph, uh, we have an X, uh, sorry, CT scan, which again shows diffuse sclerosis of the proximal pole. Again, another sign of avascular necrosis. The corollary on the MRI is a diffusely T1 hypo-intense proximal pole, which appears small, fragmented. So these are very characteristic avascular necrosis. The findings that you should be looking for to call avascular necrosis is sclerosis, which, are, which will be a dark T1 signal and a, a very uh, bright bone on the uh, CT scan if we are looking at it. And um, fragmentation and decrease in the size of the proximal pole. So these are very characteristic signs. However, not always do you see such a thing. So for example, this is again a patient with a scaphoid non-union, six months post scaphoid fracture. We see the persisting fracture line. This is the proximal pole, again the proximal pole. So what we see is that the proximal pole uh, does not appear so small. So the proximal pole is reasonably well-sized on the T1 weighted images. I see that the proximal pole is a bit um, dark looking and these are the uh, post contrast uh, images where we see that even the proximal as well as the distal pole is enhancing. So this image is not so much of a help to us to say whether or not there has been an avascular necrosis. So how do we define this. A very important way to be able to comment on the scaphoid avascular necrosis is to do the dynamic contrast study. So I will not go into details, but what I want to put into your head right now is that whenever a patient comes to you for scaphoid avascular necrosis assessment and you're not so sure on the conventional scans, go for a dynamic contrast study. Such a kind of mean curve analysis can be done. So when we do the mean curve analysis on the proximal and the distal pole, we see that both of them are enhancing similarly. And so despite the fact that on my T1 weighted images, I was seeing some dark signal here. We know that the avascular necrosis has not set in. So dynamic contrast study is nothing but it's just acquiring the images while we are still undergoing. Uh, so it's just acquiring the images while we are still undergoing. Uh, the contrast is still being pushed into the body. And so the pattern of uptake of contrast into the bones are picked up and we see that the pattern in which the proximal pole is picking up the contrast is very similar to the pattern in which the distal pole is picking up and so we know that there is no difference in the vascularity and hence the vascularity is preserved. So next we come to lunate avascular necrosis. The second bone in the wrist that undergoes avascular necrosis very often is the lunate bone which is also known as the Keenbox disease. So Keenbox disease is an avascular necrosis of the lunate. The features of avascular necrosis of the lunate are again very similar. So we have a bone which is sclerosed, small sized, fragmented is and are the signs which suggest an avascular necrosis. 
the keen, uh, the avascular necrosis of the lunate is staged something very similar to the way we stage avascular necrosis in the hip. So we have normal radiographs, but we have an MRI which shows this diffusely sclerosed uh, bone. This means it's a stage one avascular necrosis. Stage two avascular necrosis is when the X-rays also start showing the altered signal, but there is no collapse of the lunate yet. Stage three is when the lunate has collapsed. And stage four is when you have secondary degenerative changes. So this is the stage one where you have a normal radiograph and you have an abnormal MRI, diffusely sclerosed T2 dark lunate bone. The radiograph shows some sclerosis. At the same time, the MRIs are also abnormal, but there is no significant collapse or fragmentation of the lunate. So this is stage two. Stage three is when we see this frank collapse and fragmentation of the lunate and we also see this coronal fractures. This is another important thing that we need to be knowing that this pattern of coronal fracture is very characteristic of an avascular necrosis and unless there is an obvious high impact trauma and we know that there wasn't anything to begin with in the wrist, this should not be called as a fracture and an associated fragmentation. So the history is very, very important. <laughs> If we see some such fracture lines in a patient where there has been no recent trauma, we should not be calling it a fracture. This is an avascular necrosis and a characteristic coronal fracture pattern which happens with avascular necrosis of the lunate. The stage four where we see that these sclerosis of the subarticular margins and tiny osteophytes have set in. So osteoarthritic changes have set in in the stage four. Apart from the lunate and the scaphoid avascular necrosis, the other bony abnormalities around the wrist, one of the important ones are the ulnar impaction and the ulnar impingement. It is important to be able to distinguish between these two terms, which sound very similar. So ulnar impaction is essentially an ulnocarpal abutment. So when the ulna starts abutting the carpal bones, it is called ulno ulnar impaction, in, sorry, impaction. It is basically a degenerative change which happens in a patient with positive ulnar variance. So in such cases, when there's a positive ulnar variance, the ulnar protrudes beyond the radius. It starts impacting upon the carpal bones as a result of which this chronic impaction, the TFC complex starts wearing off and starts degenerating. And because of the wear off and the degeneration of the TFC complex, there is further contact between the ulna and the lunit and degenerative changes start setting in between the at the ulnocarpal joint. This is often mistaken with Keenbox disease because the lunate, uh, sorry, uh, the lunate bone is one of the most common carpal bones which is affected in ulnocarpal Im impaction and the lunate bone starts showing cystic changes. But what helps us in differentiating is that the cystic changes in cases of the ulnar impaction happen towards the ulnar aspect. So again, we see in this case, if we look at it, primer faces, we all we can see that there is diffuse altered signal of the lunate bone. We might be tempted to call it again an avascular necrosis of the lunate. But what we should be knowing is that in this case, what should uh, what should uh, be of concern before calling it as an avascular necrosis is that I'm seeing cystic changes which are involving the ulnar aspect of the uh, lunate bone. Whereas in cases of Keenbox disease, it starts from the radial aspect. The radial aspect is paired. Now, when I look at it more closely, I see there is nothing buttressing the lunate and the ulna. Ideally, a uh, the TFC disc should have been in the space between the two bones. So the TFC disc is no longer there. There's a large perforation of the TFC disc. There's a positive ulnar variance. The ulna is impacting against the carpal because of this repetitive impaction and this large defect in the TFC disc. Uh, there, the impact, this has become a vicious circle and this is a characteristic ulnar impaction syndrome. When we look at the radiographs, this positive ulnar variance is so well seen. Again, we will see sclerosis in the lunate bone in this case. But what we need to keep in our minds is that the sclerosis is so much on the ulnar aspect and not on the radial aspect. This, this question we should be asking ourselves. And then if we look at it closely, we know that this is altogether a different pathology happening here. And it's an ulnar impaction syndrome. So the ulnar impingement is has a mechanism exactly opposite to ulnar uh, impaction. In this case, it starts with a 
negative alna variance so the alna is shortened and the alna impinges upon the adjoining radius below the sigmoid proximal to the sigmoid notch it is often asymptomatic in which case we just call it a distal radio ulnar convergence and leave it there when it is symptomatic it is called ulnar impingement and the symptom is essentially on pronation and supination at the level of the wrist joint and in a symptomatic ulnar impingement there are usually cortical changes happening at the level of the radius so when we look at this we have a negative ulnar variance the ulna is impinging upon the radius and if we look at our axial sections we can see these cortical changes very well as against another case where again we have a shortened ulna impinging upon the radius but in this case there is no cortical change and it is and the patient was not symptomatic for this so this was a normal variant distal radio ulnar joint convergence this was about the major bony pathologies about the wrist joint uh, the one of one of the most talked about and the uh, most complex things around the wrist joint is the uh, tfc tfcc complex so now next we move on to the tfc tfcc complex the tfcc complex is made up of these five elements so we have an articular disc in the center along the dorsal and the volar aspect of the articular disc we have the dorsal and the volar radio ulnar ligaments which are nothing but thickening of the articular disc along the volar and the dorsal aspects further dorsally we have the ulno meniscal homolog the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon moves along the ulnar aspect in the styloid notch and we have few ulno carpal ligaments joining the ulna to the carpal bone which also form a part of the tfcc complex so this is a very beautiful diagram shared by dr resnik in which case we can see understand the entire anatomy of this complex so well this yellow structure this uh, trampoline yellow structure is the tfc disc the thickening of this disc along the volar and the dorsal margin the green structure is the volar radio ulnar and the dorsal radio ulnar ligament further dorsal to the dorsal radio ulnar ligament this orange structure is the ulno meniscal homolog which moves from the dorsal aspect and laterally anteriorly we have the ulno carpal ligaments and further laterally we have this extensor carpi ulnaris tendon and the tendon sheath and the coronal anatomic section shows this tfc disc well the tfc disc has a proximal lamina which attaches to the fovea of the ulna and a distal lamina which attaches to the styloid process so let's see how this looks on the mri when i look at this mid coronal section this dark black structure this is the tfc disc the tfc disc has a radial attachment which attaches on the radial cartilage so this white rim between the disc and the radial bone is the normal radial cartilage it should not be mistaken for a tear it has a proximal lamina attaching on the ulnar fovea and the distal lamina attaching on the ulnar styloid process this meniscoid structure here is the ulno meniscal homolog so now as we start moving further uh, volarly we see the tfc disc which continues to attach to the radial cartilage the moment this cartilage is lost is where the volar and the dorsal radio ulnar ligament starts taking up so this cart now this cartilage has uh, uh, the cartilage is no longer interposed between the um, disc and the bone and this is where we have the volar radio ulnar ligament this thickened part of the tfc disc is the volar radio ulnar ligament and dorsally similarly thickened structure is the dorsal radio ulnar ligament so this is the dorsal radio ulnar ligament on the dorsal most section how this looks on a sagittal section so this is again the tfc disc the volar thickening is the volar radio ulnar ligament the thickening on the dorsal aspect is the dorsal radio ulnar ligament furthermore dorsally the structure is the ulno meniscal homolog this is how the tfc tfc disc anatomy is next is to classify the tears at the tfc tfcc complex so there are multiple classifications the most commonly talked about is the palmer classification which has two classes the traumatic and the degenerative these are further sub subdivided into multiple subcategories it is not always important to be able to be knowing which to be describing a sorry describing a tfc tear with respect to which category it belongs to what is important for us as radiologist is 
to be able to define it in totality so that whoever the referring physician is, whatever classification he wants to put into it, he can put into it. Or yes, if you have a particular subset of referring physicians sending patients to you, then of course you can uh, always uh, wait, uh, you can always use the classification they want you to. So what we need to tell them is number one, that there is a tier, whether the tier involves the ulnar aspect or the radial aspect, what is the size of the tier and how is the rest of the TFC, TFCC involved, whether there is any associated osseous abnormality. So I look at this, I see a focal perforation. Why this is a perforation and not the normal cartilage? Because I'm seeing this cartilage here. So this should not be mistaken for a tear, but I see an obvious discontinuity. So it's a focal perforation of the TFC disc proper near its radial attachment. Again, I look at this. I see that the complete TFC disc near its ulnar attachment shows some altered signal. It is kind of macerated. So it's a degenerative tear of the TFC disc from near its ulnar attachment. When I look at the sagittal image, I see that the dorsal as well as the volar radio ulnar ligaments are also significantly thickened and edematous. Again, in this case, I see the TFC disc proper. It is attaching very well and flush onto the radius, but along the ulnar attachment, I see a lot of discontinuity. There is a small fractured bony fragment. So what I see is that the distal lamina, there is an avulsion fracture of the distal lamina with a fractured styloid process. When I further scroll, I also see that the proximal lamina is also partly torn from its attachment. So this is what and how I need to describe the TFC tear. And then I need to say about what is happening to the other components of the TFC. Again, a TFCC degenerative tear where I see a complete opposition between the ulna and the lunate. The TFC disc, which should have been in between, is completely lost. So there's a large perforation of the TFC disc proper. The extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. So this is the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. We see longitudinal split tear of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon with a lot of surrounding edema. So this is an extensor carpi ulnaris tear. Similarly, the tenosynovitis is when we have altered signal of the tendon. So the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon, which appears thickened and shows altered signal. And there is extensive edema of the surrounding tendon sheets. So it's a extensor carpi ulnaris tenosynovitis with tendinopathy. Exten injuries exclusively to the extensor carpi ulnaris subsheath also happen and are also often associated with TFC injuries. So how do we pick these up? So this is the normal extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. This is the normal extensor carpi ulnaris subsheath. Whenever, if we see that the tendon is subluxing from its normal position within the ulnar styloid fossa, this is when we should be suspecting a subsheath injury. So whenever a subsheath injury happens, the tendon subluxes from its normal location. This was all about the extensor carpi ulnaris, uh, sorry, the TFC and the TFCC complex injuries. The other two important ligaments with respect to the wrist joint are the scaphulunate and the lunator triquitral. The scaphulunate ligament is composed of the volar intermediate and the dorsal component. So there are three components. Now, when I move from volar, this is the volar scaphulunate ligament. I move beyond. This is the intermediate scaphoid ligament, scaphoid lunate, intermediate scaphoid lunate ligament. And this is the dorsal scaphoid lunate ligament. So it is not uncommon to find isolated tears to one of the components of the scaphoid lunate ligament, in which case the scaphoid lunate distance might still be maintained. Then it's not, and clinically the patient has, uh, the clinically the patient has symptoms of um, uh, scaphoid lunate tears. So, this is what we need to know that there are three components. So in case two components are intact, there will not be obvious widening seen on the radiographs. So this is where we have a scaphoid unit tear. So when I scroll from volar to dorsal, I see that the volar scaphoid unit is torn. Then I move to the mid portion. The intermediate scaphoid unit also shows increased signal, but appears reasonably intact. And then we have the dorsal scaphoid unit ligament, which is also showing evidence of injury, but on these axial images, I see some intact fibers still. There is widening of the gap because of course, all the three components of the scaphoid unit ligament are involved. Another uh, uh, following, another 
complication which happens due to an unnoticed or an unattended scapul unit uh, ligament injury is the scapul unit advanced collapse in which case there are osteoarthritic changes which happen at the scaphoid radio scaphoid joint and the scaphoid unit joint as well so in this case we see that this was a neglected scaphoid unit injury we see the obvious widening which is a telltale sign for injury to the scaphoid unit ligament and over time the cartilage at the radio scaphoid joint is uh has denuded this is completely lost there are osteophytes loose bodies so this is a typical scapul unit advanced collapse or a slack similar entity called snack scaphoid non union advanced collapse happens when there is a non union of the scaphoid which has remained there and it leads to instability leading to secondary osteoarthritic changes at these radio scaphoid joint so it's just that both of these are radio scaphoid osteoarthritis but one is secondary to a scaphoid unit unattended injury another is due to a scaphoid non union lunate or triquetral is the another important ligament which is between the lunate and the triquetral bone this is the normal lunate or triquetral it also has a volar dorsal and an intermediate component and injuries to the same appear as thickened irregular appearing ligament so we are seeing this thickened and irregular appearing ligament but it's still intact so it's a high grade sprain and not a tear yet these were the important ligaments the important osseous pathologies about the wrist apart from that the these the other pain generators around the wrist are the various tendons it's not always easy to remember all these tendons about the wrist we can keep this image handy for us every time we are reporting a wrist joint and if we keep this image handy for us we know these are the various compartments and these are how the various tendons about the wrist joint are scattered few tendons which you need to remember and it's always good is the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon the ulnar styloid notch and the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus tendon in the d which cause the decurvens tenosynovitis apart from that if we don't remember the order of these tendons it's quite fair we can always go back to these images to remember what's happening so decurvens tenosynovitis is again a very um, uh, frequently encountered uh, pathology and that is why i said that we need to know where these tendons are it is basically a repetitive inflammation of the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus tendons it often happens due to some repetitive movements about the wrist joint and there is tendinopathy and there can be edema of the subjacent bone and specific signs pertaining to this syndrome apart from that the nerves at the wrist joint may be involved the most importantly involved nerve is the median nerve which is involved in carpal tunnel syndrome what is carpal tunnel syndrome carpal tunnel syndrome is when the carpal tunnel there is pressure effect within the carpal tunnel so carpal tunnel is the structure which is bound by the flexor retinaculum contains the flexor tendons and the median nerve along the volar aspect of the wrist joint any pressure symptom within this tunnel will lead to compression of the median nerve and the patient will have symptoms of median nerve compression so in this case these are the flexor tendons within the wrist joint if we go back and look at the normal appearance of the flexor tendons this is how the normal appear, normal flexor tendons appear at the wrist joint though that was not the exact level of the carpal tunnel but again we look at this this is how the normal tendons look and in this case there is a lot of edema surrounding the tendon so there is flexor tenosynovitis and this median nerve is swollen so the swelling of the median nerve has happened secondary to compression effect due to extensive flexor tenosynovitis and this leads to a characteristic typical median nerve syndromes symptoms in the patient this is a very typical example of a median nerve lipofibroma so this is a median nerve which has enlarged and it has a coaxial cable appearance it is uh, severely thickened similarly it is showing this coaxial a cable appearance on the coronal images and this is a median nerve lipofibroma this is a very characteristic um, this is a very characteristic appearance of uh, a median nerve lipofibroma another very very frequently encountered pathology about the wrist joint is the ganglion cyst so very often a patient comes to you with swelling at the wrist joint one thing which we need to know at this point is ganglion cysts are often encountered 
uh, incidentally at the wrist joint. So whenever a patient comes with a swelling or whenever a patient comes for a wrist joint imaging, it is very important to get a marker placed at the site of the pain because there may be a lot of ganglionsist about the wrist joint. We just don't need to be men, uh, you know, uh, reporting on and on about all the ganglionsis, which might not be causing any symptom to the patient. So put a marker. If there is a ganglionsis immediately subjacent to the marker, that is the cause of the pain in the patient. So the first thing that we need to know is how they appear. These are very bright, T2 bright structures. They appear like typical cystic structures. So we have these typical cystic structures about the wrist joint. So it's a very typical ganglion cyst. The second more important thing is that we need to mention whether or not it is communicating with the adjacent joint because the treatment of the ganglion cyst is marsupialization or rupture of the cyst. If, however, it is communicating with a adjacent joint, it will keep recurring. So then we need to be closing it accordingly. One important thing is whether or not it's communicating with the adjacent joint. And another important thing is to look for the adjoining ligaments and the tendons. Because very often these ganglion cysts happen secondary to a ligamentous or a tendinous injury. Again, in which case simply aspirating or marsupializing a ganglion cyst will be of no help. They will keep recurring till the underlying pathology has been dealt with. So whenever you encounter a ganglion cyst, simply mentioning it is not important. We also need to say whether there is a joint communication, whether it's due to some injury. And at the same time, mentioning all ganglion cysts about the wrist joint is not important. So for example, in this case, there is yet another ganglion cyst. Well, this is not important because the patient had symptoms on this side. And this may not be treated as long as the patient is not symptomatic for this. So this is what, uh, in summary, we've covered up uh, with respect to the uh, TFC, TFCC cartilage, the anatomy. We've talked about how to describe a TFC, TFCC tear. That is one thing. We talked about assessment of avascular necrosis in a scaphoid, how to stage avascular necrosis of a lunate bone. What is the difference between ulnar impaction and ulnar impingement? And we've talked about the tendons about the wrist joint and a brief on the median nerve as well. So I think I'm done with the rest. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was a very informative session and we request you to address the questions asked in the question and answer section. All right, I'll just do that. I don't see anything as of now. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Thanks a lot, ma'am. We would now have our next session on focal light eclisions on X-ray by Dr. Ankita Ahuja. We welcome you, ma'am, and request you to start the session. Uh, thank you so much. At the beginning only, I would like to congratulate the entire team and Preeti, ma'am, for such an amazing session to be held and so much well coordinated. It was amazing to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Uh, so, we'll be discussing about focal bone lesions primarily on the radiographs. So, uh, what are the modalities just before going on to the radiographs? So, we have radiographs, CT, MRI, PET CT. But for your all information, radiographs are the key, is the key modality to evaluate the lesions. Without radiographs, you cannot go ahead and evaluate any bone lesion. So, if you are evaluating any other modality as well, you should always try and get hold of the radiographs because they are very important. So now just to get all of you awake, if you can use the chat box and tell me what is this lesion? Because I think it's post lunch and most of you would be like almost sleepy. So this is a time to take a call and tell what this lesion is. I'll give you around 30 seconds. Yeah, few people have started replying. Good, I've got a uh, few replies, but in the opposite spectrum. So guys keep on thinking and replying in the chat box because at the end of the discussion, I'll tell you what the lesion is and what trick I played with, this uh, with putting this question forth. Uh, so, 
i'll wait all of you to reply i've got few replies and that i think uh, i would let you uh, if you want to ask me some question before answering this uh, x ray it would be even great i'm ready to answer your question if you raise anything in the chat box so let's see let's discuss this at the end of the session so what we are trying to do in today's session is first motto is to identify a bone lesion then the second step and the most important step is to decide whether it is an aggressive lesion or a non aggressive lesion and then finally to come to a certain diagnosis or maybe a differential diagnosis so these are the steps which i always follow when i look at a radiograph and this simplifies the things really well so first step is to identify then the second step should be to look at the age of the patient it is very very important and you will realize because i'll keep on repeating that point then you need to know the location followed by deciding whether the lesion is aggressive or non aggressive then further characterizing it and then finally reaching a diagnosis so on this radiograph i can definitely pick up a lesion so the lesion has been identified then i go on to the second step which i mentioned is the most important step is the age if somebody tells you that the age of the patient is more than 35 years you should definitely think of met myeloma lymphoma remember this thing as a rule uh whenever you are looking at any radiograph more than 35 years met myeloma lymphoma should click your mind then so in this radiograph i can see this patient the physis is not fused so it's kind of a skeletally immature patient so i'm dealing with somebody young and location wise it's metaphyseal and diaphyseal so my second step was age followed by location so i have fulfilled the next two steps in this case uh but to uh, tell you about the location for location you not only need to tell the location in longitudinal plane that is epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis but you also need to uh, see the location in the transverse plane as well that is whether it's cortical juxta cortical or medullary both the locations make an impact why is age and location important is this chart so each and every one of you should keep this chart in your mind whenever you are looking at any bone radiograph so we have a different set of differentials according to location and age in like 30 less than 30 years and a different set of differentials in patients more than 30 years old so we'll keep on using this chart on and off so now we have decided we have figured out the age we have figured out the location then what else we need to see in an x ray we need to know about the opacity and mineralization zone of transition periosteal reaction soft tissue component if any and size and number of lesions so what we discussed would be the third step after age and location would be to decide the aggressive versus non aggressive so whether is somebody is like really aggressive or maybe a calmer person so we need to decide based on the lesion so why are we deciding that because that helps us to lower down our differentials to a certain specific things so this is a chart depicting your non aggressive lesions so osteoid lesions would be osteoblastoma osteoid osteoma and osteoma cartilaginous lesions would be enchondroma chondroblastoma chondromyxoid fibroma osteochondroma cystic lesions are uh, simple bone cyst aneurysmal bone cyst fibrous lesions are fibrous cortical defect fibrous dysplasia and miscellaneous lesions are giant cell tumor and lipoma so these are not really many maybe more not only 10 lesions which we can easily remember and the aggressive list is even smaller so osteoid is osteosarcoma miscellaneous is ewing sarcoma fibrous is fibrosarcoma or malignant fibrous histiocytoma cartilaginous is chondrosarcoma and in kids also remember neuroblastoma mets and leukemia so you will realize why i have highlighted these names and why we need to remember so how on a radiograph will you decide whether something is aggressive or not so these are the two most important factors to analyze whether something is aggressive or not these are zone of transition and periosteal reaction and they are very very important for us to analyze on each and every radiograph what do you mean by zone of transition zone of transition is nothing but the zone between your uh, affected bone that is your lesion and the normal bone so if it is narrow 
that means you can clearly make out where the lesion is ending and the normal bone is there and the other word, word which we use is white when you cannot make out where the normal uh, bone is starting and where the lesion is ending so if something is narrow that is you can clearly make out that the lesion is ending and the normal bone is here that suggests that this is a non aggressive lesion but if you can't make out a distinction between a uh, normal bone and the affected bone then that's called as a wide zone of transition and suggests an aggressive lesion this is the most important step so just to simplify it so when in this case the purple thing reflects your bone and red is your lesion so you can clearly make out where the lesion is ending and where the bone is starting it may be associated with a sclerotic border which is represented by this white so these two are the patterns which reflect a non aggressive uh, pattern and the other things would be these in which there is irregular margins and you cannot really make out where the lesion is ending and where the normal bone is starting or it may be associated with some cortical destruction or it may be associated with some moth eaten appearance so these all three patterns would suggest aggressive now let's see how will we be able to make that out on radiograph so here we can see a clearly distinction between the normal bone and the abnormal bone normal bone and the abnormal bone all around the lesion so you need to make out the margin of distinction all around the lesion so this is your non aggressive pattern another form of non aggressive or a narrow zone of transition pattern is when you can make out the lesion all around as well as it is associated with a sclerotic margin so these kind of lesions suggest that they are non aggressive and you need to pick something from your non aggressive list but if the lesion is something like this where you cannot make out where the lesion is ending and you even have a little moth eaten appearance so this lysis is just going down into the normal bone and you really can't draw a line and say oh this is the demarcation of my lesion so this is kind of a really moth eaten appearance with some cortical destruction in this region and no zone a wide zone of transition in this region so whenever you see this kind of a wide zone of transition you are looking at something which is aggressive similarly this is a case in which you see that there are lytic areas within the medullary region but you can't really make out a line and draw where the lytic areas are ending uh so this is your white zone of transition moth eaten pattern and it suggests that you are dealing with something which is really aggressive so this is a very important step for you to decide something as aggressive or non aggressive but uh, there are obviously variations to the rule everywhere so first thing is if you see a narrow zone of transition but the patient is more than 35 years old like we read in the beginning rule rule number 1 related to age if the patient is more than 35 years old you need to definitely think of metz myeloma lymphoma whether it is narrow zone whether it is wide zone you need to think of these conditions so zone of transition holds second importance when somebody is more than 35 years old even with narrow zone the differential of metz myeloma stand true right and the second thing is if you see wide zone of transition that means you are dealing with something aggressive but then sim or in the similar picture tumor mimics like infection and eosinophilic granuloma also come into play this we'll see as we see the cases gct we usually on radiology see them as a non aggressive lesion but by their pathology characteristics they are usually locally aggressive so we have dealt with zone of transition now we move on to the second most important step that is the periosteal reaction so this is another very important step because this step is very important to decide something between aggressive and non aggressive so if you see solid unilamellated periosteal reaction you are dealing it is a non aggressive pattern and if you see multilamellated or onion skin interrupted spiculated cordman strangle then you are dealing with something which is aggressive let's see examples so this is a pattern so red thing is your periosteal reaction so you see a thick solid periosteal reaction <coughs> excuse me so in as we see on this radiograph so this underlying thing is the cortex and there is a thick solid periosteal reaction similarly if you see on red uh, lateral so this is the underlying cortex which is here and there is a thick solid periosteal reaction overlying 
this suggests that you are dealing with something which is not that aggressive which is not aggressive right but if you in that place if you see this kind of a periosteal reaction which is multilamellated so what why the periosteal reaction comes at multilamellated is that the bone tumor is growing at a certain pace which causes the periosteal reaction to come up but then suddenly the tumor starts growing at a faster pace so it makes further periosteal reaction to come up and similarly it keeps on happening and you see multilamellated periosteal reaction so in this case if you try and trace so you can see at least three lamellae of periosteal reactions on either side so this is nothing but your multilamellated or onion skin uh, skin peel type of a periosteal reaction if the tumor suddenly starts growing very aggressively it will erode all the periosteal reactions which have come up and we call it interrupted multilamellated periosteal reaction uh, this is another example in which this is single interrupted periosteal reaction this is another pattern of aggressive because tumor initially was growing slow lifted up the periosteum but suddenly the rate of growth increased and it destroyed the periosteum so we are left with only single unilamellated periosteal uh, single interrupted periosteal reaction so this is nothing this is just similar to your codman's triangle like in this case you can see the periosteum is lifted up till here but then the soft tissue is so much that you cannot uh, see any further periosteal reaction so you can just see single interrupted periosteal reaction and lastly you can have hair on end which is kind of a perpendicular to the bone kind of a periosteal pattern which also suggests that it's aggressive so except single solid unilamellated periosteal reaction all the other patterns suggest that you are dealing with something aggressive uh, so usually with lesions like fibrous dysplasia and chondroma non ossifying fibroma and simple bone cyst uh, usually these lesions do not have any periosteal reaction until unless they undergo a fracture uh now we have dealt that we can decide based on the periosteal reaction and zone of transition whether something is aggressive or not in addition what else helps us if we see some soft tissue component or cortical destruction so if you see some soft tissue component or a cortical destruction it is an indication then again you are dealing with something aggressive so till now we have reached a third step that we can decide whether something is aggressive or not now we are left with one so uh, in this of our case we know now we can see single interrupted white zone of transition so we know and a soft tissue also so we know we are dealing with something which is aggressive now we have to move on to the next step which is left is opacity in mineralization <clears throat> excuse me so in opacity it can be either lytic lesion or a lucent lesion like this or it can be sclerotic dense lesion or it can be a mixed thing where you can see lytic as well as sclerotic areas then the next thing is matrix which can be either osteoid chondroid or fibrous there are a lot of words which are being used to describe them but let's see a few examples so if it is dense cloudy then it is an osteoid matrix if it is rings and arcs it suggests that you are dealing with something which is chondroid and just keep this chondroid picture in your mind because this is the most classic i have seen you may uh, not so in this you can really well appreciate the rings and arcs and if you see something ground glass like this then you are dealing with something which is a fibrous matrix in a lucent uh, opacity lesion you may not see any matrix and that's perfectly fine right so overall if you have decided aggressive and non aggressive and in the next step you have even decided the matrix then you are left with hardly 3 to 4 lesions which you need to give as a differential or pull something out from them as the final diagnosis similarly if you have decided aggressive and a particular matrix then you are left with hardly one or two lesions in each category to put in into the box so this helps us to decide zone of transition and periosteal reactions helps us to decide whether it's aggressive or not if you see soft tissue components or cortical destructions you know you are dealing with something aggressive and finally the two important factors that is age and location with opacity and mineralization helps you lower down your differential diagnosis or reach even a diagnosis 
so in this case which we were looking at we can see some aggressive lesion which we decided and we see it's quite dense so we know we are dealing with osteoid matrix and we don't have much options in this area which is aggressive and uh, which fits into the chart is just an osteosarcoma so we have reached a diagnosis then last of all multiplicity so sometimes you may see multiple lesions uh, in younger age group you are dealing with usually oleus marfusis fd and you should also keep in your mind uh, hyperparathyroidism because multiple brown tumors are quite common especially when you get hand radiographs in elderly patients you should think of metz myeloma and lymphoma again and vascular lesions are also common to have multiplicity this is just an example to show you this ground glass matrix in this bone again a small lesion with ground glass matrix here and another one here so this is a case of multiple fibrous dysplasia so we have followed this step and now we need to figure out our di diagnosis and differential diagnosis so this case the trick was that i didn't tell you the age and maybe on radiographs if it's not classically that the physis is not fused you will not know that this is a skeletally immature patient so most of you when i was reading the answer the answer was metz but in 18 year old do you think you will think of metz as your first diagnosis if the same radiograph i have put 55 years and you would have said metz i would have agreed with you so always ask for the age so if somebody didn't doesn't tell you the age then you need to ask them the age i need to know the age before giving something so an 18 year old it's a metaphyseal lesion it looks a uh, zone of transition wise it looks a little narrow but there is cortical destruction and associated soft tissue component and a single interrupted periosteal reaction so rest all features point to aggressive so overall this is an aggressive lesion but i still can't make out an obvious matrix so i am dealing with something in this zone which is aggressive i can only see osteosarcoma but if i don't have any matrix i should also think of ewing sarcoma so as per the location and the matrix i am stuck with aggressive lesions from these two uh this turned out to be a telangiectatic osteosarcoma and in some of those cases you may not be able to appreciate the matrix so if you go your step wise you are going to land up in the right place uh in most of the cases i would say 90 to 95% of the cases now let's quickly have a look at few of the lesions in next 5 to 10 minutes so always i've showed you the steps over here but whenever you are seeing a radiograph don't read the steps over here and go through in your head so 10 year old so young patient diaphyseal lesion narrow zone of transition although there is an associated fracture but no periosteal reaction no matrix is seen so i am left with no matrix uh, non aggressive lesions as these and in diaphysis maybe i am left with hardly few which is only sbc so it becomes a unicameral or a simple bone cyst then again a metaphyseal narrow zone of transition so narrow zone of transition no periosteal reaction no matrix uh, so i am left into this chart in the metaphysis <laughs> and no matrix suggests me only either an abc then uh, next lesion again a well defined expansile lesion reaching up to the articular surface of the radius proximal articular surface of the radius uh, no really uh, i would say narrow zone of transition no periosteal reaction making it no uh, non aggressive no obvious matrix is seen so such a lesion which is usually in a third year old person so it's a little borderline so the rule is you can even think of an abc and a gct in this case it's completely understandable and mri will help us find out which one is it but usually it is said that with a few skeleton the most common one is the gct and abc is a little more common less than 25 years of age but i have myself seen a lot of overlap so giving a differential is no harm so you can even raise that differential over here whenever it is reaching up to the articular surface it just suggests a little more of a gct so this is a giant cell tumor this is an a uh, little uncommon case but you can at least make out that this is a narrow zone of transition no periosteal reaction so a non aggressive lesion for sure 
but in such a case mri really adds on because you can see fat within the lesion which got suppressed on your fat sat images so this was nothing but an intraosseous lipoma with cystic degeneration but at least on x ray you were sure that we are dealing with something non aggressive and the patients and the relatives are also a little comforted by knowing that yeah we are not dealing with something really bad then another case so you see a 55 year old patient lesion is diaphyseal there is um, kind of i can make out the zone here but i can make out here so any place i cannot make out the zone well so it becomes white zone of transition so overall white zone of transition no obvious periosteal reaction but there is cortical destruction so it puts it into aggressive category no obvious matrix but uh, anything so once there is no obvious matrix so maybe if i had a lot of chondroid matrix in there then i could have think of chondrosarcoma is it or something like that but if there is no matrix <laughs> then we need to first go back to our rule elderly patient we should think of mets myeloma and lymphoma and give them all in our differentials this turned out to be a metastasis then this is another classic case if you see thick uh, cortical thickening you can uh, not appreciate that well on the lateral though but there is significant cortical thickening in a child significant cortical thickening should strike your mind and you should think of two things first one because we are dealing with tumor so obviously osteoid osteoma and the second one is stress injury so your history will add on in osteoid osteoma patient usually presents with night pain and pain is relieved by analgesic so you should check that history and in stress injury you will definitely come to know some history of extreme stress which the, like playing excessively or something happening which would lead to the stress injury and obviously ct adds on in which you can even identify the nidus along with the cortical thickening then this is a diaphyseal lesion young patient 15 year old diaphyseal uh i can't see any periosteal reaction i cannot see any obvious cortical destruction a small fracture maybe is happening over here so overall kind of a non aggressive lesion and if you see the matrix it's chondroid so anything in finger chondroid is most likely in a young patient to be an n chondroma then this is nothing to be discussed about this is a very beautifully seen osteochondroma on this it looks a little odd but if you see on the ap view you can really well appreciate the uh, bony outgrowth with the cartilaginous cap which would be much better appreciated on your mri images then uh, this is another case so there is an enchondroma over here let's not see that so there is a well defined lesion uh, so a narrow zone of transition no periosteal reaction uh, so it is it becomes non aggressive if i try and look at a matrix and you go at the periphery you can see a chondroid matrix over here you can see rings and arcs over here so a young patient in the so less than 30 years epiphyseal to metaphyseal lesion with chondroid matrix so you are not left with anything except chondroblastoma sometimes it is difficult to appreciate a uh, matrix in chondroblastomas and you may require an mr which will help you confirm with a disproportionate marrow edema then this is a no discussion case like you can see diffuse ground glass matrix all over so if you see diffuse ground glass matrix fibrous lesion young patient it was associated with fracture basically so this was fibrous dysplasia this case we were discussing in the entire session so this is nothing but your osteogenic sarcoma this is another case so if you see your uh, it is kind of a moth eaten appearance so a white zone of transition multi lamellated periosteal reaction but no obvious matrix so young patient meta uh, actually not really metaphyseal it's a diaphyseal lesion aggressive with no matrix so it we are just with no matrix and diaphyseal we are just left with evings sarcoma uh just uh, another one case so here you can really well up so it is a 
elderly patient so age is important if it would be young patient then i would have different thoughts maybe uh, but it is an elderly patient so i should think of mets myeloma lymphoma but if you look carefully you can identify some chondroid matrix in there so elderly patient aggressive lesion with chondroid matrix then i should think of what is chondrosarcoma in the metaphyses predominantly right so if this lesion wouldn't have any matrix then you would have thought of definitely mets myeloma and lymphoma just last two minutes to cover up the tumor mimics two most important ones are infection so first and foremost the most important one is infection so let's look up at this case so it's a diaphyseal lesion uh, if you look at the zone of transition it looks wide giving you a clue that you're dealing with something aggressive but if you look at periosteal reaction it's just thick solid lamellate uh, thick and solid unilamellated kinds so it is suggests that it's a non aggressive lesion so there is a little bias whether you want to put it and you can't see any obvious soft tissue so you're not sure whether to call it aggressive or non aggressive in such cases you need to be more careful and mri will definitely add on you'll see patchy t1 spar uh, marrow uh, spared areas on mri and this was an osteomyelitis case of an osteomyelitis this is another case in which you can see a well defined lytic lesion so you are thinking of benign lesions but if you look carefully there is some soft tissue over here which is very well seen on mr so there was an additional collection over here and there was a cavity with a peripheral t1 hyper intense rim so this both suggests that you are dealing with infection rather than a bone lesion so in such cases definitely mri adds on because you are able to pick up the collections and soft tissue components better uh then this was osteomyelitis which you need to think about any uh, whenever you are looking at a lesion you classify it but keep a thought whether you want to think of infection in that case or not similarly if you are looking at young patients and it doesn't fit well into anything you should think of eosinophilic granuloma the appearance can vary like in this case you can see cortical uh, tunneling which is quite classic with eosinophilic granuloma but the appearance can vary from look, a benign looking lesion to an uh, uh, extremely aggressive looking lesion with lot of soft tissue cortical erosion and everything so in younger patients a eosinophilic granuloma is a thought this is an interesting case if you see you can see an ill defined lytic sclerotic lesion in this region this entire where my cursor is but if you carefully look at it you can appreciate all the trabeculae within it so carefully look you are able to appreciate all the trabeculae which even looks a little thicker because on this side you don't see them so well so you can see them really well and thickened and coarse so elderly patient with thickened coarse trabeculae you are thinking of pages disease rather than any primary bone lesion and lastly uh, you need to also think of skeletal dysplasias so this is just a case of melerostosis uh, in which there is flowing uh, osteosclerosis which is extending down single limb usually so it travels in this case as you can see only the left half of the pelvis and left half of the lower limb was involved so sometimes skeletal dysplasia you may think of osteosarcoma but you will not see any other soft tissue component any destruction patient would not be like really symptomatic and uh, if you'll see it'll be involving just only one limb so that those are the clues so just to summarize in the last one minute so these are the most important steps always try and identify the lesion then look at the age of the patient it is very very important following it look at the location followed by whether you think lesion is aggressive or non aggressive based on your zone of transition and periosteal reaction also look at soft tissue component or cortical destruction and then further characterize the lesion to reach a reasonable diagnosis or a differential diagnosis so this is how what we followed and what we did in today's uh, session remember these rules more than 35 years think of mets myeloma lymphoma if you see some specific matrix to the lesion then you can think of some specific lesion from that chart and even if the lesion has a narrow zone of transition in more than 35 years of 
age patient you are still thinking of mets and myeloma you may forget anything but don't forget these two boxes these are the most important take home messages and always think of tumor mimics once if you are looking at any lesion especially infection in all age groups and eosinophilic granuloma in a uh, younger patient uh thank you everyone for your patience and attending the section session with all of us uh thank you preeti ma'am and the entire team once again wish you all a merry christmas and a happy new year thanks a lot ma'am mm -hmm. that was indeed a great session and we request you to address any questions asked in the question and answer section yeah sure thank you thank you ma'am we would now have a session on spine tumor imaging by dr malini lavande which would be followed by a short quiz we welcome you ma'am and request you to start the session thank you uh, good afternoon everyone it's uh, nice to see the same number of people in the post lunch session also uh, so that uh, i'm sure that means that the whole day has been very interesting and uh, you all have uh, benefited from this session today so what we are going to do now is uh, start looking at imaging of spinal neoplasms with more concentration on mri uh, my screen is visible yes ma'am it's visible yeah. okay uh, so we do have other imaging modalities but i'll be concentrating more on mri so if we look at imaging of spinal neoplasms initially we were looking at radiographs which would show us the osseous neoplasms well but if you look at the intraspinal neoplasms we could only look at the indirect evidence so here what you can see is there is significant enlargement of this neural foramen with scalloping of at margins which tells us it's a long standing lesion also causing scalloping of the vertebral body margins so putting all of this together long standing lesion widening the foramen we are postulating that this is likely due to a nerve sheath tumor after that came in the myelogram now myelogram what it does is it tells us what is the lesion causing mass effect on the thecal sac as so for example here i can see that the entire the contrast which is indicted in the thecal sac is getting compressed here i'm not seeing contrast going ahead so this tells me that this is an epidural lesion so if it was an intramedullary then it would have been the cord would have been expanded and compressing the contrast to the side so these things would indirectly tell us but we still could not see the lesion we could only say where the lesion was located within the spinal canal and now we have mri and obviously it does away with uh, these kind of confusing uh, things as to where the lesion is located we can make that out very well and we can also tell what is the internal structure of the lesion how does it look does it have hemorrhage does it have necrosis and all of these things help us to make the diagnosis so i think whenever we look at any imaging it is it holds good for everything first thing is is there a lesion second is it a neoplasm because we have non tumoral lesion cysts infections if it is a neoplasm which one so either we can give one diagnosis or we can narrow down the differential diagnosis significantly which compartment is it located which is important and what is the extent of the lesion because the surgeon when he wants to plan the treatment he wants to know where to biopsy from what is the extent of the lesion that he needs to operate on so when you look at lesions in the spinal canal we classify them as intramedullary that is within the spinal cord and extramedullary which is outside the spinal cord extra medullary can be intradural so it's within the thecal sac but outside the spinal cord or it can be extradural or epidural that means it is outside the thecal sac so effectively we have so this is a very good uh, way to try to understand this so here you can see this is an epidural lesion this is an intradural extra medullary lesion and this here is an intra medullary lesion and it's very important whether you're looking at contrast myelograms whether you're looking at mri you need to come to this diagnosis which compartment is the lesion located and that will change your list of differential diagnoses so how do i make out so if you see here 
the epidural lesion will compress the thecal sac and the cord completely displacing them one way and compressing it if you look at intradural extramedullary lesion it will widen the thecal sac you can see this here this thecal sac the blue csf in the thecal sac is compressed intradural extramedullary you will see the cord separately but the side the lesion is located the csf space will be widened now this may be in the coronal plane may be in the sagittal plane based on how the lesion is located so look carefully intramedullary is when the cord itself is expanded with the lesion within so this is how we see on mr i see a lesion here at this level and i look at it on x-ray can you all very clearly see this black line which is the thecal sac so the thecal sac and the cord both are compressed so this tells me this is an epidural lesion extradural lesion here if i see i have a lesion again but now can you see the csf widened i can see the csf space above and below it widened in the coronal plane so that tells me this is intradural extra medullary lesion if it was extradural the csf would not have been widened if i can just uh, use this yeah so this here you can see this csf space is widened so that's the thecal sac which has got widened if this had been an epidural lesion the thecal sac would have been going like this here and you would not have seen csf at this location axial as i said you can see the thecal sac maintained so you can see this round thecal sac in that this here is the cord and this here is the lesion while here you can see that the thecal sac along with the cord is compressed and this here is the lesion this is extra dural this is intra dural extra medullary and this here obviously the entire spinal cord itself is enlarged with lesion within it so this is intra medullary so that's the first step whenever we see pathology this is what we divide the lesions into so now let's begin with extra dural tumors so when you have extra dural tumors they can be either primary or they can be secondary let's look at primary lesions so this is just i'm mentioning here because they are seen all the time during the reporting of lumbar spine studies you see these well defined lesions which are bright on t1 as well as t2 if you look carefully they would have little striated kind of pattern and these are hemangiomas usually incidental do not cause anything once in a while you will see large diffuse hemangiomas which may bleed especially patients in uh, like this uh, so here if you look at this on t2 weighted image you have these lesions multiple on t1 weighted image again it has this striated appearance but now it is also showing you large epidural soft tissue component the posterior element also is involved so this can happen in aggressive hemangiomas or in diffuse hemangioma in a patient during pregnancy because of the hormonal changes the hemangioma may bleed at times and lead to cord compression and symptoms so important thing is look very carefully on the t1 weighted image you will always see some fat intensity and a striated pattern same what you would see as a corduroy appearance on an x ray if you take ct cuts through this it will be that polka dot appearance where you have the trabeculations and some of them can rarely be aggressive but always try to look for you may have atypical ones also where central portion may not be so bright try looking on t1 for even a bright periphery peripheral area that will tell you it is fat containing and usually incidental hemangioma few other lesions which are not very common but we do see them so here is an osteochondroma from the transverse process you can see a bony projection continuous with the medulla seen on t1 and it's got this bright cartilaginous cap smooth not very thick cartilaginous cap this is an osteochondroma so what happens is these on because of the location on the radiograph may not be seen very well patient has come with some kind of a swelling pain and mr would be the good way to evaluate it one interesting special condition where ct is always better than mr is osteoadosteum so what you might find is you just find this marrow edema i can see some marrow edema it is not exactly at the facet joint facet joint is more here there is some marrow edema some soft tissue edema 
I can see something going on here, but I'm not sure what it is. When you're not sure on MR what it is, go ahead and do CT. You're always going to be wiser. So posterior element osteoid osteoma can be a cause of pain, especially in um, kids and slightly old, younger adults. And CT makes the diagnosis very obvious. On MR, you will be very confused. So one simple thing which I always follow, on MR, if I'm very confused, I'm not able to make out what's happening at all, it's always a good idea to get some CT cuts. You'll always be wiser. Giant cell tumor is a primary tumor of the vertebra, usually involving the vertebral body itself. Seen in adults, can have heterogeneous lesion and it's expansive. So yes, there is compression deformity here, but at the same time, the lesion is very expansive, also involving the posterior elements and a solid looking lesion. This was a young, uh, around 40, 45 year old person. And this turned out to be giant cell tumor. Neuroblastoma, round cell tumors are common in children. These arise from the neural crest cells. And you can see here a large epidural soft tissue kind of lesion, which is extending over a large extent, compressing the cord significantly. And this turned out to be neuroblastoma, usually small kids, leukemia. So patients with leukemia can have spinal involvement. What do I see? On stir image, instead of looking dark, all these vertebrae are looking very bright. On T1 weighted image, the vertebral bodies are looking slightly darker than the disc, which tells me there is diffuse infiltrative marrow abnormality. And then I can see a posterior epidural soft tissue component and involvement of this lesion here. So this could be uh, usually very diffuse involvement is leukemia, lymphoma is more focal, metastasis, that will also have more of heterogeneity. Lymphoma is usually more focal. So here again, we have a lesion involving a single vertebral body. A T1 weighted image is very useful to look at marrow. Normal fatty marrow in adults looks very bright. The vertebral body is always brighter than the disc after the age of about 10 years. But here you can see this whole vertebral body is dark and you have a large solid appearing soft tissue component. Compare this with the abscess that we saw in the session on spine infections in the morning. This clearly, even without contrast, tells you this is a solid lesion. Secondary extradural tumors are obviously metastasis, very, very common from breast and lung CA, also prostate CA. So here you can see multiple lesions. Again, T1 weighted image is very good. So when you have to do screening in metastasis patient, do T2 as well as T1. If you have to do one sequence, do T1 in metastasis, I'm saying. Why? Because osteoblastic metastasis will be dark on stir also. Lytic lesions will be bright on T2 and stir. Blastic le osteoblastic lesions will be dark on both. But T1 is a sequence where fat is always bright. So whether it is a lytic lesion or a sclerotic lesion, it will always be seen well on T1 weighted image. This was a patient with breast CA and this was a patient with lung CA who presented first with back pain and spine metastasis. Another not so common lesion is aneurysmal bone cyst. Involves usually the posterior elements. As you can see here, all the posterior elements are involved, but it's also involving the posterior vertebral body a child, and you can see blood fluid levels within it. You want to give contrast to see whether there are any solid areas, whether it's a primary or a secondary aneurysmal bone cyst. So that was about extra dural lesions, which are usually of osseous origin or could be prime, just epidural lesions. Next coming to intradural extramedullary lesions. And we are really thinking primarily of two lesions, nerve sheath tumor, which means neurofibroma and schwannoma. So imaging wise, you may not be able to differentiate between the two. So we like to use the term nerve sheet tumor together for both of them. Meningioma. So when intradural extramedullary lesion, the first thoughts which are coming to my mind would be nerve sheet tumor and meningioma. Spinal leptomeningeal mets are a different condition. We'll look at them too. So nerve sheet tumors are the most common, common intraspinal lesion. As I said, you may not be able to distinguish between these two and it's fine. Call them nerve sheet tumor. Most of them are intradural extramedullary. 
Some of them can be extradural. Some can be both intra and extradural, going like a dumbbell shape out of the neural foramen also. But majority of them are intradural, extramedial. How do I see it on MR? T2-weighted image, I can see a slightly hyperintense lesion. You can see here the cauda equina nerve roots are getting displaced. T1, you can see it's almost iso-intense to maybe minimally hyperintense. And here you can see all the cauda equina nerve roots are kind of around it. So this is an intradural extramedullary lesion in the cauda equina arising from one of the nerve roots likely. So this is a nerve sheath tumor. This was another patient. And now you can see a clear target appearance. So see the target appearance kind of helps. So here is a target appearance lesion, central dark, peripheral bright. And you can see clearly it has a dumbbell shape. It has a component in the spinal canal. Again, it's intradural extramedullary. Why do I say that? I can see the CSF widened here, okay? But it's also going out into the foramen, widening it. See this foramen and look at this. Tells you it's a long standing, it's not eroding the bone. So that tells me this is a nerve sheath tumor. This was another nerve sheath tumor. And now you can see again, long standing, it's literally scalloping and going into the vertebral body. A very large lesion going into the paravertebral region and into the vertebral body, kind of scalloping it. It's not invading it, but scalloping it and extending there. And the thecal sac is compressed significantly. This again turned out to be a neurofibromas. Another example, again, this time it's a larger lesion. Why is it an intradural extramedullary lesion? Look at the CSF. The CSF is widened. If this was extradural lesion, this CSF would not have been widened. It would come like this and get compressed here. Long extension. And here, if you see, all of this is the lesion. And this is the cord, which is markedly getting compressed. And this, again, turned out to be a nerve sheet tumor. Sometimes, it's not very common, but in patients who have neurofibromatosis especially, they can undergo malignant degeneration. So here was this patient who had these large plexiform neurofibromas, extensive lesion. And the one which was in the, there are multiple lesions. You can see all along the cord equina. But the one in the sacral region had undergone malignant transformation, forming a very large mass. Next, meningioma. More common in females, middle-aged or older women. More common in the thoracic spine. What do we see it? We see it as a well-defined intradural extramedullary lesion. So again, see the CSF is widened. That's how I know it's not extradural lesion. I'm again and again stressing on this so that at the end of this session, nobody is confused between intradural and extradural lesion. Always look at this. Sometimes you may see it on sagittal. Sometimes you may see it on coronal, depending on how the lesion is located. But that will tell you what, where the lesion is located. That will change your differential diagnosis entirely. This patient also had an osteoporotic fracture by chance at that same location. But you can also see this lesion, which is slightly dark, not very bright on T2, showing homogeneous enhancement and seems to have a slightly broad base towards the dura. It may not always be possible to distinguish between meningioma and nerve sheet tumor. Sometimes we give the differential diagnosis. Here, again, I can see a T1 iso-intense, T2 very minimally hyper-intense or iso-intense. I can see homogeneous intense enhancement and I can see a dural tail also. So that tells me that this is a meningioma. How do I distinguish? As I said, sometimes it may not be possible. T2, if you look at it, meningioma is a little more darker as compared to nerve sheet tumor, which is more brighter. It's not bright, bright, but more brighter as compared to a meningioma. You may see a dural tail in meningioma, but again, it may not always be seen. Usually posterolateral, not again necessary. Meningioma is usually solitary, while nerve sheet tumor could be multiple. You can see again, you can notice these multiple lesions out here. But trying to take all these features together, most of the times you are able to differentiate. Sometimes we have to give the differential diagnosis. Intradural extramedullary lesion diagnosis, meningioma or nerve sheet tumor. Next, coming to leptomeningeal metastasis. These are very common, especially in the pediatric population. So anytime there's a child who's come to you with medulloblastoma, 
ependymoma, germinoma, you need to make sure the entire spine is scanned. Screening is necessary and that too with contrast. So anyway, these patients with, so for example, a child has come to you with headache, vomiting, you do the MR, you find a posterior fossa lesion, which you think could be medulloblastoma or ependymoma, or there's a pineal gland area lesion, you think it could be a germinoma. Make sure you screen the spine post-contrast at least because remember you already given the contrast. Do not waste that opportunity to scan the spine of the patient, whether asked for or not. It may not have been written in the requisition because maybe it was not suspected to begin with. But remember to always do that. The child has already been sedated. You have already given contrast. It just takes another 10 minutes to be able to give the information which will completely change the management. You can also see metastasis in adults, especially in breast and lung CA and less commonly in other ones. So leptomeningeal metastasis are usually more in the lumbosacral region, kind of because these are drop metastasis. So by gravity, they kind of drop down to the lowest area of the spine and contrast enhanced MR is the only way to detect them sensitively. So here is this child with a medulloblastoma. You can see here, you can see all this leptomeningeal enhancement along the cerebellum and you can see these nodular leptomeningeal enhancement along the surface of the cord. All the way here, you can see a nodule here too. Do not get confused with the anterior or the posterior spinal arteries. That you will see in only one section as a thin linear enhancement. And on axial again, you can confirm. Metastasis would be more nodular or extending, even infection leptomeningeal enhancement would be more circumferential. Leptomeningeal metastasis can have various presentations. So here is a ch child with multiple nodular lesions. While here, if you see, there is diffuse enhancement, very diffuse enhancement all along the surface of the cord. Or you can see this corda equina area is just looking very hypointense. You need to make sure routine T1, T2 can be very misleading. You need to make sure you give contrast and you can see how all this corda equina is enhancing. So if you had just looked at this T2, it would be very easy to miss it. It's essential that you give contrast. So we looked at extradural lesions, which are predominantly osseous. We looked at intradural extramedullary lesions, the main two being nerve sheet tumor and meningioma. And we looked at leptomeningeal metastasis. Very common in children, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, germinoma. Now, let's come to the next section, which is the intramedullary neoplasms. When we talk of intramedullary neoplasms in the spinal cord, we are thinking of three conditions in primary. Glial tumors are most common. We'll be looking primarily at astrocytoma and ependymoma because that's what we see commonly. Non-glial tumors, we'll look at hemangioblastoma. Round cell tumors can involve, but again, secondary lesions, metastasis. So the ones in green, we'll look at astrocytoma, we'll look at ependymoma, we'll look at hemangioblastoma, and we will look at metastasis. Characteristics. The cord is always expanded. In a spinal tumor, you will never have cord atrophy. The cord will be expanded. MR is very sensitive to hemorrhage. So try, look out for that. Cysts are common in tumors. They can be peritumoral cyst or they can be tumoral cyst. We need to differentiate. Most of the tumors will show at least some enhancement. It's rare to have a completely non-enhancing tumor. But if the cord is expanded, absence of enhancement does not exclude neoplasm. Yes, you're thinking of demyelination, myelitis. Again, history is very important. How has the patient presented? Somebody is presented acutely, fever, or the symptoms have been progressing over time. That would be essential to look at the lesion. So another thing to remember, patients with neurofibromatosis type 1 have a high incidence of cord astrocytomas. And a patient with neurofibromatosis type 2 has high incidence of ependymoma. So if 
the patient is a known case of neurofibromatosis becomes this is what you need to keep in your mind let's begin with ependymo two locations one is in the cervical region and i remember c for cervical c for cellular cellular ependymoma is more common in the cervical and upper thoracic region the other one is in the lower region especially the conus medullaris and that is the mixo papillary ependymoma ependymoma is the most common intramedullary spinal neoplasm in adult patients mixo papillary ependymoma i told you involves conus or the lower spinal canal and what you see is a lesion you can see here a solid lesion in the spinal canal in the thecal sac iso intense on t1 shows homogeneous enhancement okay so you can see this is the mixo papillary ependymoma and these usually have some amount of hemorrhage and because of recurrent hemorrhage you can see the small lesion right at the conus dark on t2 t1 it shows some bright area because of blood products contrast it is showing you peripheral irregular enhancement and a gradient sequence it is blooming showing you enhancement here again if you look at it here is a lesion below the conus iso intense on t1 contrast homogeneously enhancing and look carefully you can see this t2 hypo dark rim which is like cap so this cap sign is quite sensitive for mixo papillary ependymoma and is because of hemorrhage okay the other one is the cellular uh, cellular ependymoma and these are quite homogeneous so the two things which to remember about ependymoma either they have hemorrhage or they are relatively homogeneous looking so here you can see a very homogeneous lesion expanding the cervical spinal cord bright on t2 almost iso intense on t1 and on contrast it is showing mild to greater almost homogeneous enhancement again as compared to that astrocytoma so ependymoma was in the upper cervical and upper thoracic and lower region astrocytomas are more common in the thoracic region in children it's the most common intramedullary lesion it's very rare in the phylum terminal or cauda equina region how do we see it sometimes you may see it just very ill defined you can see this whole cord is swollen quite ill defined some patchy mild enhancement now if this patient had presented with acute onset neurological deficit fever i would be thinking of transverse myelitis but in this patient it was a slow progression complaints over many months so very ill defined kind of lesion i can't see the margins well i'm thinking of an astrocytoma but more often astrocytomas are heterogeneous they would have cystic component they would have solid areas they will have syrinx which is formed very heterogeneous looking and that's again very important why we always need to give contrast i can see this large syrinx in the spinal cord i can see a lot of heterogeneity here t1 weighted image and i give contrast and contrast tells me this is the solid area of the tumor and that's the area which has to be biopsied so it's important to give contrast to make out which is the area that needs to be biopsied astrocytomas as i said can look just like syrinx so if i see a syrinx what looks like a syrinx to me but i don't see a chiari one malformation the cerebellar tonsils are normal in location please be sure and give contrast on t1 also this looks just quite like a plain syrinx to me but when i give contrast what i see this whole area is enhancing quite heterogeneously you can see this intramedullary lesion so do not call something as a syrinx unless you are very clear you are not seeing any septations anything and there is a chiari one because then it tells you it's related to that otherwise always make sure you give contrast and you can otherwise you could be missing these lesions so here i can see a very clear syrinx t1 very dark nothing abnormal i can see a peck shaped low lying cerebellar tonsils i can get away without giving contrast but in this patient 
they were insistent the uh, clinician also wanted they didn't want to take any chances and you can see that it is not enhanced how do i distinguish between astrocytoma and ependymoma again sometimes it may not be possible and we would give a differential diagnosis but majority of the times if you follow it astrocytoma is more common in thoracic cord ependymoma more in cervical spine and cord equina conus medullaris region the cc astrocytoma is eccentric central this doesn't help believe me because once the lesion is big in a cord it's very difficult to make out whether it's eccentric or central i don't think this is really ever helped us hemorrhage is common in ependymoma ependymoma is more well defined as compared to astrocytoma which has very ill defined appearance heterogeneous enhancement is much more common with astrocytoma tumoral cysts syrinx while ependymoma shows you homogeneous enhancement so based on this majority of the times we will be able to distinguish between them but there is a percentage of patients when you cannot make out and you will give a differential diagnosis so when you see cyst in relation to the tumor is it a tumoral cyst because that will need to be excised or is it a non tumoral cyst just because of the mass effect the pressure of the lesion csf is getting trapped how do i make out the non tumoral cysts are usually at the pole either at the upper or the lower pole of the solid area of the tumor and it does not enhance on contrast so again why you need to give contrast tumoral cysts are within the tumor itself and always show peripheral enhancement these are very common in astrocytomas as compared to ependymoma so important for the surgeon to know which is the solid area as he needs to biopsy from there he needs to know which are the tumoral cyst because he needs to be removing them while the non tumoral cyst can be decompressed coming to the next intra medullary lesion which is hemangioblastoma this patient had a cerebellar hemangioblastoma and you can see this enhancing area so very important to give contrast sometimes these lesions can be really small and nodular and without contrast you may be missing them this patient here so he had been already been operated for a hemangioblastoma but again there were recurrent lesions and you can see all this enhancing lesion here and you can see all this prominent vessels which almost look like an avm so remember in hemangioblastoma you can have prominent vessels around it give contrast always otherwise you can miss tiny enhancing nodular lesions lastly coming to metastasis in our practice we usually see with breast and lung ca other ca can also cause it but not very commonly the spread could be hematogenous could be venous through the batson's venous plexus or sometimes can be direct invasion like say pancos tumor or one of those lesions which can directly invade and extend so here you have a small hypo intense lesion in the cord with very disproportionate edema but morning i showed you a tubercloma which looked almost similar so that can get tricky and diff difficult to differentiate this patient was a known case of ca breast and already had brain metastasis and other metastasis also which makes us more sure that this is metastasis otherwise imaging wise it can look very similar here the edema is quite disproportionate few other lesions in the spinal canal epidermoid here so these are two ways you can get epidermoid one would be congenital associated with spinal dysraphism the second one would be post surgery a child has been operated for spinal dysraphism and because the skin cells the ectoderm cells have gone in that can form an epidermoid it can be either way so here i have a little bright lesion on t2 which is showing peripheral rim enhancement so this was an epidermoid as against that dermoid will show me fat so here this patient has a tethered cord the cord is coming all the way down here there is a lesion in relation to the cord which is bright on t1 bright on t2 and on fat sat it is getting suppressed this is a solid component so this is a dermoid lesion and these dermoid lesions can rupture and cause chemical meningitis so here is a dermoid this is t1 it is a bright lesion it has ruptured so you have t1 all these bright lobules including in the ventricle all along the surface of the cord and this can lead to chemical meningitis jitis midline lesion fat containing you are thinking of a dermoid so whenever you look at a intramedullary lesion 
look at history acute onset has been going on for some time age of the patient location of the lesion how does the lesion look homogeneous heterogeneous cysts hemorrhage margins of the lesion well defined ill defined and always give contrast because you want to distinguish from other conditions you want to separate from just plain syringe you want to identify the solid and the cystic areas so to conclude we looked at epidural lesions we looked at intradural extramedullary that is neurofibroma that is nerve sheet tumor and meningioma we looked at intramedullary lesions most common astrocytoma ependymoma we also looked at hemangioblastoma and metastasis so that is about spinal neoplasms any questions i would be happy to answer okay so there's a question here uh, is it okay if we mention hypo intense bone marrow on t1 and ask for marrow evaluation even if patient so what i would suggest is look at stir also look at the spine also if the vertebral body is more dark than the disc then it's surely abnormal you need to clearly put it on paper there is a infiltrative disorder uh, infiltrated disorder is suspected and they need to go ahead and evaluate it whether they for, they first start with hematological profile and then marrow biopsy whatever if it is not more dark than the disc on t1 weighted image okay but it's looking little darker but not more dark than the disc look at stir and on stir if it's not very bright if it's just slightly bright then it could be red marrow especially in women with child of child bearing age group in our country uh, anemia is very very common so you see it quite often also look at the age of the patient if the patient is less than 25 year old that red marrow may be normal so i think the important thing is on t1 is the vertebral body more dark than the disc then it is surely abnormal if it is dark on t2 how is it if on t2 also it is dark then you are thinking of things like myelofibrosis you are thinking of iron deposition other things but on t2 if it's just still little bright not very bright it could be red marrow uh, red marrow in that patient yeah so i think i have answered the questions too uh okay uh so now uh i think let's go ahead with the quiz yes ma'am yeah so this quiz uh there is no prize this is kind of a self evaluation thing i have tried to include as much as possible of what we covered today during the day so kind of all of you just uh, see what you think and we'll be discussing the answers also together with them only okay okay so there are as i said no prizes if you do well you know you have done well and you can go and enjoy your drink today don't go out with <laughs> covid around okay so this is the first case this is the sagittal proton density and this here is the coronal proton density uh so we can do it in two ways we can go through all the questions and come back and look at the answers do you want it like that or at the same time we discuss the answers uh so i think uh, whoever is from ngm here can tell me which uh, what should we do should we discuss the answers at the same time or go through the 15 cases and come back and look at the answers madam discuss at the same time only yeah okay we'll discuss at the same time yeah so we have sach pd we have coronal pd one what is the diagnosis two name the sign okay so i hope you're all thinking yourself or maybe even writing it down yourself so what do we see here the first thing which strikes me what is this structure ankita has covered it today morning this is the posterior cruciate ligament and then what do i see ahead of it something that looks like one more posterior cruciate ligament so what is this sign the double pcl sign okay and on the coronal image i can see the if i can just show it like this yeah So you can see this lateral meniscus, okay? But when I see the medial meniscus, you can see how it's become so small, and the rest of that medial meniscus has come here. This is because this is a bucket handle tear. This is how the normal meniscus should have been, but instead, what is happening? This meniscus 
has undergone a tear and this whole portion has come here this portion is here and this flap which has come inside is this bucket handle fragment so and this here is the normal posterior cruciate ligament this is the displaced this component which has come here and this together is called as the double pcl sign this is bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus okay yeah so this is the next case what is the diagnosis and where is this lesion located i'm sure all of you can see the lesion it's here it's here and here this is sagittal proton density this is coronal t2 fat sat okay so we'll just give little time for all of you to think about it a little okay so first thing what kind of a lesion is it on t2 fat sat it is very very bright which tells me it's a cystic lesion okay and can you see the small stalk like thing coming here a thin extension and what is this triangle structure here that's the labrum this here is the scapula and the glenoid okay this small triangle is the labrum and a thin stalk is coming from there so a cystic lesion in close relation to the labrum always think of paralabral cyst and again uh, i think uh, shoulder session uh, chinmay must have covered it so this is a paralabral cyst coming from a labral tear where is it located you can see it this is the spinoglenoid notch this is the spine of scapula this is the glenoid so between them is the spinoglenoid notch where it is located plus it is also going into the supraspinatus fossa suprascapula notch also this is the supraspinatus here is the inferior portion so this is like a real large paralabral cyst if it is in spinoglenoid notch it can compress the nerve and cause infraspinatus muscle atrophy here you can see this muscle can get atrophic once it's gone more into the suprascapillary area the supraspinatus can also get atrophic in this patient luckily as of now there is not much of denervation changes so by treating this that can be avoided paralabral cyst located in spinoglenoid notch also going into the subscapularis notch the next case what is the diagnosis this is like a spotter so the first thing catching our eyes obviously it's the right side which is abnormal and we can see a normal femur on the left side on the right side you can see this femur is very short you don't see a femoral head here the femoral head is already ossified and whatever is there is kind of displaced up so this is pffd proximal focal femoral deficiency you have an itkin classification for that based on how much of the femur is abnormal x ray can show you this but mr can tell you whether this portion of the femur is present is it cartilaginous is there a communication with rest of the femur those additional things is what mr could tell you this is a pffd proximal focal femoral deficiency which has different grading okay so what's the diagnosis here again uh, i think uh, chinmay must have showed this or uh, ashwin also showed this in the ultrasound uh, uh, lecture i know so this is a coronal t2 fat sat this is axial pd and this is a sag pd image so what's the diagnosis so first thing what is catching our eye is all this marrow edema so the soft tissue edema so now what is that soft tissue edema due to is what we need to think next okay so can you see this very dark blob out here it's there on all the sequences very dark and that is calcium and you have lot of edema around it so these are the patients who come with excruciating pain when you see the edema your first thought is is this infection or something but then when you look carefully in this patient it's very striking because it's real large sometimes you can have very tiny foci of calcification the same patient if i give you the x ray or ct you'll pick it up immediately but get used to seeing these dark areas of calcification on mr this is calcific subscapularis tendinosus with the calcium extending out into the overlying bursa causing acute inflammation okay 
this is the next scan patient has presented with left sided hip pain so the most i think ankita would have covered this the most important thing is is this an aggressive lesion or is this a non aggressive lesion in the left femoral neck so the usual things we need to go by how are the margins are the margins well defined yes they are how is the zone of transition it's very narrow i can see where normal bone ends and this begins and what is the kind of rim there is a clear sclerotic thick rim all of this clearly suggests to me that this is a non aggressive lesion that's the first step we need to decide aggressive lesion could be malignant could be infective aggressive doesn't only mean malignant this is a non aggressive lesion and then there is a pathological fracture through the medial cortex and that's possibly causing the patient's acute pain now thoughts coming to my mind one simple bone cyst but one odd thing is it is little thick kind of margin and inside instead of being very lytic it has this very fibrous kind of appearance so when you have this thick rind like appearance it can be fibrous dysplasia so if it is a thin wall you are thinking more of a simple bone cyst when you have a rind like thicker wall you are thinking of fibrous dysplasia but basically non aggressive lesion is what you are calling this okay again i'm sure chidmay would have covered this axial images what is this type of anterior inferior labral tear called what type of anterior inferior labral tear is this what do i see this is the biceps tendon here this is the labrum i can see the anterior inferior labrum torn and after getting torn it's got displaced inwards and medial okay so this is alpsa alpsa full form being anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion if you can't remember this name doesn't matter if you say there is an anterior inferior labral tear with the torn labrum displaced medially and inferiorly with an intact periosteum it means this whether you write this name or not that's fine okay so what's the diagnosis here we have a coronal t2 fat sac or a stir a coronal t1 and a sagittal t2 fat sac image how do we evaluate this this is a skeletally immature patient the physis is not fused so it's a kid i have a lesion in the epiphysis when i have a lesion in the epiphysis what am i thinking of the very first if i think of tumors epiphysis a child the first thing which has to come to my mind is a chondroblastoma if it's an adult epiphysis when i'm think subarticular bone basically i'm thinking of a giant cell tumor so here epiphyseal well defined lesion lot of marrow edema you can see so much of marrow edema soft tissue edema periosteal edema all around it which is characteristic of chondroblastoma so remember osteoid osteoma chondroblastomas though the lesions are small the edema around calcific tendinitis the lesion as such are small but the edema around it is disproportionate this is chondroblastoma other epiphyseal lesion could be infection especially tuberculous but here you have this chondroid matrix like appearance is not like a abscess like lesion what is the diagnosis sagittal t2 fat sac sagittal proton density images so again this is a spotter i can see the anterior cruciate ligament fibers all of them it has a striated appearance they look like all are swollen and hyperintense and a ganglion is forming right here near the femoral attachment this is the mucoid degeneration how do i know it's not a tear if i imagine i have a pencil in my hand and i try drawing the fibers i don't see the fibers getting disrupted anywhere it has a striated appearance also called as celery stalk appearance but the fibers are not disrupted so this is mucoid degeneration in a tear these fibers will be disrupted okay 
So what's the diagnosis? Somebody, a child has presented with left-sided hip pain. Coronal stir, coronal T1, axial stir images. So the first thing which is obviously catching my eye is the marrow edema. There's a lot of marrow edema near the femoral neck and some amount of soft tissue edema. So thoughts going through my mind, could this be stress fracture? One, also it's a skeletally immature patient, a kid. Could this be stress fracture? But then I would expect to see some kind of a hypointense line here. This is exact location where you can get a stress fracture. Again, usually in older uh, patients who start going to gym. And now when I look carefully at that area, what do I see? Marrow edema, periosteal edema. And you can see this small lytic area in the cortex with the hypointense pec. So this is classic of an osteoid osteoid. To, to confirm, or if you have a doubt, you can always take CT cuts to confirm it, but this is osteoid osteoma. Important point to remember here, this is in the neck. If you have an intra-articular osteoid osteoma, you may not have X-ray findings of sclerosis, cortical thickening and all, okay? That may not be there. Okay, what's the diagnosis? I did show this in my uh, lecture, so all of you who are awake should be getting this right. This is classic, myxopapillary ependymoma. We have this lesion here in the phylum terminal below the conus terminalis region. I saw on T1, homogeneous enhancement, and you can see this cap. You can see this dark band-like thing above it, which is due to hemorrhage. A cap sign is quite characteristic of an ependymoma. What's the diagnosis here? Somebody who's come with pain, there was no injury, they come with pain. A coronal stir image and a sagittal PD or maybe T1 image, I think PD image. Yeah. So what I see is a lot of marrow edema and then I see a hypo-intense line within it. See, this is the physial scar. You can see this thin line and this is a line here. This is very characteristic of stress fracture. Insufficiency fractures are subchondral in this location. Post-traumatic, again, one, there'll be history of injury, obviously, and usually not like this. They would be more of the, they would fit into the Schatzger's classification, what we do. So here, this patient had gone trekking in the Himalayas and came back with severe pain in both the knees and had these stress fractures. What's the diagnosis? So there's a lot of calcification here in this location. And it does look non-aggressive, benign kind of pathology. And when I look here, this is the area of the Achilles tendon. You can see how it is thickened. So if I just imagine, so remember to look at the Achilles tendon on the x-rays also when you see them. This is the outline of the Achilles tendon that I can see, okay? So this is, Non-insertion, at least tendon pathologies can be either at the insertion or watershed zone four to six centimeter above the insertion. So this is non-insertional tendinosis with all this dystrophic ossification or calcification within it. What's the diagnosis? So follow all exactly, I think Ankita would have covered this. Where is the lesion? It's a child, skeletally mature patient. Where is the lesion located? Metaphysis. Is it aggressive or non-aggressive? Well-defined margins. So it is non-aggressive. Zone of transition is narrow. There is no periosteal reaction. It has got this little lobulated appearance within it. Metaphysis. So the most likely diagnosis is an aneurysmal bone cyst. If it didn't have all these lobulations, was slightly lower down also, then simple bone cyst would have been also a possibility. Aneurysmal bone cysts are usually eccentric, but here it's kind of not that eccentric. Metaphysial, multi-lobulated like appearance, aneurysmal bone cyst. Similar, again, apply the same findings. The zone of transition, if you look at it, for a lesion, this is so expansive, looks very scary, destructive. But the zone of transition is still narrow. You can make out the lesion just abruptly stops out here. The lesion is involving the it's reaching up to the articular surface in an adult patient. And you can see all this soap bubble-like kind of lobulated appearance to it. So very classic of giant cell tumor. 
So giant cell tumor has a spectrum for very slow growing benign ones to more aggressive ones. And here is an expand cell lesion, subarticular, narrow zone of transition and has this lobulated appearance. And you can see a thin shell of the, shell of the cortex still maintained, very characteristic of a giant cell tumor. I think this is probably the last case. What's the diagnosis? Axial T2 fat sat and axial proton density images, axial T1 images. This here is a pain marker. So always use a vitamin E capsule, especially in ankle, in wrist for tumors. Place the marker so that you know which area the patient has got pain and you can look at that area more carefully. So what do we see here? We see a lot of marrow edema, soft tissue edema. And this is the navicular bone. And here you can see a bony fragment with synchondrosis. It looks like there's a clear joint-like thing cartilaginous between them. This is an accessory navicular bone or the os naviculae. And that can be symptomatic and have marrow edema and that can cause pain to the patient. If it is very persistent, they'll first try conservative management. If that doesn't work, they will resect it. Yeah, so I think those were about the 15 uh, questions that I had. Any questions? Uh, somebody uh, had asked me, I'm going to stop sharing. Somebody wanted picture of intramedullary lesion pattern. Uh, I hope you are um, talking of the ependymoma and uh, astrocytoma. Yeah. So ependymoma more common in cervical and cordyquina phylum terminal region. So the caudal area. Astrocytoma in thoracic. Ependymoma hemorrhage and more homogeneous enhancement. Astrocytoma more heterogeneous cysts, series. Ependymoma, well-defined. Astrocytoma, ill-defined. So I think this would... Uh, can drop metastasis be seen with astrocytoma? Very rarely, very rare. Most common, which we see in practice, would be medulloblastoma, ependymoma, germinoma. And as I said, we've also seen with breast CA, with lung CA, less common. Even glioblastoma, multiforme can rarely have them. But as I said, not common. So unless the patient has a particular symptom, you may not screen the spine in all of them. But medullo, germinoma, ependymoma, you need to screen the spine all the time. Yeah, so I think uh, there's no other question uh, in the chat box. Uh, Thank you so much for the patient hearing and all of you stayed back till so late on a Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for all that valuable information. Yeah. Uh, somebody is asking me, can we repeat the vertebral body lesions and signal intensities? That would become the entire lecture again. Uh, so probably what we can do is, see, this is kind of an introduction. Go back, go through the books. I'm sure your books will give it more in detail. Any further doubts or anything like that, you can always contact me. Now that we have successfully completed all our sessions, on behalf of the entire Department of Radiology, MJ Medical College, Navi Mumbai, I would like to convey heartfelt thanks to all our eminent speakers for taking such knowledgeable sessions. I would also like to thank our head of the department, Dr. Preeti Kapoor ma'am, for taking the initiative and guiding us for the conduction of this CME. I would also like to thank our Dean, Dr. Narshetti sir, along with the technical and administrative staff for their support in the academic activities of our department. Thank you very much. Have a great day.